Welcome, everybody. I hope the sound and picture is clear and that we can start with uh, our today's... Uh, Welcome, everybody. I hope the sound and picture is clear and that we can start with uh, our today's... Uh, Welcome, everybody. I hope the sound and picture is... Well, hello world. Welcome to International Conference Information Literacy and Democracy, the role of information professionals for civic development in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, Ili Dots. Uh, welcome from the Library of Political Science, University of Sarajevo. My name is Emir Vajzovic, and uh, with me today, as your uh, moderator is colleague, Mario Hibert. Joining us also for Hildesheim University is uh, Thomas Mandel. And uh, in just a few words for the introduction, uh, we want to uh, underline that uh, in this online IDESA conference, we want to highlight various aspects of information and media literacy with a particular emphasis on the role of information professionals, professionals for civic development in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, obviously, all the discussion is uh, also relevant for the rest of the world, especially the region of Southeast Europe. Despite the increasing development of new technologies and the growing role played by media in society. There is no adequate government action, no public discussion, uh, especially in Bosnia and Herzegovina, on issues related to media and information literacy as a basic requirement for civic discourse and so consequently for democratic processes. In the education sector, insufficient, negligible attention is dedicated to development of male skills in curricula. Teachers do not have adequate skills in the area of media information literacy education, nor possibility to access quality teachers training. This conference should serve as a capacity building forum for educators, information professionals, students, and other interested parties, especially those who are focused on current curricular reform at all levels of government, but also broad user community interested in transferring media information literacy, knowledge and skills. Free press, access to information and trust in media is what makes democracy stable and functioning. Consequences of current destabilization of democracy labeled post-democracy is dramatically widening the distance between technical systems and social organization as if negotiation between them appearing to be impossible their final divorce seems inevitable. Understanding the digital condition prior the rising focus to our digital competencies, as well as upgrading abilities to navigate the information and media landscape is usually seen as multifaced skill set indispensable for net citizens to actively shape their lives. Being the grand design of technological mind the internet as the architecture of innovation should be continuously discussed, especially in terms of accelerated development and transformation of digital learning in which information professionals dwell. In other words, we need to design for freedom, freedom that actively undermines the technological pressure to lead a predictable life. After the introduction session with our keynote speaker, Professor Jandrich, we have a strategic session and a break after the, the, the first one to uh, refresh and kind of 
see how the own life of the conference world uh, is dealing with uh, small uh, uh, refreshment sessions. And after that, we'll continue with the tactical session where you'll be hearing many interesting uh, discussions. But as you have probably seen, you, you, have, been you have been able uh, to view uh, video abstracts that, that have been submitted by our participants, our panelists, uh, presenting their ideas and uh, then awaiting your input for online uh, discussion. Without uh, future ado, I would like to ask our colleague uh, Thomas Mangold from Hildesheim University to take the floor and uh, continue with discussion about uh, what we have done so far. And uh, once again, Thomas, uh, thank you very much for the fruitful cooperation and uh, great experience in our work so far. Thomas? Yes. Um, thank you, Emia, very much. I will just try to start video. It's disabled for the moment, but I try again. Um, thank you very much for this programmatic speech. And we see that uh, this is really a very important issue. Not only 20, almost 25 years now after Dayton Agreement, it's still a huge issue in Bosnia Herzegovina. But current developments in the world show that the misuse of information is also prevalent in many other places. And that is really a serious uh, problem. We have, we are so thankful for Emir for the invitation, uh, for this uh, speech, for the introduction, but also for Mario for organizing this together with Emir and putting together such a good program in two interesting slots. And also thanks for the whole Bosnia team for organizing this conference within our cooperation that we have for this year and that we are uh, that we also will continue at least throughout next year and we hope that also longer in the future so thanks again for everybody um, in Sarajevo and the whole team there no the we also are thankful for the funding that the DAAD provided for this conference. Now, what is a potential relation between Bosnia and Hildesheim? Let's start with a small anecdote. And um, something we find is actually in soccer. I don't know if you follow European soccer. Yesterday, there was a European Cup again. And there was once a... Um, group in the European League, the European Cup, where not Sarajevo, but Mostar played against Hildesheim in the same group. Actually, this was the last game ever that Hildesheim played in the European Cup. So maybe not everybody in the audience remembers this. It's quite a long time ago in the Toto Cup 62. And uh, recently they interviewed the these players that traveled to uh, Mostar and um, now old people. And one said, it was amazing. We lost one to nine. So Mostar was much stronger. And there was this one Bosnian player who made uh, three goals and he didn't even wear shoes. So that, of course, had made a long lasting impression. And uh, but let's come to our project that this is focused in. We started you know, with a project in Hildesheim on um, the use of, uh, of the influence of information literacy and democracy. I think we definitely need to uh, get our voice heard here from the perspective of information science. There is a lot we can contribute and that is something we should definitely do. And our previous project wanted to look at the research field and try to say, where can we improve in the teaching of information literacy? One of the outcomes is also a collection of perspective papers uh, that is also online that, that shows how di diverse the perspectives of professionals in this domain are. So there is still a lot to do. And yeah, we live in this 
problematic world with all the problematic issues of information, just to name a few. Uh, we don't have to go into details here, but there are certainly many, many negative aspects, and in particular, misinformation, disinformation are problematic issues that are really a threat to democratic, uh, democ democracy and to freedom, as uh, Emir has pointed out. Uh, also, video is on. Uh -huh. um, so these are many of the issues. And information literacy has many, many aspects. So we were also discussing that it's not just bibliographic search and working with scientific text. It starts with very simple use of typical tools. There is this study from a few years ago that shows that 40% of the German representative uh, participants could not label exactly where the advertisement is on a Google search page at that time. So the very often used tool is not even fully understand, understood and we cannot know what is genuine information, what is biased information, what is advertisement. And uh, one third of the participants couldn't even say how does Google make a profit? So the big player in the information market is we see is not fully understood. And that of course is a problem when we, people use this information and uh, uh, integrate it into their knowledge sources and work with that. So our previous conference tried to look into this. We had two project with uh, two conferences within this small project in the German side. And uh, the UNESCO definition is very clear. So we see it to see as a set of competences that empower citizens. Oh, this is again the aspect that Emir was mentioning, freedom and uh, um, uh, the power to participate, the um, ability to participate in society. Information literacy is, so, is a, a basic competence for academic work, for lifelong learning, but also for participation in society. That is the perspective we should never forget, even if we teach an academic perspective to many students, the participation and the societal aspect, democratic aspect is very important. And this is our starting point for the uh, conference. This was the first conference. And we see there was quite a lot of interest. People came to Hildesheim and there's also a YouTube channel with some uh, talks that were recorded. And um, there was some online discussion also. So there is a discussion on several issues that are hopefully uh, of, of interest and that are controversial. And that has a lot of issues and here we have a, we see some of the online discussions that were ongoing. The second conference took place in June. Emi and Mario were also participating and it was a quite international group there and of course in June had to be in the online mode and this also has the advantage that we have recordings of many of the talks of all of the talks so and the discussions even so you can still look at that and go through the uh, the talks that were given there. I think we also need to move on and see further aspects of information literacy that are becoming relevant. Artificial intelligence is uh, something that is, it has a huge impact on our everyday communication. So even if we're not an expert and not a computer engineer, this is something we have to worry about when we talk about information literacy. Algorithms now are able to create text. So we have a discussion on social bots that are, uh, are influencing discussions online with short text, but this will soon probably uh, be much better. The new GPT model to create text has caught a lot of attention, has now been commercialized, and we'll see huge developments here. So we cannot be sure whether a text in the future has been written by a human or by a computer. That adds to the complexity of information literacy. People have to be aware of that. Citizens have to be aware of it. Not everything is genuine. At the same time, computers judge text and rate it 
whether it's adequate, whether it's hate, whether it's a real review or maybe a fake review. So computers also, AI also judges human products, human production of text, a new level. And also we should be able to deal with these results without the information literacy and some knowledge about these facts. We cannot really integrate this into our work and use it adequately. Even whole sites are used. We have examples. Uh, Meta uh, NewsGuard, for example, is a, a system that judges news resources or Reviews Meta is a tool that automatically judges um, Amazon reviews or something that people are really using in their daily life. And of course, they might sometime be, sometimes be wrong. So we have to be aware of that. Here we see a look into Meta reviews that says, well, some of these naturals are, have been removed. So we corrected the rating and the buyer then, the uh, person who wants to use this product, this artificial intelligence well, value added system has to um, judge now, is this really a better rating? Is this really a corrected rating? Can the system really make this judgment? Or new SCART, we see that uh, is gets uh, rates whole sites and explains whether they are reliable, adequate, or not. How do they clarify errors and things like that? Also, of course, we have a lot of discussion on this fake fake news in the world, and also Bosnia Herzegovina is not an exception here. We see a news article there. Interesting issue is also that news products at IT companies have a huge impact now. This is a media, uh, the web presence of a of an agency in Texas uh, called Harris Media. And why am I showing this? They give service to many com uh, many uh, political parties in Europe. So IT competence, uh, social media influence from the US from Texas is influencing our European political discussion. They give, and we see that they give uh, that to their customers are mainly right-wing parties and populist groups. So this is again another uh, impact that political discussion is suffering that is coming. And in order to understand, to follow the political discussion, for example, online democratic processes, online people need to become aware of such problems. Also checking, we have in this, uh, the student group later, we'll talk about fact-checking, the importance of fact-checking, and there's also sites and, and services in Bosnia-Herzegovina. We also are trying to offer a uh, automatic uh, check service, uh, well, a uh, competition where we can look at algorithms that do uh, analysis of fake news, in the coming year. And another issue yeah, that I want to point out at the end now is that the issue that we are dealing here with teaching information to see how do we integrate these new tools into the discussion is of course very important. We have to update content and approaches constantly to check are they adequate? Do they work in different settings like the one we are looking at in Bosnia Herzegovina now? And we need approaches that work with low barriers, small formats that people can consume in, even in the bus, as it's shown here, yeah, a little. Uh, um, so to, uh, teaching approaches, teaching packages that people are willing to take up, which are not always the full entire course. And another perspective that I think is very important, and uh, maybe we can also start some work in this project here is that we need to look more at the perspective of the students. Only teaching material and teaching approaches that are accepted widely that students say, oh, this really makes sense for me. I'm, uh, I like this. They are, they will be accepted and are perceived as positive. So here we have a big issue, of course. So we need to understand which materials are students still taking up and saying, oh, I see an advantage for me. I'm 
doing this. So without further ado, thank you very much for your attention. I hope I stayed in time and I hand back to organizers in Sarajevo. Thank you all for your attention and let's have a great conferences and a conference and enjoy the presentations. Thank you. Dear Thomas, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. I would uh, suggest uh, that we hold for the discussion after this uh, introduction uh, speeches, uh, actually presentations and have um, uh, our uh, uh, way of uh, getting uh, all that you have said, uh, the, the uh, presenting of what we have uh, did here in, in the University of Sarajevo, along with the keynote speech from Professor Yandrich in a joint discussion session, if uh, you all agree. Um, so, without further ado, uh, uh, we uh, will just, uh, my colleague Mario and myself will just go over a few details what uh, we see as um, uh, the most uh, important for uh, kind of underlining uh, our four or five years of continuous work in developing of media and information uh, literacy on a strategic uh, kind of grounds and levels. This is just uh, an overview of the, let's say, milestone activities and, and achievements we have done in past years. Um, there has been a uh, uh, Lot of meetings uh, developing academic excellence through research, um, uh, national consultations, working on policies, uh, write, writing and drafting uh, key documents, um, and also developing um, models uh, on, on how to best integrate this, uh, what we have accumulated through uh, last years. Uh, so, uh, in, in first phases, we have done numerous um, meetings, consultations, workshops. In second year, we expanded even more, went uh, uh, throughout whole Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, got uh, our target groups, teachers, librarians, students and journalists together. Uh, in, the, in the third year, we have uh, further developed with uh, more knowledge, experience, materials on how to present uh, all this into a, a joint model. Uh, obviously, uh, this year has brought some new <laughs> challenges. So suddenly, oh, we have to, have to uh, transition into the online world with uh, uh, kind of um, also methodology being adopted for the work in online. I think we did that as well on relatively um, uh, good base and scale and uh, we had came up to this uh, which is a strategic uh, development of Vinya information literacy in Bosnia and Herzegovina. We have, um, we seem, uh, we think that, uh, that this is uh, very important to understand uh, uh, information literacy and democracy and especially the focus on how to best um, position role of information professionals for civic development in Bosnia and Herzegovina. To go over briefly this, uh, uh, what seems to be very complex model, but actually very simple to understand. We have been working on uh, three levels uh, simultaneously and one relying on each other uh, between policy development, uh, research and development and all leading to the kind of continuous process of developing the hybrid model for multi-stage integration of media information literacy into um, the Bosnian society, but it focus obviously on education system. Um, let's start with the 
just brief explaining what the hybrid model is. It includes these uh, four key elements, which is the horizontal and vertical integration of media information literacy, uh, which includes, of course, lifelong learning process, cross curriculum cooperation, and interprofessional partnership, especially uh, on the primary and secondary school level between librarians, teachers, and students. Uh, hybrid model includes uh, digital dynamic learning objects as a cornerstone key for understanding the uh, need to the shift in paradigm in, in, in learning process um, that will be based and supported by open education uh, resources and especially uh, with included guided inquiry design as the model of uh, new uh, uh, approach to teaching in, in, in digital environment, uh, which is actually uh, learning through research on policy level, uh, because we want to uh, our, our key kind of uh, guiding uh, 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 visions, models and morals are that it has to be feasible and sustainable. So we want this um, to be something that future generation will continue developing. So uh, necessary to have support for the key stakeholders and to be based on very uh, clear and understandable policy documents, uh, as well as background papers, which detailly explain all the process. Obviously, this cannot go without extensive process of lobbying and advocacy because among other things raising awareness about the importance of such integration of media information literacy is one of the key key elements uh, on the research and development side uh, beside uh, extensive empirical researches we have done uh, the trainings the workshops we had done with our uh, three key uh, target groups teachers librarians students and journalists uh, which we have understood also in terms of uh, research and development, not to be a uh, purpose for itself as a training and workshop, but also a way to understand how these target groups are uh, breeding, what's, what's their key uh, uh, needs and how to best uh, uh, respond to this. Also, we have uh, developed... Um, which is still in testing phase, the massive online open course of media information literacy, which will be at the university level a uh, certified course supported by uh, UNESCO. And uh, all of this will, will be presented more in detail by our colleagues later in, uh, in the second session. Uh, uh, we have also been working on um, uh, developing a, a course in primary school uh, society, culture, and religion in digital age as the small pilot scale on this curriculum level uh, to, to kind of uh, test all of the above, uh, which uh, I have mentioned. Uh, also, uh, for the future uh, audience, uh, we are preparing uh, you know, a variety of publishing um, editions uh, in media information literacy that can be used and also uh, obviously published under Creative Commons license and offered uh, for, for other interested parties to use our model. Uh, what uh, we would like uh, for everybody to understand that uh, how we see media information literacy what uh, media information literacy is and what is not. So um, as we see it, it is not only about technology. It is not only uh, about content. It is not only about media. It is not only about skills, specifically digital skills as uh, a lot of the discussion is uh, uh, working about this, this, this uh, idea. It is about the process. It is about the attitudes and approaches. And on the end, it's about ethics and politics. Uh, 
my colleague Mario will continue with this. Mario. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mario Hitters uh, from the University of Sarajevo, Faculty of Philosophy. And uh, I have been working with Emir closely the last four years on this uh, model that Emir has just presented. Uh, I have to uh, mention that uh, most of our activities actually come out from information. Uh, okay, <laughs> now again. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mario Hibbert, University of Sarajevo, Faculty of Philosophy. And uh, last four years, I've been working with Emir closely uh, on uh, developing this uh, strategic model that he just uh, has presented to you. Uh, but uh, uh, in the beginning, I just uh, would like to mention that uh, uh, most of all of uh, our activities actually come out from uh, information ethics background uh, as applied descriptive and emancipatory theory. And we see that uh, information ethics uh, uh, gives us opportunity to uh, uh, approach to, the, to critical media information uh, literacy uh, uh, attitude development because uh, uh, it uh, encompasses dangers and opportunities uh, that arises from uh, uses and abuses of digital technology. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the the primary goal of information ethics and uh, the primary goal of our uh, activities is to empower citizens and empower uh, information professionals to manage better their lives understanding informational computational structures as instruments of surveillance and data that transforms individuals and societies into puppets of states and the corporative powers as uh, Rafael Capuro puts it. So uh, uh, we, uh, 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 we develop, uh, we are trying to develop all our uh, uh, activities in terms of uh, uh, explaining and uh, uh, understanding uh, uh, the uh, uh, non-human agencies uh, that are in play with the, uh, 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 with all of our lives uh, uh, that we call it as uh, uh, Emir uh, mentioned uh, uh, on life as Luciano Floridi puts it. Emir. So uh, 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 if we uh, uh, are aware that uh, being human in a hyper-connected era means that uh, uh, we have to understand the blurring of the distinction between reality and virtuality, the blurring of the distinctions between human, machine, and nature, the reversal from information scarcity to information abundance, and the shift from privacy of entities to the primacy of interactions, we are uh, uh, we are actually uh, to understand the digital condition. The digital condition, as uh, uh, Felix Staller puts it, uh, 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 could be defined uh, uh, through the patterns that shape our daily lives, culture, and politics. And he says it's a referentiality, commonality, and algorithmicity. And the algorithmicity is the uh, uh, most uh, 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 the current uh, 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 and, and basic uh, 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 way to understand what is actually going on under the scenes. So the invis invisibility of uh, uh, computationality uh, is uh, what we are trying to uh, 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 get in front of the, the eyes of uh, citizens and uh, professionals to uh, understand the deep, uh, deep materiality of uh, uh, AI structures hidden behind the front end of the, of the internet. So uh, structural changes of information environment actually uh, 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 normalize the post-democracy as uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the background for the erosion of liberal democracy institutions and weakening of the old style information uh, 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 gatekeepers as media, uh, civil society or organization, government, academic uh, structures, etc. So uh, uh, 
in terms of algorithmicity and the invisibility of these uh, uh, infrastructural hidden uh, agendas, uh, uh, we see that uh, uh, netizens are not being able to influence the social texture of digital condition. So uh, uh, technically everyone is allowed to have a voice, but decisions are ultimately made by selected few. So it became urgent to explore and understand how algorithms uh, uh, use and uh, take advantage or manipulate our cognitive loopholes and biases. Uh, and this is the, the map uh, that uh, uh, my colleague from Novi Sad, Vladan Yoller, uh, 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 has uh, uh, been developing uh, together with uh, Kate Crawford, uh, uh, showing uh, the, the uh, the deep materiality of uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, as a uh, 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 algorithmic fab, uh, uh, factory and uh, the, the black box uh, society, which we are all living uh, in today. So uh, uh, I would say that uh, digital technology invisibly shapes productions of subjectivity and destruction of the social. So that invisibility uh, uh, health loving uh, 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 names uh, uh, as something that uh, has come to uh, or reached uh, its hegemonic state. And uh, 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 in that terms, uh, uh, cultural he hegemony of uh, uh, digital condition lies uh, 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 definitely in, uh, 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 in, in the background of all the activities that uh, uh, humans and machines are uh, currently uh, 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 interplaying. So uh, I would say that uh, 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 all these uh, 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 facts are actually uh, uh, show us that uh, uh, we live uh, uh, epistemologic crisis and uh, uh, I will just uh, uh, try to mention uh, uh, a couple of issues that uh, shows uh, how we uh, uh, get into the transition from indexing of documents to the indexing of people from democratization of access to information and knowledge to data extractivism from automatization of information flows to automating of the people uh, from tools of empowering to tools of oppression from interactivity to interpassivity from freedom of speech to fake news increased polarization rising authoritarianism for no from from open access to open divide, from open services to data and AI monopolies. So this is actually uh, uh, what we uh, are trying to keep in mind when uh, developing uh, uh, our uh, uh, future uh, activities and next steps in uh, uh, media and information literacy here in Bosnia. So uh, uh, we are uh, definitely in need to uh, pay attention uh, uh, that uh, uh, we need institutions and form so political debate dealing with ethical and legal issues of information society and with the information and media literal professionals empowered to deal with epistemic changes induced by digital technology. And this is the example uh, 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 of the online course for the all you AU citizens that uh, uh, Finland uh, uh, launched uh, during the, the, the presidency of the Council of the European Union. It's the online course uh, uh, with ambition to educate at least 1% uh, of European citizens on artificial intelligence by uh, 2021. And uh, 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 it, it definitely shows us that uh, we have to reinvent uh, uh, existing theories and existing practices because uh, uh, most training on uh, media and information literacy uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, puts the responsibility on individual rather than roles of institutions and tech platforms. So uh, uh, reshaping the language of the new media disruption is actually the ethical imperative to question the idea of digital progress, uh, 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 which uh, uh, somehow tries to uh, uh, convince us that technology is going to solve all our problems, all our social 
problems. So uh, uh, our keynote speaker, Petar Jandric, is uh, the one who uses the term uh, uh, lately uh, uh, as, uh, 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 as post-digital uh, 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 need to approach to these uh, 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 messy, hard to define, unpredictable digital analog, technical and non technological, biological, informational uh, 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 environment we are uh, uh, sharing today and uh, uh, trying to emphasize that post-digital is the boat, the rapture in our existing theories and also their continuation. Uh, for the end, uh, uh, I will just uh, uh, remind all of us that on the closing chapter of Neil Postman's book uh, that technology education is not a technical subject, but it is a branch of humanities. So uh, uh, I uh, invite all of us to uh, 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 have a, a fruitful discussion on the uh, 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 transdisciplinary and multidisciplinary uh, uh, issues uh, 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 of uh, media and information literacy and for uh, 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 today's opening of the conference. I'm really glad that we uh, have uh, uh, this morning with us uh, uh, Professor, uh, uh, Professor Jandric, who is uh, 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 who has accepted our uh, invitation to to be a keynote uh, uh, today, and he is a, a, a professor of uh, Zagreb University of Applied Sciences, also visiting professor of University of Wolverhampton, visiting associate professor of University of Zagreb. But his previous academic affiliations and uh, uh, activities uh, with the Croatian Academic Research Network, National and E Science Center at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, uh, and uh, his uh, 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 continual interest to uh, uh, intersect critical pedagogy with the information and communication technologies uh, finally uh, uh, led to uh, 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 post-digital science and education journal who, uh, that he is currently uh, 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 taking care of as an editor-in-chief, which is uh, 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 growing uh, 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 in, in a scientific community uh, 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 very, very, uh, uh, very fast, I would say. And uh, uh, Petar, uh, are you, do you hear us? Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you very much for this beautiful uh, introduction. Uh, uh, Thank you, Mario, and I would like to appreciate Petra for joining us. Just to remind everybody that we have a Q&A session of the webinar that all attendees can use to uh, ask questions that we'll be trying to uh, answer to you during our discussion session, and that we are also live on uh, YouTube. The, hence, there's no uh, way that you can miss us. So uh, using all the technical uh, possibilities. Uh, I would also like to uh, appreciate uh, once again Professor Andres for joining us and please Petra, uh, the floor is yours. Can you allow me to share the screen please? Uh, You can join. You can share the screen now. Thank you. Okay. So first of all, again, thank you so much for the invitation to give this talk. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today with you. I thank you a lot for this amazing introduction. It's a really an exciting way to start a conference, and I look forward to participating and to following the presentations until the end of the day. I especially thank all the participants who are here now in these days of uh, the pandemic when it's really so difficult to find the time, find the space. I think that it's really, really important and crucial to, to engage in this type of scientific dialogue. So thank you very much to everybody who is here right now. And again, I 
for this presentation entitled Digital Learning and Information Profession, I, I was really thinking hard how I, I should approach the problem and what actually I should present. And then I remembered actually that my own background, by the way, this is my website, it's just name and surname.com, where my first degree is in physics and then I ended up through education and philosophy and sociology, finally in information science. And I was thinking of how to wrap up all these ideas that you talked about so eloquently in your, in your introduction and how to connect this really to this challenge of information science. And then I remembered this old thing. I'm pretty sure that everybody knows this. This is this uh, uh, hierarchy between data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. So these days we are definitely in the data deluge, meaning that there's a huge amount of data going on all around us and there's it's really it's really hard to break through this data but then when we have unstructured data which we turn into information then we can do things with this information so now this information becomes something that can be processed now depending on the ways we process these things we get different types of knowledge and as uh, somebody said earlier this morning we also have a situation where we sometimes have texts like produced by people or by artificial intelligences, and we are not really sure who produced this knowledge and how. And then this turns to wisdom. And, and there is also delusion wisdom, as we can see from this post-truth environment, from various, just take a look at the pandemic and the news about the pandemic all over the world. And and let's think of how different people react to all this data, information, and knowledge about the pandemic. So there's a huge amount of, no of knowledge about the pandemic, but some people decide to say, I will never vaccinate myself, and other people decide to say, I will vaccinate myself as soon as the vaccine becomes available. So depending on, we have this interplay between data, information, knowledge, and wisdom, which is really the basic of information science, and not just the basics of information science, but also the basics of what I would like to talk about today. So if you take a look at scientific research these days, and we also, we often speak about these things. So in one of my recent articles, I started to actually, I tried to actually uh, pin down some numbers about it. So in the world, at the moment, we have between seven and eight million active scientific researchers. When I say active researchers, I mean people who published uh, something in a scientific publication in the past few years. We have a, a bit more than 33,000 active scholarly peer-reviewed journals in English, and a bit less than 10,000 of non-English language journals. So we are speaking about around 45. 44,000 active journals. Now, these journals produce, publish over 3 million articles per year, which is a huge number. And the number of scholarly articles grows at about 4% a year. The number of scholarly journals grows at a rate of 5% a year. And this whole thing creates what I was speaking of, 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 of this data, information, and knowledge deluge, which is, which is huge. Because now I, I did in post-digital science education, which is the journal that I founded and that I'm editing, I, was, uh, I did a huge special issue on educational aspects of the COVID, of the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. And what I was looking there was, uh, I'm going to give you again a bit more numbers, which are not on the screen. That at the moment, uh, people working in 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 who want to research COVID nineteen are faced with about two and a half thousand new articles per day. Meaning that every day the scholarly community publishes two thousand five hundred articles on COVID nineteen. 
So obviously it's impossible to deal with this. Obviously it's impossible to read two and a half thousand articles per day. No human researcher can do it. So how do we deal with this? How do we explore the problem that we are dealing with? And what do we do with this? So before I continue answering this question, I would like to say that this, uh, this, this, this uh, huge number of scientific papers and journals and research really reflects <clears throat> the rising complexity of the virus society. So when we speak about knowledge economy, for instance, and when you speak about those things, of, of course, we haven't, uh, we never went out of the era of industrial production. We actually have more industrial products than ever these days. But still, we live in knowledge economy. And this implies that educational systems now increasingly are oriented to needs of the marketplace. And this turns education into a commodity or an asset, something that can be sold, something that can be understood as an investment, something that can be used as a way to further one's own personal or circumstances, or even social circumstances. So, for instance, some societies, like Estonia, for instance, decide to go fully digital, and then the whole society kind of reaps the, the fruit, the fruit uh, of these efforts. So the thing is that we live in the world which is increasingly becoming complex and educational systems are uh, responding to these challenges in various ways, which unfortunately are not always necessarily in line with some other ideals that education used to have up to very recently. So in the whole world, the UK and the US mostly, but also elsewhere in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in Croatia, where I come from, in the most of Europe, except probably Germany, uh, fees for students are rising every year and it becomes more and more expensive to study. So not everybody can study, only those who can afford study. In the US, it has related, uh, resulted in a huge crisis related to student debt, which is a really interesting thing. You look it up if you. If you haven't, it's it, it's an amazing uh, amount of money which banks are lending to students these days. So when you're speaking of rising complexity of the society and of the role of uh, uh, science and education in this rising complexity, we should understand that scientific systems and educational systems are dialectically intertwined with 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 the wider society so we cannot really just say now we will uh, uh, set up some scientific systems or educational systems which will be much different from the society because the the whole idea is that kind of these systems correspond and they work together so in sciences we have some coping strategies uh, one of the first, some of you have probably tried to publish something. And we have now these days, we have really tough publication standards. For instance, in my journal that I'm editing, which is post-digital science and education, we now have acceptance rate of less than 10%. So out of 10 submitted articles, we published less than one. Now, but we still produce a huge amount of data in spite of all that. And there are two main routes. That that, that we can actually that we can actually proceed with. The first route is our various analysis using artificial intelligences, big data, artificial intelligences, digital humanities, whatever. Many things that I was looking at your video abstracts yesterday uh, while I was preparing for this talk. And many of the things that you are talking about in your video abstracts are actually here sometime along these lines. But then, if we decide that we will not use artificial intelligences, if we decide that we will do these things ourselves, then we, are, we can read only selected articles. And what we can read? Well, we can read what we, somebody recommends to us, what something that was written by a good scholar that we know of, something that was that's popular, maybe something that popped up on our Twitter or Facebook or whatever, Instagram even. 
scientific scientific communications these days work in really in really strange ways. Both are non satisfactory. So if we apply artificial intelligence to these, for instance, two and a half thousand journals, about, uh, sorry, articles per day about the COVID, we will get something, but we don't know actually how what these artificial intelligences exactly did with the articles, so we can miss something. If we decide to read only a small pile of it, say two articles per day, again, we don't know what we are missing in the rest. So we obviously need some kind of combination. Uh, I will move on to coping strategies in education. In education, we change curricula, pedagogies, assessments. Uh, it's a whole big bunch called educational reform. So it's not just in Bosnia, Herzegovina, Croatia. It's also in Finland, in the US. Information literacy is a hugely important aspect of this, of course, of these coping strategies and of these changes. It's probably the main aspect here. But it's not the only aspect. When we speak about implementation of technology, we, we can also speak about various technologies. You know, There are technologies like, like this that we are using now. So basically, I'm using a computer to present something to you because unfortunately I'm not able to come to Sarajevo and talk to you directly because or wherever you are in Europe because of the COVID. But then there are other implementations of technology. I mean, there's a lot of biotech going on in schools this morning, especially in Southeast Asia where, where they are now measuring uh, students' eyeballs, students' attention, various things which really create systems in which biology and information are deeply intertwined. And then, of course, the COVID-19 has brought about many changes and shifts. Again, I would refer you to the special issue of post-digital science and education to take a look at this because we really published an amazingly large number of important articles in this direction. And the thing is that COVID-19, what it did really, has introduced tremendous, tremendous, tremendous changes because now we suddenly applied a lot of technology that maybe we used to have or maybe we used to use sometimes. But now all our keynotes, all our conferences, all our, all our educations are, are now are now online. And that brings about significant, significant transformations of the way we teach and we learn and of the way how this teaching and learning impacts the wider society and vice versa. So the thing is that with these coping strategies in education and science, what we actually arrive to is a, some sort of blend. It's a blend of human intelligence and non-human intelligence or artificial intelligence. Now, these artificial intelligences can come in various forms, deep learning, many things that, again, some of you have mentioned in your very, very deep and insightful presentations. But also, Pierre Levy, who is a French philosopher of technology, has made this important point, which is now on your screens. And I will not read it directly, but I would like to emphasize that collective intelligence is a scientific, technology, technical, and political project. Mario mentioned politics. It's really, and everybody actually mentioned politics, which is really important. The themes to make people smarter with computers. So we are not trying to make artificial intelligence smarter than people. We are trying to create a reconfiguration in which people and technologies interact in ways which benefit our existence on this planet Earth. Now, I, I call in, in the journal and elsewhere, I prefer to call this post-digital reality. Again, I don't have a slide here about post-digital because I didn't want to turn this talk into this direction. But why post-digital? Because collective intelligence, for instance, is necessarily a blend between the digital and non-digital technology. Uh, it's collective in intelligence is definitely necessarily something that, that, that connects those two major, major, major forces that we currently have that Mario so nicely and eloquently put on his slide, so we have a convergence between biology and information. And in this convergence, if we divide this, it, to, 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 we, can, we can say that we have the four main aspects of this. One aspect is we learn, then, then we think, then we act and we feel. Uh, 
this 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 classification has arrived from a line of uh, several ar articles that have published over the past few years, and you will get them in the bibli bibliography at the end of this presentation. So I would just like to mention that obviously those four aspects of human reality are deeply interconnected. However, in order to approach them in a more studious way, we simply need to kind of classify them. So I will talk about them in separation, but when I talk about them in separation, I will really, you can really, should never forget that all these things are actually deeply intertwined together. So when we speak about we learn, then we speak about various, various uh, ideas of connecting the human and the non-human, whether it's Peter connecting to Mario through Zoom, whether it's something, whether it's Peter using artificial intelligences to make sense of two and a half thousand articles per day, whether it's Peter and Mario sitting in the pub drinking beers and discussing, we always have end up with this post-humanist approach where the social and the material worlds come together. So when we speak about information, we don't speak just about invisible bits and bytes. We also speak about deep, deep, deep technical and material, actually, infrastructure, which comes, which lies behind. It. So these days, if we want to talk about it's not the question is not whether we should accept or reject artificial intelligence. The question is how to create a kind of teaching which is neither human nor machinistic, but some kind of gathering of the two. The concept of gathering is the key here. And of course, in order to do this, in order to create these things, we need the critical philosophy of the digital or the post-digital. The idea is that we must connect our understanding and knowledge of the processes of quantum computing complexity, deep learning, and so on, as they emerge from the techno-scientific global system, and I would say bioscientific, and I would say actually bioinformational capitalism that we are going to talk about a bit later, which transforms not just the way we learn, but also the way we think, the way we act, the way we feel, the way we work, the way we conduct our very personal relationships, the way we relate to our families, the way we uh, 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 relate to our work and our workplaces, especially these days in the COVID. Like, I mean, many of us are working from home now. So how does it, so obviously learning and working are deeply intertwined with, with, with our personal lives. Okay, so moving to we think, uh, it's important to emphasize that we think arrives into being through we, we learn, and we learn is, is essential as an essential attribute of human beings. And that's why I started with learning, not just because this was my kind of topic here, but because I wanted to start with learning because learning is we all learn from cradle to grave. It's impossible. It's in, it's in human nature to learn. So, Astra Taylor, in one of the interviews I did with her a couple of years ago, said that babies learn to speak without going to baby speaking school, babies learn to walk without going to baby walking school. The idea is that we connect things, that there is this person, deep personal, deep human uh, uh, feature that we all learn, and then it kind of in interacts with our environment. So, when I speak in this presentation, this is my presentation. I'm the author, but I'm not the only author. Everybody who passed through my life as a person and as a scholar, my father, my mother, my son, my partner, people at work, random people in the street, everybody has left something in my life. And what I present now is a mix of all these influences in my life. So it's important to say that recognizing this debt of gratitude is not about good manners. It's about, it's an epistemic necessity, meaning that you can only, I can only understand what I'm doing. I can only understand the way I'm thinking if I acknowledge 
my intellectual ancestry. So we need to understand the epistemic consequences of the thing. And of course, we need to develop new strategies for the thinking of the future. Moving on to react, of course, we act uh, or acting together like we act together now. So somebody organized a conference, somebody provided background, somebody provided technical infrastructure, somebody invited some speakers. The speakers did their thing. Now we will discuss things and so on. So we act as a foundational necessity. We can't we think of or we learn without we act. Uh, and here I come to the concept of praxis. I cannot really talk about the concept of praxis so much at the moment because there's really no time for it. But what I, I can say that the concepts of praxis is a dialectic between acting and thinking, or dialectic between theory and practice, as they would often say, much more often say. So the idea is that theory guides practice and practice guides theories, and those things are interconnected again very, very dialectically. So when we when we act, we act in a certain environment and we can have three positions in this environment. So we work in and against. So for instance, I work in the system of higher education. And my system of higher education currently tries to charge students quite a lot of money to study at my at the school where, where I'm teaching. And I don't really agree with the idea that my students need to give three or four or five of their annual salaries per year just to study. So what I do, I try to help them. So if they fail, I try simply not to write the mark down. Instead, I try to postpone things. I try not to bring them into the situation where they need to, where they need to pay for my course again, for instance. So I'm working in the system. But I'm trying, I'm working at the same time against the system. But the key thing is that working in and against is like a rat race. It's like a hamster in the wheel. So you can't really, working in and against is not enough. What we need to think, we need to think beyond. We need to develop ideas. We need to develop utopias. We need to develop all those things, which are, again, very theoretical and very practical. And then we need to act towards these ideas. So, for instance, today, speaking of information literacy, what we need to do, it's not just about discussing information literacy. It's about putting our discussions into practice. It's, it's a hard pill to swallow, but that's what we need to do. And there's a huge importance. In my first article that I wrote on this topic, I actually forgot the we feel. And then somebody wrote me an email and went bonkers, and they said, like, well, uh, you forgot to do this, come on, this is the first. That's completely correct. We cannot think, learn, or act without feeling. Or we always feel while we think, learn, and act. So there's personal feelings. I can be very happy because my son today wrote a beautiful homework. Or I can or it can be a collective feeling, like when a football team wins a big match. And then those 20,000 people at the stadium shout as one, bravo. It can be individual, it can be personal. It can be connected to values. It can be... So, and all these things are transformed, being transformed these days by technology. So as you all know, things like social networks, Facebook, whatever, can actually make such a huge impact on adolescents. And we need information literacy to tell them that things are not as they look like sometimes on Facebook. So feeling is a hugely important part. And it's not just about the feeling. It's about the realm of religion, which is myth, symbol, art, mystery, legend, theater, and poetry. So it's, it's the realm in which we can delve deeply into the meaning of life. Traditionally, since 19th century, science these days is separate from feelings and religion. The problem is that feelings and religion don't go away. So they still impact our science, and they still impact our thinking, and they still impact our feeling, and they still impact our, our learning and our acting. But because we methodologically decide, decided to take religion out of science, we simply don't see these influences anymore. 
The key here in my presentation is that as we need to understand the world in order to change it, science needs theology as much as the theology needs science. We need to understand this. Not just in others, we need to understand these things in ourselves. So I'm slowly climbing to an end. I'm slowly wrapping up. So sometimes, so what to do? Sometimes we will focus more to rethink, sometimes more to react, sometimes more to relearn, sometimes more to refill. And it's really, you can't tackle everything at the same time. So when you write a conference presentation, of course, that you need to connect, to focus to one of these things. But let's not forget that these things are always and really, really deeply connected. And let's not forget that connections between these things make what, what is our reality. So what to do with education? Well, the first thing is that obviously we need to reject disciplinarity. So the idea that somebody will teach physics and somebody will teach chemistry is nonsense because these days a lot of physics is chemistry and a lot of chemistry is physics especially in information science when everything becomes everything. So we need to seriously deal with disciplines. We need to finally reject the myth of technological de de determinism. Technologies are not what defines us. We define ourselves, we build ourselves through technolo technology. This building of ourselves through technologies is a political act because we decide how to build ourselves through technologies. So it's not the same whether we do it in this way or in that way. <laughs> and finally, we need to, of course, accept this, this, this links between we learn, we act, we feel, and we think, and a lot more. So I'm pretty much exactly in time. Uh, this is just a starting point for discussion. It's a point which gives us some more food for thought. It's not a final thing, it's a process. This is, these are a few publications that I did on this. And there are some others. You can find these publications on my website. And if you're interested in, in the team, so there's no need to copy this because they're all online and they're all approachable. And with this, I would like to thank you really much, very much for your attention. And I would like to invite you to join us in a dialogue or a discussion about how can we really approach these this, this intersections between digital learning and information science and information literacy. So thank you once again. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I'm really glad uh, uh, that we had a chance to, to hear you and uh, uh, follow your truly a precious presentation because it is exactly what we wanted to uh, 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 explore deeply in uh, during this conference because uh, uh, most of the media and information literacy trainings uh, uh, focus on individual responsibility digital competencies and uh, i totally agree that uh, it is not the way how we build a, a digital utopia because uh, uh, individual uh, uh, in front of the uh, uh, in visible uh, 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 artificial intelligence, it's, it's an asymmetry, which is uh, uh, not going to work if you want to have a dialogue with, with, uh, uh, from, from that uh, uh, totally uh, 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 unfair uh, 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 polls, let's say, for, for debate. And uh, uh, how, how uh, you had the chance to, to interview and uh, uh, talk to various uh, 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 remnant authors uh, uh, about uh, all of these issues. Uh, do you feel that uh, uh, all their uh, experience and, and knowledge uh, 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 shows uh, 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 any any crack of light in in this uh, 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 in terms of, of uh, imagining the, the uh, redefining uh, our our uh, our condition in a way that that this asymmetry could be uh, balanced again? Well, thank you very much. I mean, the the thing that I would like to emphasize and the thing that I try to emphasize with this presentation is that we don't, we can't really redefine these things on our own. The idea, it's not just about, when I say on our own, it's not just about you, me, 
or I don't know, Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina holding hands and doing a common strategy. But it's about this post-humanist aspect that we people really need to take non-human actors really seriously. So I think that the, the, in my opinion, the main opportunity for crack of light coming into, into being is this collective process, which is sensitive, which is hard to lead, which is, uh, it's questionable. Its results are often questionable. And this is where I see a huge role of, of, of information science and education. And that's why I think that the theme that you asked me to talk about was spot on. Information science, because we need to deal with information. We need to create decision-making processes. We need to decide how to do it, whether it's through blockchain, whether it's through whatever. And education, because we can't really, because people in order to make informed decisions individually and collectively must be able to have proper information, must be able to think through this information and must be able to decide based on this information. So I think that that, that it, it will be a long process. I don't think that it's going to end any anytime soon. But I think that what you are doing with this conference especially, and really congratulations for the conference, because I think it's a hugely important part of the dialogue. I think that what you guys are doing really is building foundations for this ray of light that will finally happen, hopefully, sometime. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, uh, ask uh, uh, the audience if, uh, uh, if, if there is any questions, if there are any questions to, to uh, join this discussion. So far, we have in inactive Q&A uh, session, uh, but I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, just a second, I need to mute Mario. Uh, uh, we are together here at the library and uh, <laughs> we have the echo from each other. Um, uh, we, we, we get the, the praise from uh, Thomas for, the, for Peter's uh, presentation, but I would like to just uh, use uh, the opportunity as a moderator also to, to ask Peter uh, in his, uh, uh, for me, brilliant book on, on digital education. Uh, how, how do you see the development of this necess necessity of uh, transitioning understanding uh, from analog to digital uh, uh, learning and education, uh, especially in the, in the countries in the region? Thank you very much. Uh, well, I think that, you know, at the end of 20th century, we kind of digitized things. So when Google digitized all the books and then did Google Books, it was a huge thing. Then we digitized biological information. So we digitized the human genome. But really, we haven't become properly digital for a very long time because, because school systems are slow, educational systems are slow, uh, our countries are slow. And by the way, we are not so bad, I mean, compared to many other countries. Uh, so for instance, speaking about Germany, and I have a lot of, uh, a lot of colleagues and I work a lot with Germany. Uh, for instance, they had now, they, they were very conscious about privacy and surveillance. So in their schools, they had a lot of tools that are regularly used in other parts of the world have not really been used because of certain legislations. So what happened with the COVID, with the COVID, we had a situation where we suddenly needed to switch online. So we finally had to become digital. Now Germany had a huge problem because uh, in, many, in, many, in many provinces, they couldn't use Google, they couldn't use this and this because of legislation and privacy issues. So now they had to, now they had to do some, some completely other things. And so what I'm saying is that uh, each country and each region and each culture faces specific challenges arising from this culture and some some focus more to this some focus more to that 
And I, but the thing is that the COVID-19 has pushed the soul into becoming very digital. Now, the thing is that when you push some, when you do a very sudden shift, uh, this shift, in spite of many, many years of preparation, is still kind of unprepared. So you have this emer emergency remote teaching like Chris Hodges was talking about and so on. And these things are actually, uh, 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 well, they're kind of good. I like them because I think that they really move things forward much faster than, so I think that the, this switch to online learning was one of the positive consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. But then the thing is what to do now with it. And again, my answer is information literacy in information maturity, but not top down. Not with the idea that now we do a conference, create a set of recommendations and send these recommendations to schools. The whole concept of, 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 of uh, collectivity means that ideally those teachers, those kids, those parents, those various social st stakeholders, churches, whoever is interested in this should have a voice in, uh, in a question how we should actually approach this information literacy, how we should, how we should understand and how we should develop it. And I think that it's really, really, really hugely important that because one of the things that digital brought about is this more opportunity for equality than before. But we still don't use this equality. We still still do things top down. Equally in Bosnia and Herzegovina and in Germany. Equally in the most developed European country and in one of the least developed in the European countries, we have the same problem. And it's a top down approach. It's somebody else coming and telling teachers what to do. I think that teachers should be actively involved in this. And in order to involve these people, they need to be invited. They need to feel invited. They need to participate in strategy development, they need to participate in all these things. And we as information scientists, as scholars, we should build foundations, but we should not teach them top down because that's not gonna work. Thank you, Peter, uh, very much. And uh, 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 this is a good introduction to kind of, uh, uh, again, remind on our introductory slide on hybrid model of multi-stage uh, integration of media information literacy, where we uh, actually did try to, uh, and we are still trying to whole process involve teachers and librarians uh, into developing this model together with us, uh, but also working with stakeholders in, uh, parallelly to make them understand that they need to support uh, the, the, the teachers, librarians and educational system. What we have uh, discovered so far is actually that those teachers uh, who are um, inventive, they are uh, kind of understanding the new shift in paradigm uh, due to digital transformation are uh, mainly being uh, not understood and also almost sanctioned by the system because they are going uh, out of the box, you know, of prescribed teaching in this still analog time. So uh, our model is inclusive and, and we're understanding that we need to really get all the parties together um, uh, to, to get this uh, functioning to be sustainable and feasible solution. That's the, at least uh, in four years that we are developing this, it looks like it's going in the right direction. Uh, we'll let you know in next few years <laughs> how it ends up, but, uh, Hopefully, we'll be all uh, able to to you know get together more more often. Uh, Thomas, you you you, uh, you you had a question. I'll just comment. I think it was a wonderful talk, and I especially like, of course, the concept of the collective intelligence. I think that is what we should discuss much more. And also, Peter, I, it very was very clear that just changing to the digital mode from your talk, it does it is not enough. It's not a technical solution. There, also, Mario mentioned. But we need to change the, the social e model of teaching and, and learning if we go to this new, uh, really, um, really dramatically to this new direction. And that uh, all the societies have different paths, as you pointed out. And uh, we are, um, I think, we're far from being there yet. Right? But it's a good step. I, I would also 
absolutely agree. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. It's a pleasure. Should I try to uh, answer these questions from the chat? Uh, yes, please. But also we have questions on YouTube as we are kind of uh, <laughs> multi-channeling, you know, so <laughs> uh, this is the, the future of this collaborative work. The, uh, the other day we have discussed how a uh, huge transition we as, as, as educators and scientists have made Usually you need to bring your papers for the presentation and take care of the content only. Now we have to look for the, uh, you know, background appearance, uh, multi-channel <laughs> discussion, <laughs> uh, muting, unmuting and everything else. So uh, just to get to all the questions uh, maybe together and for Peter, you can kind of combine the answer if it's appropriate for you. So the, from the YouTube, from Tatiana, Apart, uh, the question is, I hope, Peter, I hope to hear something about the role of information professional, professional, as it was announced in the title of your presentation. I think you have uh, discussed this a little bit more, maybe to just uh, uh, work it uh, uh, on the other angle as well. And um, uh, from uh, Sanel Huskic, uh, one of our colleagues from Institute, is the peer-to-peer -peer education a valid uh, was formed to, to overcome issues with uh, too much information, articles, research, and uh, etc. Um, uh, and from Emily, um, let me see. Uh, the sharing knowledge and information is the universities and schools is closely divided to the state due to funding and financial support. Uh, how can we emphasize the importance of free education in the political debate? And I'm uh, wondering, it seems as a step backwards, that education is still not af af uh, affordable for many students in many countries. What, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Maybe you can just um, you know, combine answers into uh, your view of, of this topic, and then we can slowly kind of getting this, this session uh, to the end. Thank you, Peter. Well, thank you very much. I will first answer Professor Tatiana Paretsielosic, whose work I really have appreciated for a long time and whose work has been actually instrumental in some of the development of some of my ideas about information science. So I think that the role of information professionals here is, and I will be try to be short and therefore I will use a metaphor, like a master of ceremony. You know, like you have two people getting a wedding in the church, and then you have somebody or in a whatever, in the government office, and then they have you somebody who says, I pronounce you man and wife, and who says, who reads all these texts and who leads them to write the papers. So you cannot really have a marriage without this third person who will lead the whole process. But this person who is leading the whole process is not in the focus of attention. These two people who are getting married are in the focus of attention. And this person who is a master of ceremony, as I want to use this, this, this metaphor, is somebody who leads the process, who supports the process. So I think that in, when we speak about collective intelligences, when we speak about collective acting, when we speak about collective uh, uh, understandings of uh, information literacy and all that, I think that information professionals should be some kind of masters of ceremony. I think that we should lead. I think that we should direct this process. I think that we should support people in this process. I think that we should organize this process. And I but I don't think that we should put our own goals and our own ideas and our own ends to this process. I think that we should be those who are, who are uh, uh, instant, so leading the process in a way, in an organizational way, but not in an ethical way or in a decision-making way. Finally, the collective decision about what to do with our future needs to come from the collective. And information scientists have a hugely important role these days in the process of putting all these things together and making all these things work. Now, answering to Amelie Boito, if I pronounced your surname correctly, I'm sorry if I didn't, uh, I think that education 
has never been free. Education is not free. People need to get paid. I need my salary, I need my coffee, and somebody needs to give me pennies for that. So the question is, who pays for education? Now, I think that in our societies, and I'm talking about Europe, uh, geographically Europe, not politically European Union, but also the wider, that we generally spend not enough money for science and education, and that we spend a lot of money for some things that we maybe could spend less on, such as armies or whatever. So creation government is now buying military aer aeroplanes so that they can fly around for I don't know what. But at the same time, teachers in schools maybe don't have all the equipment and all the support that they need. So I think that the, the, the idea that education is still not affordable for many students in many countries is a political problem. It's not a financial problem. And this political problem, again, because we are speaking about collective decision making, cannot really be resolved just from top down. Of course, it would be useful to get somebody like whoever, president of this or that country or prime minister or whomever to come and say, you know, we are going to spend more on education. But in practice, I think that we need to live this thing through. And it's not just about, and now we are talking about, now I was speaking about money, but money is not the only thing here. Actually, money is not so important, I think. Even. It's about the social position of teachers. I mean, these days, being a primary or secondary school teacher in many countries, definitely in Croatia, I can tell you in my own experience of my family, fr friends and members, is not really the, 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 the most socially recognized position in the world. Let's put it gently like this. So, you know, if you don't treat, treat teachers well, then you don't get best people going to become teachers. And when you don't get best people going to become teachers, you have negative selection. You, if you spread that, that over 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and you get what you get. I think that we should recognize these people who are doing amazing job in spite of all difficulties, that we should give them more, not just so much more about money, but more of everything, more of social respect, more of, 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 of social recognition to be able, and then the things that this brings, people bring into our life will also be more recognized and more accepted. So, sorry, Amelia, it's not really the answer you wanted to hear probably, but the idea that countries that we come from spend less than 1% of GDP on education shows that money is not a problem. I mean, they could easily spend a few, 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 few percentiles of percents more if they didn't spend, spend some money elsewhere. And the question about peer-to-peer -peer education. Uh, well, uh, peer-to-peer -peer education is very, 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 very interesting way to move, to move forward, and since Ivan Illich at least, and also has is burdened with, with, with numerous problems. Thank you, Sandel. One of the probably main things is what, how, how do you put these peer-to-peer systems within a wider, within the wider context of social uh, recognition, right? So the, the key thing is, I mean, we like speaking that, 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 you know, that knowledge is important. Of course, that knowledge is important. But these days you need a degree. If you don't have a piece of paper saying, Sanel Hoshkic knows this and this, you, you simply won't get a job. So with peer-to-peer -peer education, uh, validation, of peer-to-peer -peer education, recognition of peer-to-peer -peer education uh, is hugely important. And I think that if we manage to resolve these things, if we manage to resolve that people somehow are able to get degrees that will be just as good as the other, I mean, just as recognized as the other ones using some peer-to-peer -peer methods, I think, I think, I think that would be that would be. Ace. In terms of too much information, articles and research, of course, connecting peers helps. So if Mario and I have had a productive discussion about the post-digital condition for a few years now, and I learned a lot from this. And I continuously learn a lot from our discussions. And it's amazing to have a peer living in Zagreb, to have a peer living in Sarajevo, meeting once every year or once in two years for a couple of beers, but actually constantly being in touch and exchanging ideas about our work.
I mean, it's hugely important. Without my peers, I would not be who I am today. But the, yeah, so this is this is. I think it's it's. But it's not for everything, and it's not for everyone. Because in the wider social, the, there needs to be a lot of infrastructure built in order we before we make this peer-to-peer -peer education a bit more a bit more acceptable for the whole society. Thank you, Peter, very much. Um, it's, uh, uh, so uh, to start with, we have the, the, the live response from uh, Tatiana saying that. Uh, I like the this master of ceremony expression and approach. Thanks. Uh, uh, in, in, in just continuing what you have uh, mentioned, uh, I've been emphasizing this peer-to-peer, uh, uh, -peer, but uh, also general uh, kind of getting the, the constructive forces in academia together, uh, developing academic excellence as one of the cornerstone of uh, uh, of results, and this is probably uh, what we'll be focusing in the in the future, and also in our regional cooperation. In the um, second session uh, in the afternoon, we'll hear uh, some of the colleagues from uh, Serbia and Montenegro, which we are working on uh, developing all this uh, together. Uh, uh, Mario. Uh, thank you, Peter, again for your academic and personal engagement uh, and uh, 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 having a chance to, to, to hear you and talk to you. I really liked your syntagm of uh, information maturity, and I would definitely uh, try to say that information literacy will not be televised and it should not be top down, as you said. Thank you uh, uh, again uh, for your uh, keynote and uh, uh, stay with us if you, if you have a time today. Just to say something, thanks very much. Uh, it, it, it's really been a great pleasure to be with you. I, do I have the time to answer to Daphne's question or there's no time anymore? Yes, yes, you can uh, answer. Okay, so... Daphne, thanks a lot for your question. Uh, I've been studying transdisciplinarity for years now. And uh, epistemologically, it's already a bit kind of resolved. We know how to co collaborate between the disciplines. The, the thing is, and, and that's why your question is spot on, how can we promote the exchange between disciplines, promote corporations and prepare an awareness of the importance of corporations? And this is where I will give you my answer and then I will generalize it and then I will end with this. I was talking to Michael Peters, who is a hugely important academic publisher and philosopher for the, of the past 30, 40 years, who founded some of the most, some of the most uh, prominent journals in philosophy of education. And I, once I asked him a similar question and he told me, just follow the money, political economy. The question is, the transdisciplinarity is theoretically already quite well established. We more or less know what to do and how. The question is whether we are supported in doing this or not. The question is whether people are encouraged to do this or not. And I'm not speaking about encouragement like somebody tell, telling you, you know, you should do it. What I'm speaking about is recognizing people's publications for tenures, uh, what I'm saying is recognizing that you can publish one day in information science, second day in, edu in education, third day in philosophy, and still be a professor of something. The idea that people should be simply encouraged to do this, not intellectually, but practically. And pr when I say practically, I mean very, very, very practically. So the idea and that's why it's so wonderful to be here today at the Faculty of Political Science, because I'm not a political scientist and I've never done any, any, any research in political science. But that's cool, because this is the way that we, that we interact and this is the way that we learn from each other. So I think that we should establish infrastructures. When I'm saying infrastructures, we have the physical infrastructure, which is the internet, but we also need the log logical infrastructures. We need legal infrastructures. We need, we need, we need infrastructures which are which are connected to ways in which people actually can make a living, because these days it's hugely important to emphasize 
the people working in scientific scientific research are not free. Most people work on projects, get funded for certain things, and then do things because they were funded to do this, and then they are happy to, to do this because they have the funding for this. So when we change the structure of funding, we will change the structure of research. Very simple. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Daphne, but thanks also Sanel, Amelie, Tatiana. Special thanks to Mario and Emir. Thanks, Sinisha, for coming. And, and, and I will stay live with you by the end, until the end of the conference. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter, it was very rewarding to have you with us. Uh, Peter, it was very rewarding to have you with us. Uh, for uh, the, the continuation of our uh, session, we have the great honor to start with what we have called it strategic session. It really is because uh, all those uh, panelists in, in uh, this session are uh, thinking on, on this level and giving their contribution to the topic of our uh, session here. Uh, sorry. Uh, in this sense. With us today um, is, let me just, uh, today with us here is uh, our uh, dear colleague, uh, Sinsha Sashum. Uh, he's uh, head of uh, antenna office in Sarajevo of the Regional Bureau for Science, Culture uh, in Europe and responsible for the implementation of UNESCO's core programs and activities in Bosnia and Herzegovina. He also supports the development and implementation of programs and participation in new and development cooperation frameworks in Serbia and Montenegro, as well as other countries of the regions as required. He joined UNESCO uh, in 1995, and since then, a living the mission of UNESCO with heart and mind. The main behind the vision, uh, Sinisha Session. Sinisha, the floor is yours. Thank you, Emir. You know, it's very inspiring, you know, introduction, you know, so, and, and I really wish to thank you and all colleagues, you know, that are, you know, that were very, and actually excellent this morning, you know, because I, I will try now to, 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 to present some of our activities, you know, that we are doing in the area of media information literacy. But before I start with it, I really wish to, to say something about the issues that were raised during the presentation of this morning, especially lately by, by Petar, you know, which are extremely, extremely important and they are really connected with UNESCO approach in certain things. I will start from the end of his presentation, you know, the, 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 the reactions, you know, and uh, especially this one about funding, you know, and I very much agree with Pet Peter, you know, about this, you know, because, you know, many of activities are money driven and funding driven activities. So the ones funds are exhausted, you know, so doesn't matter, you know, how this is going to, to be continued. That's why since many, many years now we are working with institutions, not just in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but, you know, in the region to have, you know, to institutionalize these processes so that doesn't matter what funding or not funding is coming, that these processes are becoming, you know, really sustainable. And also I need to praise amazing role of teachers within the present COVID-19, you know, pandemic, you know, but teachers at all levels, because, you know, what, they went through the, so many things through this process and they have proven, you know, that the importance of education process and every single teacher participating to it, this is very, very important. And the last thing about, you know, financing education, I agree, you know, that, you know, the, the present level of financing, is, it's not adequate, it's totally inadequate, but we should keep in mind that there is another, you know, segment, which is also the, the very important. This is about, you know, distribution of funding. If we have more fair and more equitable, you know, distribution of funding, you know, which is allocated, we may even have, we may expect much better, you know, the, the results and also, you know, the enthusiasm of the teachers, you know, at all levels. So once more, I'm, I'm extremely proud to greet you on behalf of UNESCO this morning, you know, at this conference, Information Literacy and Democracy, the role of information professionals for the civic development in BIH. 
in the next couple of minutes, you know, I will try not to be very, very, very long, you know, but you will see there are many activities. I will try to summarize actions taken by UNESCO and in particular by UNESCO antenna office here in Sarajevo, the Regional Bureau for Science and Culture in, uh, in Europe, in the area of media information literacy in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also within the region. In today's 21st century society, it is important that each and every person acquire competences, you know, for media information literacy, knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And media information literacy is important for everyone, but really for everyone. However, we cannot ignore the fact that children and young people are at the center of the needs for information and literacy competencies, for self-empowerment and for better inform information experiences. Our information habits are not structured adequately. Information often comes as recommendations from our friends, Facebook algorithms, or, or, or as a bits of data. We are all faced with the challenges of defining the new formats and platform for sending reliable information and media contents used by all citizens know, especially children and young people. It is also an opportunity to address one of the burning issues. Children and young people often lack the critical competencies of media information literacy needed to participate wisely and ethically in the media and technology mediated world in, we, we, in which we live today. Internal media information literacy policies and strategies, strategies are equally needed by both private and non-governmental organizations and institutions, including all information providers and technology, te technology intermediators. This means a change of approach in partnership with relevant ministries and institutes. It is a link that will ensure the positioning of MIL in various areas such as the media, education, culture, etc. When public policies include the media information literacy as a holistic human right based approach, it increases citizens' empowerment. It also takes into account cultural diversity, gender equality, and social inclusion. This is very important because of the current global context shows that there is a great uncertainty in the current media and information environment that we call the post-through period. In this context around the world, facts are often ignored in favor of feelings, how something looks, looks not what it is really, not it really is. The rapid and massive use of the new media exceeds the speed of formal and informal education systems, and this is very important. That is why the ethical and social context, self-esteem management, respect for individual rights and education for democratic life in the society are in the focus like never before. This is also, you know, contributing to the relevance of today's conference. The key to addressing these challenges lies in developing critical thinking. Unfortunately, besides all efforts of the authorities and partners across the region, and in addition to various legal frameworks and strategies developed or set, the lack of awareness on the importance of MIL is still very, very evident. People across the world are witnessing a dramatic increase in access to information and communication. While some people are starved for information, others are flooded with print, broadcast, and digi digital context. UNESCO action in, EMA in MIL is set in a way to provide answers to the questions that we are all ask ourselves at the same point. How can we access, search, critically access, and use, the, uh, use and contribute context, context wisely, both online and offline? What are our rights online and offline? What are the ethical issues surrounding the, the access and use of information? How can we engage with media and ICT to promote equality, intercultural and interreligious dialogue peace, freedom of expression, and, ex and access to information. Still ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, besides all negative aspects, you know, and horrifying socioeconomic impact, and a part of all challenges bringing wider attention on the importance of MIL. This should be used as an opportunity, as MIL is not yet another campaign, but an important segment of education system, systems, and more importantly, a tool which is to further enhance position of youth within the societies. So I will now provide you with some details and general inputs about UNESCO and MIL. So in today's media age, it is crucial to develop MIL competencies because in the field of media technologies is so dynamic that as we get used to one, 
there is another media that needs to be considered. It is impossible to study and practice this field purely in theory, but rather that is necessary to experience new media particularity, uh, 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 particularity and then learn lessons and disseminate knowledge about it. MIL competencies dur during COVID-19 pandemic are crucial in tackling everyday life, regardless of the area of life, professional, educational, or, or everyday situations. But we need to be careful because we can end in technical side of using digital media and suppose that, and suppose that we are MIL competent, it is not enough. It is rather dangerous to think it is enough. For example, MIL competencies have digital competencies embedded in the form of digital transformation, but we need to understand that digital transformation have nothing to do with using applications and digital media. Digital transformation actually transformed our ways of thinking and using digital media in democratic and positive way. MIL is extremely important at the age of fake news but we need to comprehend the people and the industries which produce fake news. And to this information ha have no power and real impact without those people who shares and approves them through social media. If we want to tackle this problem, M MIL is crucial because it comes with resilience and critical thinking towards fake news. Impact of new media platforms are especially important for new generations because MIL giving us skill sets to understand the new world around us, for example. TV show from Netflix platform called The Queen's Gambit is changing the people habits and attitudes toward ch chess. We can understand this, import, uh, this impact on the society only when we have MIL competencies. The last but not the least, we should spare no efforts to promote important role of MIL in formal education processes. As besides importance of MIL in enhancing critical thinking by young people, MIL is having enormous role in preventing violent extremism, countering hate speech, enhancing respect for diversity, fostering intercultural dialogue, and all over peace building and reconciliation. The role of social media is very important. Therefore, the strategic partnership with social media platforms might help us in promoting MIL, but also having a concrete contribution in implementation of MIL principles worldwide. Uh, I will also provide you now the, the, some inputs about you know, two important UNESCO projects being implemented at the moment, you know, uh, especially in the partnership with the several universities from the region and faculties. And now I wish to thank Emir you know, for the really fruitful cooperation over the years with the Faculty of Political Sciences in Sarajevo. So project building the trust in media in Southeastern Europe and Turkey, phase two project that is you know, the, the financed by European Union have a biggest component in MIL in order to inter introduce MIL in formal education in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Albania with a strategic approach which is only way to have longitudinal impact on MIL competencies of the society. COVID-19 pandemic has showed us the importance of introducing MIL to teachers in primary and secondary education which is a which is approach we already took because there are no strategic approach without systematic training of teachers in the first place. We built on our MIL Clicks community in BIH using MIL competencies to create educational materials for young people. In the form of iconographics and video animations, it is important to have new forms of introducing MIL because younger, younger generations are not suitable for classic way of receiving information. Currently, we are also working on a new MIL regional platform, which is called SCE MIL, with intention to have MIL resources in one place for teachers, parents, and for young people in particular. Also, our plan is to have national platforms in different languages, which are connected to regional in order to cover more targeted groups. Our work with young people is organized through the project activity called MIL policies are our policies, where our partners are working with youth organization from six countries with the goal to have MIL policies adopted by them in the future work. Fostering dialogue and social cohesion 
in Bosnia in and between Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia and Montenegro, dialogue for the future uh, project being implemented by UNDP, UNICEF and UNESCO and financed by Peace Building Fund is the second important project where we have very you know prominent you know promotion of MIL through pro and this project I will just you know introduce you the shortly the project through the providing space for dialogue and continuing the interaction between different groups at the local and national levels this multi-country program aims to address diminishing the trust among different peoples in and between Bosnia and Herzegovina Montenegro and Serbia and MIL may help us in diminishing the the uh, trust uh, the, uh, the, uh, this you know uh, fighting diminishing the trust that exists you know at the, in this moment uh, free universities from the region, you know, and in particular faculties of political sciences from Sarajevo, Belgrade and Podgorica are working on the project focused on the development and strengthening of media and information literacy, prevention of hate speech, reconciliation and social cohesion, taking into account the promotion of gender rights and inequality. Involvement of the uh, and empowerment of young people focus on the common good, trust, peace building, intercultural and cross-cultural understanding, intercultural and education, respect for diversity, respect for other and different, improving the quality of education, empowering of women and support for vulnerable groups. The overall goal of this, you know, the, the joint project of free faculties is to raise the level of media and information literacy among the students, teachers, librarians, journalists, editors in achievable, viable and sustainable, sustainable manner with continuous development of MIL, intercultural dialogue, peace building, increasing, increasing critical thinking and intermodular civic education and learning to live together concepts. So there are several specific goals and I will just try to, to, to focus on the most important one. So the first one uh, is the enhanced peace building capacities of students through, the MI, of, uh, through MIL and especially in Serbia. Enhancing capacities of teachers, trainers for promotion of cultural diversity, intercultural dialogue and tolerance through MIL. Enhancing capacities of media to promote media and information literacy and amplify positive storytellings in all three countries. And then we are also having the MIL pilot trainings in primary schools of the canton of Sarajevo. Due to the to to all above mentioned, you know, and this is in particular important for Bosnia and Herzegovina, policies are basis for the development of MIL. MIL policies and strategies are needed by every society and public support for MIL should be articulated through the strategic decisions based on the specific policy defined solutions. They are needed at the state level and led by the government or governments in the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina with the necessary participation of numbers of institutions and partners. Although Bosnia and Herzegovina has extremely complex structure and constitutional competencies, this should not be seen as an obstacle but as an opportunity, an opportunity for the entities, the Birchko district and the cantons to take the steps to create a collective effect on those help to create a functioning MIL system in Bosnia and Herzegovina. UNESCO is hoping, and we really, you know, sincerely hoping that today's conference will, along with all actions being undertaken under the, the, the mentioned project jointly implemented by UNESCO and the faculties of political sciences across the region, as well with other part, partners, lead the change for you to act as leaders and co-creators of media and information literacy to build youth resilience against this, this, uh, this uh, infodemic. Looking forward, listening your, listening your addresses and presentation, we wish you a very, I wish you a very successful you know, conference today. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Sinisha, thank you very much uh, for your time uh, with your full schedule uh, to, to address this uh, conference and for your dedicated uh, long-term support in changing the paradigm in Bosnia and Herzegovina towards the you know, knowledge-based society and uh, uh, development and uh, uh, introduction general media information literacy. Uh, thank you very much. I will invite everybody uh, panelists and attendees to through chat or Q&A, uh, either on Zoom or the YouTube, also include with the 
questions. And uh, without future due, I would uh, call our next, next panelist, Sanya Kabil, the Education Officer Specialist at UNICEF in Bosnia and Herzegovina. With her 25 years of dedication for understanding and putting efforts in UN, UNICEF mission from ground up, from children gardens, Roma communities, small local schools, but as well on the ministry level conferences, a global discussion and understanding of complex needs of digital transformation in educational reform. Uh, Sanya, please, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Amir, uh, really for this invitation. Also, thank you, Sinisha, for mentioning uh, these numerous projects in which we are all together, so I don't need to repeat, <laughs> save some time there. Uh, this is uh, the first time I'm uh, in this conference and again, really appreciate the invitation. Uh, uh, Amir asked me, what is your, uh, you know, what is your passion? Uh, what is it that you are passionate about, uh, about your work? And then I was thinking, and this is this, um, yeah, as explained my muddy boots so that I go from, uh, from the local Roma settlement and then back to university and ministerial conference and I'm able to connect and to see and to really believe and trust, uh, you know, that the change is possible. However, today, uh, I will talk about uh, something different, uh, uh, but also connected to education. And, uh, and this was really interesting for me because when I was uh, preparing for the presentation, I found a number of different research. And I uh, do hope that this may spell some, uh, uh, some discussion. Of course, uh, my focus would be on children because uh, I work for UNICEF and we have uh, this, uh, the child rights mandate about the digital literacy. So um, in this constantly changing environment of this online and offline media, the best intention of the media content creators do not always translate into the best interest of the child. The challenge then is not stop the influence of the media, this would be a lost cause, but rather to intervene from both directions. First, with the media professionals and content creators to raise awareness of how to report on children's rights in a responsible and ethical way. And second, with children and young people themselves to help them learn to be more critical media consumers and also media content creators. A review of both the most recent policy documents and literature reveals that digital literacy is a complex and somewhat scattered field where different perspectives coexist. The field is evolving from an operational focus that is on the technical digital skills that has already been mentioned towards more holistic approaches that consider also the cultural and critical thinking aspects of digital literacy. In the area of children's digital literacy, policy research and practices are converging from a risk and safety paradigm towards rights-based approaches to children's active digital media practices. In fact, research is starting to show, and I'm sure that you are very well aware of this from 2019, that the benefits associated with children's online participation seem to overtake the risks connected to being online. So the importance of media and digital literacy is undeniable, but we should go one step beyond disinformation and fake news and hate speech and cyberbullying and online safety. We need to embrace a comprehensive approach to media literacy as a fundamental skill for full participation in today's society. And this is especially important when we talk about children. So digital literacy is increasingly recognized as a central element of the skills a child requires for school, work, and life. But what exactly does it mean for children to be digitally literate? A couple of months ago, UNICEF published a study report, Children's Media Habits and Parental Attitudes in Bosnia and Herzegovina. This report is available on our uh, website. So the findings indicate that a wide range of information communication devices are available to children in Bosnia and that the frequency and duration of their use depends on the age of the child. However, children of all ages spend a lot of time in front of screen. 
Older children tend to spend most of their time on social networks, websites, or applications for exchanging messages and playing games, while younger children mostly watch television. Meanwhile, children very rarely read books. They very rarely read picture books, comics, newspapers. They don't read. Only a small percentage of children and parents are aware of the fact that children's use of media and information communication devices is not under their control. Only a small percentage is aware of this and that it can have several negative effects on children. An even smaller percentage of parents interviewed in this survey, in this report we did, were aware of the potential harmful effects this can have on the mental well-being and moral development of children. And this is really worrying. This is worrying from several points, but also not surprising when we know Unfortunately, the children in Bosnia and Herzegovina are not acquiring the minimal level of functional literacy as measured by PISA study. We participated for the first time in the PISA uh, 2018 um, uh, study and the results were that basically every second 15 year old, we know that PISA measures uh, uh, results on learning uh, against the 15 year old students is basically functionally illiterate. So the problem of this learning crisis is now doubled with the COVID-19 when our lives overnight moved to virtual space. How big is the challenge for systems and professionals, and new professionals in academia, to bridge the gap of both functional and digital literacy? So digital technology and connectivity are fundamentally changing children's lives. As connectivity spreads to all parts of the globe, and the use and application of technology widens, the impact on children and their life, lives grows. So children who are connected can benefit from numerous opportunities, but may also be exposed to a myriad of risks. Those who are not connected risk exclusion and disadvantage as most of the modern world remains out of their reach. So the the advance of the new technology, such as artificial intelligence, which powers critical automated decisions, will affect children's digital lives in new ways, not only by influencing what they see online, but also by enabling access to educational opportunities, jobs, health, insurance, and other benefits. And this transition toward a digital landscape increasingly governed by artificial intelligence enabled decisions will have a tremendous impact on children. As children settle into this new school year and the new normal, this is an important time to think about information literacy and how we can best prepare children for a digital world. In both policy and research, research discourse, a shift is happening from an instrumental view of digital literacy, in other words, what a digitally literate individual should be able to do, towards a more comprehensive understanding of what it should mean to be digitally literate today. And now you would be surprised because internationally accepted definition of children's digital literacy does not exist. It does not exist. UNICEF also does not have an official definition of digital literacy. We use the definition of the European Commission. And this definition is that digital literacy implies a set of competencies that goes beyond digital and technical skills. It includes the ability to search, evaluate, and manage information found online, interact, share, and collaborate online, develop and create content, use safety and protection features, and solve problems and be creative. So many international organizations are prioritizing the need to equip citizens with digital skills for economic and societal improvement. And some standard approaches are starting to emerge, but usually focused on citizens of all ages. Despite recognition of the importance of digital literacy, there is still a lack of reliable global data on the levels of children's digital literacy. We know that the challenges impacting the development of children's digital literacy strongly depend on children's social environment. 
and research shows the importance of the family and the school context. The role of the private sector in supporting development of this uh, literacy is also increasingly being recognized. So for us in UNICEF, uh, digital literacy should be viewed as part of broader approach towards holistics, holistic skills and rights-based quality education and learning that prepares children and adolescents for school, work, and life. And UNICEF's skill framework identifies four sets of interconnected skills that should develop alongside subject knowledge to realize this holistic vision. These are foundational skills, so literacy and numeracy, the basic, the mothers of all other skills, then transferable skills, also known as life skills or 21st century skills. They include skills such as problem solving, negotiation, self-management, empathy, and communication. Then we have job specific skills these are technical and vocational skills and we have digital skills skills and knowledge that support development of digitally literate children a number of considerations emerged on how unicef should approach the use of a definition of digital literacy first choosing the right label among digital competence digital skills digital literacy and digital citizenship is important while digital competence has the benefit of abandoning knowledge, skills, and attitudes, it may be seen as a bit overly technical. On the other hand, digital citizenship is connected to the political concept of citizenship and touches upon human rights. So for the scope of UNICEF's work, digital literacy is arguably the most fitting concept as it is more generic and neutral. So I had two motivations in making this presentation. First, through our work, we in UNICEF engage with a number of stakeholders, governments, private sector, parliamentarians, civil society, academia, who often have different priorities and models of work. Navigating this complex environment requires UNICEF to have a strong understanding of the challenges and policy implications, as well as a uniform position grounded in the rights of the child. The other motivation is to highlight conflicting issues where we still do not have sufficient clarity or evidence to help us devise policies that maximize child welfare and well being. And I do hope that during the conference, some of the issues raised here would stir the debate and be addressed. And I wish you really fruitful and successful work. Thank you. Tanya, thank you very much for your time and very uh, passionate and informative address. Uh, work of UNICEF in Bosnia and Herzegovina is of uh, utmost importance. And I uh, truly uh, thank you in the name of everybody that's been affected and it's pretty a lot of people with the great work that you have done and uh, cooperation with the faculty of political science in trying to make this a uh, strategic development on uh, feasible sustainable ways uh, uh, in, in, in making uh, new steps in, in the education environment uh, as uh, invited for others in the chat or Q&A and answers, please, uh, if you have any questions or comments for the discussion with our panelists, please do write. Uh, but uh, with, uh, without further view, we can continue with our, um, our next speaker. Uh, let me just a second. Uh, so, uh, we have the great honor to host Jelka Schulz, the spokesperson and head of PR department of OSC Mission in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, she has a background in political science and uh, market, uh, management, but uh, most importantly, she is a very loud and passionate supporter and spokesperson of continuous development of media information literacy in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, she is one of those persons who is overseeing the expectation of uh, its organization going uh, 
an extra mile. So, Jelka, thank you uh, for your uh, dedicated time with this conference, and please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Emir. It will be rather challenging to say anything new or interesting after all these great presentations since this morning, but let me give it a try. Esteemed professors, guests, ladies and gentlemen, of, on behalf of the OSCE Mission to Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's a great pleasure to address you today in this virtual reality and this conference. Media literacy and democratization are the core of our activities at the OSCE Mission to Bosnia and Herzegovina, directly or indirectly. On a daily basis, we fight for and promote rule of law, anti-corruption, accuracy, legality, and above all, safety and security for everybody. That also means fighting disinformation and fake news or fake perceptions. As you all know, the phenomena of fake news is not new. It has been widely analyzed and debated also today, especially in the context of manipulating the public and preventing them preventing us from receiving accurate and balanced news that we need on daily basis for making informed decision and taking part in democratic processes. New modes of communication have transformed the way news are created and delivered. It has also never been easier to create and place this information as well. I recently heard that by 2022, most Western countries and Eastern will consume more fake than real news. The question is how do we recognize and fight this phenomenon? The crucial way is to enable citizens, and many of you already mentioned this, uh, to see the difference between quality journalism, quality information, and fake information through the promotion of media and information literacy. In this regard, I'm pleased that our mission was able to collaborate with universities in Bosnia and Herzegovina in earlier years in organizing series of media literacy workshops for students. We welcome initiatives to have media and information literacy more present in primary and secondary education as well. Since this year, we also started working with different religious communities in Bosnia and Herzegovina on raising awareness on MIL on its importance and its elements. Complementary way to fight disinformation would be to promote continued research on the impact of disinformation in order to evaluate the measures taken by different actors to adjust the overall approach provided there is one. Those are also key recommendations of the European Union high level expert group on fake news and online disinformation that we fully support. The situation as it stands is impeding or indeed causing the de deterioration of freedom of expression in Bosnia and Herzegovina, as well as deterioration of the levels of media and information literacy in BIH. That's why the organization of expert level conferences such as this one are so important. For just about anything and everything in Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's of a paramount importance to have a strategic approach and then to implement it. That, of course, goes without saying, and it's easier said than done. The element sometimes we tend to forget is that the road to strategies can, and in many cases, must be led by, or it should be heavily line, uh, lean on the academic community. I would therefore like to commend the University of Sarajevo, School of Political Sciences and School of Philosophy, and the broader academic community in Bosnia and Herzegovina, who, with the support of UNESCO, UNICEF, Ministry of Civil Affairs of BIH, BIH Communications Regulatory Agencies, Agency and Civil Society in BIH, and many others whom I may have forgotten now to mention, all of you made significant efforts to enable and coordinate such needed single, and I will underline, single strategic approach in tackling challenges to media and information literacy in and for Bosnia and Herzegovina. The OSC mission to BIH remains your partner in this crucial project. Thank you and please keep safe. Thank you. Dear Jelka, thank you very much for the very concrete, specific and inspiring uh, address and uh, uh, underlining this 
what what we are trying to do actually is uh, 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 get together all key stakeholders, all progressive academic uh, forces, include on, on appropriate way the uh, civil society organizations and find the best partners uh, in, in decision making uh, uh, institutions who can uh, jointly together uh, develop this necessary strategic approach and uh, hopefully use what we have so far uh, uh, reached in, in terms of uh, scientific and research understanding uh, of this hybrid model of uh, multi-stage integration of media information literacy, what we have uh, developed. Uh, just to underline that uh, uh, one of the key findings of our uh, uh, series of researches uh, that will be published soon is that uh, our conclusion is that uh, uh, today in Bosnia and Herzegovina, a 10-year-old uh, child is considered digitally mature. So we have a full-fledged uh, uh, digital, how do you call this, uh, uh, coming to the, uh, the, the age of being uh, able to single-handedly navigate uh, through digital environment uh, and living in the digital world. So uh, we all have to ask ourselves, what are the responses of society, uh, decision makers, and especially education system? Uh, definitely it's not something that we can respond uh, now, uh, but I will uh, th the hope that in uh, next session uh, with our uh, other participants preparing uh, the, the discussion, you had the opportunity to see their videos, but in the beginning, we'll go over the videos and open for discussion with the, the authors of, of, the, of the papers. Uh, maybe if uh, somebody has uh, uh, any uh, question or discussion, we have a few minutes and then uh, definitely trying not to be somebody who will stand before you and the break we desperately need even in the virtual world. So um, uh, Larissa, uh, maybe the best way is to, uh, okay, for, uh, Larissa has a question for Sanya. Sanya, can you read the question? It's in the chat. So I don't have. To. Uh, yes, thank you. I'm reading. Uh, it's uh, it's basically uh, the less of a question, much more of a comment. Uh, and uh, yes, I fully agree, Larissa. I think uh, uh, here uh, uh, the point is to take. Uh, I do believe the, um, the professor uh, Peter also mentioned that is that uh, uh, first is uh, you know uh, going back to basics. Uh, but then uh, also, um, you know, using the opportunity of the new normal situation and the pandemic to kind of advance and accelerate uh, um, uh, the education reforms. Uh, because we, uh, we do believe that, um, that the, the, uh, the situation is giving an opportunity to kind of rethink some of the ways, uh, some of the pedagogical uh, methodologies and the ways that we have been uh, using, um, but definitely let us never forget, you know, this holistic approach, how children learn, uh, the importance of uh, foundational skills, and I would keep on repeating this, like the, you know, foundational skills, these are literacy and numeracy, are mother of all other skills, so we need to always remember that even you know using the equipment before we get the laptop before we get the smartphone you know you need to learn how to properly uh, read and write so this was just a comment yes thank you i don't know larissa if you want to add more because i see you had a long message uh, i'm pretty sure that we'll have an opportunity to discuss so larissa is one of our uh, um, uh, partners in, in, in our project activities and also uh, panelists in the next next session. Uh, we also have from uh, Lila Hadrpach, professor from Faculty of Philosophy, um, 
thanking uh, Sinisha to your presentation. I strongly agree with the, the conclusions that policies are, policies are basis for the development of, development of media information literacy in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, uh, Larissa is completely agreeing with you, Sanya, and thank you, thanking you for the, the, the answer. Um, I think uh, we have, our, uh, as I repeat, uh, we have uh, a varying number of participants as attendees uh, going up to more than 100. So I will kindly ask you all to understand it's not possible for everybody to give the microphone and <laughs> still keeping the, the desired agenda on time. So uh, that's why I'm inviting for the Q&A uh, session of the webinar. If somebody has, we can uh, work uh, questions and answers through this or via chat as you know, some of us, some of you has been uh, doing it. We uh, also including, we have our uh, team members closely watching the YouTube uh, comments and developing on Facebook. So uh, hopefully we'll not miss anything important to, to or raise as a question or discuss. Uh, with this, uh, if uh, we don't have any uh, uh, comments or uh, questions that are outstanding, I would uh, kindly ask you for uh, uh, 30 minutes uh, break and refreshment. Uh, Peter has uh, shared uh, uh, his publication, uh, an amazing special issue on post-truth and fake news in chat, so you'll be able to, to uh, read it. Uh, you can all stay in the webinar. We'll just have, a, uh, as planned, a small break and the ability for you to, to chat uh, on this platform. Uh, and uh, we are continuing, I'm sharing just now uh, the agenda if so you don't have to sh uh, look for it uh, in, in the, the, the website. So uh, this is the continu continuation of our work in the, the afternoon session, which we have called the tactical, which uh, we have great and amazing speakers. And I do invite you to stay with us throughout today. Thank you all uh, for participating, especially our panelists for dedicating your time. And hopefully uh, we'll all continue with the uh, uh, second session from 12 o'clock. Thank you all.
D roll of we are just less than a minute and uh, desire time frame time frame to continue at twelve o'clock. <laughs> Uh, we have all our panelists and uh, quite a number of attendees uh, uh, ready with us. So 12 o'clock is welcome back uh, to our online conference, uh, Information Literacy and Democracy. Uh, moderators, uh, uh, Professor Mario Hibbert and myself, Emir Weiser, which are uh, calling live from the library of Faculty of Political Sciences, uh, University of Sarajevo, and greeting our colleagues from University of Hildesheim, uh, Thomas Joachim and Daphne. Uh, in the uh, next session, uh, which you, you have been able to see uh, in the, this uh, break, the, the, the overall description of, of the next agenda. Uh, we are inviting you to consult the booklet, booklet which is published on our uh, website with uh, all the speakers, their biographies, abstract of their work. So there is no need to introduce them specifically. You have been able to uh, read it. You'll be able to read it after the conference again, which is the the benefit of uh, this kind of uh, gathering where uh, all the materials and speeches will be uh, left for you to consult afterwards. Uh, uh, the, the work uh, will be done in the following uh, process. So uh, you will be seeing the opening video discussion by, prepared by our speakers. Um, and then uh, we can kindly ask speakers to have some kind of, let's say, teaser uh, kind of uh, initiating the, 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 the discussion uh, uh, with all the attendees and other participants in a few seconds, in a few minutes. Um, and uh, during this time, I kindly invite you all to be active on Q&A session, actually Q&A option in, in, in webinar where participants and attendees uh, can uh, read and respond uh, throughout uh, presentation during this discussion. And uh, we'll try to have this in, envisaged time frame in mind uh, with the respect of uh, your time. Uh, moderating uh, this session uh, will be our dear friend, colleague, uh, Thomas uh, Mendel from the University of Hadesheim. And uh, I will kindly ask Thomas to take the floor and our colleagues to start the first uh, video, uh, after which the, Thomas will take over for the discussion. Thank you, Thomas. Welcome. And uh, the first video. Thank you. Technology has been changing culture throughout human history. The technology of fire, mechanical clock, telegraph, and phone, and their. Uh, to be expected, we had some technical difficulties. Maybe in meanwhile, uh, Thomas, you can introduce our uh, 
first uh, panel and uh, panelists with uh, some uh, brief overview while we prepare the video to be broadcasted. Thank you. Sure, Emir. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, yeah, there can always be some issues as we all have experienced in many of these uh, digital conferences now. So welcome back also from my side after this short break. Not sure if we can yet call it a lunch break, um, but definitely we are curious to come back. And now we move to um, a little bit to the north, we get geographically to Slavonia. And we are glad to hear in a second the prepared talks by Miljana Mikunovic and Njetsana, and I'm sure this, I didn't pronounce the name correctly, Njetsana Katavic from, and both are from the University of Osijek in Croatia. And um, both have studied in Osijek and are uh, teaching in the Department of Library Science there in the faculty. And I think now it looks good and we are very curious about your presentation. Please start. Technology has been changing culture throughout human history. The technology of fire, mechanical clock, telegraph and phone, and their new smart technologies. They've all interfered with both our external and internal world, from old tribes that started using guns to hunt, to modern men that use their smartphones to wake up, communicate, navigate, inform themselves and learn, meditate, and even monitor their sleep. But modern technology, now teamed up with the principles of relativism, reductionism, and uncertainty as some of the main determinants of human action and human thinking from the 20th century onwards, is constantly disrupting and shaping our infosphere and our perception of reality. It has led to the creation of new media ecosystem where internet and social media act as new political arenas for manufacturing thoughts, attitudes, beliefs, and evidence a space where all information, regardless of their prefix, roam freely since the cost of distribution made all the gatekeepers disappear. This freedom that was perceived as a gift eventually led to the rise of information disorder that became even more complex when we introduced ideologies of self-regulation, co-optation, corporate colonization, neoliberalism, and social media business models. In the context of weakening of public sphere of commodification and exploitation, these ideologies disabled us in our attempt to understand all the nuances of social, cultural, and economic shifts we are facing. We are no longer making our own decisions, and our minds have been hijacked. The culture of misinformation is nothing new, but in the realm of new media, especially internet and social media, it has gained new power. Certain prerequisites have become an enabling factor. The rise of attention economy that hijacks our intention, reasoning, clarity, and emotional stability spurs the process of algorithmization of thoughts and emotions. The attention issue, together with the problems of impatience, confirmation bias, mental shortcuts, information flood, and the fact that everyone is a source of news, as well as social pressure and social awards, make it hard to navigate the sea of fake news. Another factor is constant identification of the world and ourselves that coincides with Heidegger's idea of reality in the age of technology as nothing but the raw material, or as we could say today, raw data. Though it is failing to account for complex, human-driven systems, dataism is becoming one of the leading ideologies that robs us, datafied citizens, of our free will, sparking, as Harari would say, new disruptions that nobody plans, controls, and comprehends. In the world of raw data, with no overview or context, flexible visuality and visual framing, especially in the context of ideological representation, make things more blur instead of more clear. Alienating information institutions certainly doesn't help. Eric Klinenberg, sociologist, warned that just when we need them the most, we are neglecting the crucial institutions that can help restore civil society. According to him, libraries are becoming obsolete because free and open access to information is out of sync with the logic of the market. And last but not least, the information wars against reality, based mostly on disinformation, led to conformity of human mind, creation of polarized citizenry, and emerging examples 
of the fall of democracy. Some of the outcomes of information disorder are already evident. Aforementioned vilification led to the restructuring of the IKW pyramid and shifting relations between its elements, especially data and information. That is, not only have data and information become more valuable than knowledge and wisdom, but we pay for information with our data, making data the currency for access to information. Though Internet's originally decentralized, democratic and non-hierarchical nature supports healthy mental ecology, constructive public debates, and equal redistribution of power, lately Internet, together with the ecosystem of social media, has become an arena for constant manufacturing and spreading of misinformation, miscommunication, and misbehaviors. Legitimization of algorithms and social pressure as stimuli that engages, encoding and engineering of human connections, altered our behavior into a more confused, addicted, and disinformed one, and brought dynamically optimized changes in our relationships. The third outcome relates to centralizing digital sphere, privacy meltdown, automated predictions in politics, lack of distinction between private and public sphere, plurality of moderating views, and ideology of relativism that together put democracy at risk. Whether we think of Heidegger's thoughts on combining low-level subjectivity and high-level technology, or Harris's warning about upgrading machines and downgrading humans, it seems we are constantly facing the same relationship issue with technology. We need it as a mode of revealing, but we feel inadequate and threatened in its presence. We have the similar complex relationship with information. We crave for it, but we get overwhelmed with it especially today when in the context of fake news and other disturbances in the infosphere, we are lacking overview and context and thus we are failing to interpret and understand information. This further reflects on our communication, public discussions, civil discourse and decision making. So what to do? Some solutions to the system failure of our cognitive spaces in civil society are based on technological solutionism, some on stronger governmental action and control, while some emphasize the importance of education and training as ways to battle misinformation. Media and information literacy could be seen as a personal responsibility, where we try to train our cognitive system and reason to successfully search and filter the information, as a responsibility of broad user communities or few enthusiasts from IT and media sector, such as Radoslav Deanovich from Croatia, who has written and published a handbook on the importance of education and critical thinking for media information, or as a more institutional responsibility governed by information professionals. As theoretical physicist Michael Goldhaber claims, information is not scarce, attention is. So besides focusing on the issues of media and information literacy and the importance of critical thinking, which belong more to the domain of institutional responsibility, we should also focus on training and strengthening our attention and developing mental clarity and emotional stability. But who can teach us that? Ever since the fake news epidemic became a public concern, the library profession has decisively joined the battle against it. By developing a multitude of guidelines, infographics, workshops, and information literacy programs to help empower users in navigating contemporary information landscape. When analyzing reasons underlying the fake news epidemic, much of the list literature outlines as the primary problem a lack of information evaluation skills, resulting in inability to distinguish between fact and falsehood. Therefore, the assumption behind this initiative is that directing users to reliable resources and developing information literacy skills are the primary weapon with which to combat the misinformation epidemic. However, we need not to look further from our own everyday experiences and general knowledge to conclude that there is more to why people fail to misinformation than a mere lack of information evaluation skills. In 2013, Italian programmer Alberto Brandolini coined the BS asymmetry principle, also known as the Brandolini's law, which states that the amount of energy needed to refute BS is an order of magnitude bigger than to produce it. Brandolini's law vitally implies what the wealth of studies from social and cognitive psychology have experimentally confirmed. 
Once people fail to miss information, it becomes challenging to change their mind, even when faced with new and valid evidence. Psychologists and cognitive scientists have been studying for decades psychological and behavioral factors that contribute to the spread of misinformation, indicating that as much as it is important to understand that misinformation is out there and how we can identify it, it is equally important to be aware of what misinformation does to our mind and, more broadly, how our mind processes information in general. Literature on human error in reasoning is quite complex and broad. There are two major theoretical perspectives on human irrationality in information processing. Dual process theories explain that human mind has two basic ways of thinking. An automatic process that requires little effort and is more prone to mistakes. And an analytic process that requires more effort and is more efficient in sound judgment. Studies have shown that human mind has preference for easy processing of information by using heuristics or mental shortcuts in decision making. This tendency, also known as cognitive laziness, contributes to human vulnerability to misinformation. Another theoretical perspective to why people are vulnerable to misinformation is motivated reasoning. This theory suggests that reasoning process is influenced by motivations or goals, and therefore it is biased. Furthermore, numerous studies show that misinformation is quite resistant to correction, and once it is out there, it is likely to stick, despite refutations. Moreover, corrections, correction endeavors can sometimes backfire and strengthen incorrect beliefs. For example, studies have shown that repeating misinformation, even with the intention of correcting it, makes it more familiar and more likely to be remembered as true. Although this presentation gave only a brief insight into the psychology of misinformation, its intention is to make us think. What else is needed in assisting users to be prepared for skillful navigation through contemporary information landscape? Information evaluation skills are crucial, but so is understanding of current digital information landscape. And the last but not the least, we need to have insights into our own information processing behavior in order to inform the design of training experiences and materials intended to enhance critical thinking. Thank you very much. Great presentation. I think it also shows very well the interdisciplinary nature of information science. We see a lot of knowledge cited from our many disciplines, but please let's open the floor for discussion and questions. Ah, thank you for coming in, Snetsana. Uh, hello, hello. Nice to be oh, here. Welcome, Dovredan. And where is Milinova? Milinova. Dovredan. Uh, maybe Thomas has, has agreed we can ask our presenters to uh, give us uh, some kind of two or three sentences of uh, like teaser-like uh, introduction or kind of uh, stimulation for the discussion uh, about uh, their paper presentation and video. Thank you. 
Well, okay. First of all, uh, I'm very excited to be here and uh, thank you very much for your invitation uh, to present at uh, this conference. Well, uh, I think um, uh, at the end of our presentation, the main question is posed and that is uh, what else is needed in assisting users to be prefer prepared for skillful uh, navigation through this uh, information environment we are participating in. Um, uh, what my opinion is and what I'm uh, rather passionate about is um, uh, connecting this uh, research uh, to psychological research and dr drawing more deeply on psychological research. I, my opinion is, is uh, that um, we, sh we could uh, benefit from including it in uh, this curricula and by cooperating with experts in the field of uh, psychology when developing materials and instruction uh, programs. So make, maybe uh, that could be a starting point for our discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Sean. Are there any questions? They can be asked, I think, in the chat, but also if the panelists have any other questions. I'm always a little critical with the notion of the, we pay with our data, we pay for information because this is not a real market mechanism, isn't it? We have no idea about the value of our uh, data and in the real market, we would uh, at least know what we are paying for. And if we look at the benefit, if the, if the earnings of the big companies, it seems that we pay a little bit too much. <laughs> Uh, Thomas, we have uh, in uh, chat I from know. Petar Jandric um, hmm. uh, comment and question. Thank you for the great presentation. What kind of restructuring of the DIKW pyramid, pyramid do you have in mind? Uh, how should we shape the new uh, DIKY pyramid? Uh, yes, I hope you can hear me. Um, well, uh, it's it's not. Uh, I thought more of. Uh, uh, there are some differences between the relations uh, of the between the elements of the pyramids. So they somehow uh, there's more a sh uh, of a shifting of the relations than the restructuring itself. I don't know if we could just put it, you know, uh, wisdom on the on the basic ba as a, uh, uh, basic ground of the pyramid and then data. Uh, at the top, uh, I don't know if I'm talking. I'm not talking more about that, but more about the shifting relationships of, of the value of the, each of the element. Uh, that, uh, like uh, Thomas said, that uh, data is becoming more valuable, but uh, at the same time, we cannot pick the the exact value on the data or on the information. So we know that we are using it as a as a currency, like the same as we're using uh, likes and shares as a currency in social media. But uh, we as users from another end, we cannot pick the same, we cannot point to, this, uh, to the exact value of the data and information. So when I'm saying, when I say the restructuring, I think more of the shifting in the relations. Like we said, uh, uh, at the beginning, the data is the base, uh, this basic segment of the pyramid. Then we uh, go to the information, then to the knowledge, then to the wisdom. I personally, I don't hear anybody mentioning wisdom lately. We only talk about uh, data and information, and maybe we mention knowledge in the context of knowledge society. Uh, but I think that our main preoccupation is information and data, and that's why I think there are in the in the front of the pyramid and then this little segment of the relation between information and data which is very complex where we can think of the data as a constant to information but then again uh, me as an end user uh, i cannot have a clear picture of what that relationship exactly is but we all know that with our uh, uh, behavior and communication, we uh, we produce this data that is used as a as a currency, uh, in a sense that um, corporations and organizations they can make money based on our data. So this is what I thought. Uh, more of the uh, shifting in the relations 
in the relations between the data and information and more of uh, data and information becoming as a, uh, as a prominent face of the DIKW pyramid. So that we, I th but of course, we should also focus on knowledge and wisdom uh, more uh, today. But I'm sorry to say, I personally don't hear much talk about wisdom today. Thank you Knowledge very much. Maybe, yeah. Thank you very much. Thomas, if you agree, uh, we have a group of uh, three, three pre presentations, papers here now, just to try to uh, maintain uh, some kind of flow in, in, in the agenda um, uh, to introduce the next uh, <coughs> panelists. And after that, trying to, to uh, keep it uh, as, as uh, agenda envisaged. And then we have uh, some time for all the panelists to discuss uh, with each other. And uh, under your guidance, Thomas, I, I'm pretty sure we'll have a great uh, opportunity to, to get the new uh, levels of wisdom, hopefully, at some point. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Leila Turcello, and my colleague Lamia Silajic and I come from the Faculty of Political Science, University of Sarajevo. Uh, today, we would like to present you our thoughts on a topic about the media and information literacy in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, changes of the uh, approach towards learning. Just just briefly to uh, first of all say a few words about uh, how media and information literacy uh, we see in the whole uh, agenda of teaching uh, in uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, it uh, encompasses, in our view, a wide range of uh, activities and processes which uh, should lead to a more competent user of media and information technologies now, which is a, a core of our activities at the Faculty of Political Science, University of Sarajevo as well. Uh, how and what was the focus before our initiative? Uh, basically, uh, we had various concepts uh, regarding information literacy, media literacy, digital literacy, etc. And all these concepts were used from case to case, depending on different projects and in initiatives, activities that were held, uh, by mainly different, uh, uh, different efforts of international organizations, NGO sector, academia as well. Uh, the focus was mainly on protection of young online users. That was the main uh, agenda for many years before we started our initiative in, on developing the media and information literacy in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, and the, the problem basically was that media and information literacy was not seen as a key competence for contemporary society. It was not perceived through lifelong learning perspective. Uh, and that was the main uh, obstacle that we were facing at the very beginning. It was not seen as a critical thinking and switch from media and information consumption to citizens action. Uh, it was sort of a buzzword introduced by the international stakeholders present in Southeastern Europe that was uh, somehow adopted by many actors who used to do different activities, but sort of separately. That was the main uh, mistake we kind of spotted in the whole process of development of media information literacy in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which was the lack of systematic approach. Uh, and this, uh, precisely this lack of systematic approach was something that we were trying to um, solve as a problem of Bosnia and Herzegovina in the, the whole, in the whole time before we started. Uh, different terms were used in legislation. Sometimes it was media literacy, other times media and information literacy. Then again, uh, only the term information literacy, not very strict, not very well defined and very uh, often discussed mainly through the prism of introducing one course in formal education. So that was the main focus some uh, five years ago. Let us introduce one course uh, in formal education started from the early age and that course should uh, help students to develop their skills in, in media and information literacy. 
Uh, and another issue, very important, was what, uh, was that this is this was mainly project-oriented development uh, of media and information literacy. In many cases, duplicating activities, short-term activities, uh, with a very uh, narrow outcomes in general. Uh, what we were facing as well was that there was no reliable data on, or surveys on state of media and information literacy in the country, so we uh, definitely needed some more research in the field. Uh, and we also faced a low level of exchange of experience and good practices. That's why we focused on establishing a wide network of stakeholders which should share their experiences. Uh, we must mention a complicated formal education system in which uh, in total in a country of like 3 million people, 14 ministries of education are in charge of development of media and information literacy, which was definitely an obstacle to change uh, any kind of system to introduce media and information literacy. Uh, and also not, uh, the, the, not very developed, the system of training in general of professionals in the field uh, where we saw uh, a problem of training of trainers that was needed. So uh, in general, we may say that uh, there were many challenges uh, in uh, media and information literacy education. Uh, and what we started from was a very broad definition and very wide understanding of media information literacy as a, a competence based on the principles of lifelong learning, an umbrella competence that is necessary in a society which is facing with transfer, uh, transformations and uh, which expects the citizens to be sufficiently informed and educated com and the competent participants in democratic discourse. Uh, what we started as an idea were, was a horizontal and vertical inter integration of media information literacy into the education system through what we call the hybrid model of multi-component integration, which is a feasible and sustainable process, and we saw it as an optimal model of public policy intervention. Uh, that's why we invited competent ministries and institutes uh, that to create a stimulating framework for the implementation of media and information literacy in the education. The key shift in the mindset and the approach in our understanding was a transformational learning. Uh, we based it on the theories of uh, multimedia and constructivist didactics uh, and uh, decided to work more on this idea of the program which is realized to the extent that learning subjects have acquired some new knowledge, some new competences, some new behavioral repertoires on how or how much learning has contributed to overall changes in their lives. That's what transformational learning in the understanding of Masiru was. Uh, the key term uh, in uh, our whole process was dynamic educational environment consisting of dynamic digital learning object and open educational resources. Why uh, we uh, actually decided to go along this line? Because that encourages the development of competences as well as the personal and professional development of the individuals. And also it encourages a sense of control over one's own learning and progress and motivation and participation in the learning and development process. Uh, this, all, this whole agenda actually helps to develop critical thinking and self-assessment as well as uh, organizational skills. That digital dynamic learning object is any digital content that's available through repositories along of a, a set of uh, whole perspective that describes it. Digital educational content is actually all content in digital form intended for learning and teaching used on a computer or a mobile device. This goes in line with the whole idea of uh, users rather than just uh, students or, or uh, those who will uh, consume the whole, the whole material. So we decided to go in the direction of providing a digital educational content uh, and as well uh, as to, to work with uh, the open educational resources. These open educational resources actually go uh, with, with open access, which is free and interrupt, uninterrupted online access to all digital information that allows the consumption of information and data and knowledge 
acquiring knowledge in different forms, including readings, storing, distributing, searching, retrieving, indexing, and other, other lawful use. We, uh, go, we, we establish repositories and open educational contents that contribute to the inform, uh, improvement of the quality of the educational process uh, in, uh, and provides equal conditions for everybody. This open educational content and open access contributes to the universal accessibility of education. It helps democratize the education as such, enables free access to all educational materials, which is very important for those who will consume it. Uh, it's also available for multiple use, modification and sharing, which helps growing knowledge and increasing the potentials of the materials available. Open educational content also includes entire courses, but also some learning materials, content modules, collections, journals, softwares to support development use and reuse of learning. Uh, this was very important to uh, create platforms which will help us learn, unlearn and relearn uh, different terms uh, and ideas within the mill, mill umbrella in general. Uh, in general, this goes in line with reconceptualization of teaching, media, and information literacy, which we saw as a form of social practice in terms of community building, not an autonomous skill. This also helps us develop uh, a partnership, strategic partnership uh, within uh, the old stakeholder, stakeholders. And for this type of learning, uh, in, uh, for example, schools, uh, librarians are key partners for teachers. That was the shift we also tried to make uh, to develop more interprofessional cooperation, which goes in line with the idea of partnership, which is professional and in institutional. The general idea is that teachers and the librarians together stimulate students' interests in knowledge and the use of library resources and other resources in teaching. Uh, thank you, Professor Leila. Uh, establishing a collaborative research community of students, teachers, and librarians is something that we uh, want to do because we want to use a methodolo methodology of guided inquiry design that is based on an innovative uh, team approach to the research process. And that research process encourages and develops pedagogical practices and learning autonomy. Uh, the main uh, reason why we want to uh, take on or this uh, guided inquiry design is because uh, that, that uh, research learning pro process, which, which is guided, presupposes teamwork uh, to support students in using a wide range of information resources to in-depth understand those resources and to, uh, per, to share personal perspective on the research problem. Uh, that uh, third space, as we see it, is the learning center uh, space. Uh, and uh, it, that is also intersection of student knowledge and experience that, uh, that is first space or student-centered and curriculum goals or second space teacher-centered. Uh, this methodology of guided, uh, guided inquiry design supports the processes of developing media and information literacy competencies, and that's why we see it as a good chance to improve media and information literacy in students. Uh, it is also uh, important to understand that there are some obligations in the EU integration process, and those are uh, five steps that are necessary and what we actually do uh, now. Uh, first step is to confirm the principles for starting strategic design. Second step is define the process uh, of development and coordination. Third step is design models for harmonization in the formal sector. That is what we all, uh, have already done. And uh, fourth is design frameworks for non-formal and lifelong learning, and also involve other actors, such as CSOs or other public, uh, public institutions. Uh, uh, Council of Europe principles are something that is expected from the Bosnia and Herzegovina. For example, uh, adoption of an appropriate legal provision, adoption of a coordinator, coordinated national media literacy policy, and implementation of it through multi-annual plans involving a wide range of participants, including media literacy in school curricula, at all levels, uh, and in lifelong learning cycles. 
we need to encourage uh, the media to promote uh, media uh, literacy through their policies, strategies, and activities. Uh, the role of media and journalists is very important in this process. And we need to ensure the national regulatory authorities uh, to have the scope and resources to promote uh, media, media literacy. Those are Council of Europe principles that are our obligation, uh, something that is expected from, from our country. But uh, it's, it's also important to understand one uh, uh, warning that uh, media news challenge and ubiquity of the internet can give the impression that uh, digital age turned everyone into media users and that uh, the digital can be found everywhere, including schools. But uh, European Union warns us that that impression is false. And moreover, schools are a significant exception in, in, that, in this case. Uh, school is, uh, as we see it, only place where it's crucial to train future citizens to understand, to criticize, to create information, and to be active uh, citizen, active participant of our society and communities. Uh, the digital citizens in schools must initiate constant critical thinking in order to achieve meaning, meaningful partic participation in their community. So media and information literacy as a key competence in digital age is also very important for democracy and for developing of our democratic societies. Uh, it is also important that uh, uh, countries that are in, in EU integration process cooperate with other multilateral forums. Uh, what Bosnia and Herzegovina is already cooperating, uh, for example, a Council of Europe, UNESCO, OECD, and take their work into account because uh, these challenges uh, that uh, are facing uh, countries uh, go beyond borderlines and they affect countries both inside and outside the European Union. Uh, it is uh, though important to emphasize that Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, lacks strategy and coordination in this field, even though it's, it's already cooperating with multi multilateral factors. Uh, countries in the process of negotiation should develop policies and strategies which address the following. Continuous curriculum reform, new forms of teaching and assessment techniques, teacher and librarian de development, or how we see a teacher and librarian partnership, uh, school-focused reforms, uh, education for sustainable development, and improved academic research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So very good to point out the complexity and uh, thanks for coming here uh, with the video. Uh, very nice presentation. We see really the, the complexity of the issue and we see necessary changes in the social dimension of teaching. And <clears throat> so it's, I think it's very hard not to integrate the typical social model of teaching and to bring the libraries into this place. Do you think there can be uh, a lot of progress in this area, Leila, Namija? Uh, hello, everybody. Um, well, uh, first of all, I think uh, our presentation just gave a brief scratch or, or a brief portrait of the whole complexity of the issue, as you mentioned, but also the whole complexity of um, this idea of switch of the mindset, actually. Once we have this kind of switch of a mindset, it is possible to make changes in, in the educational system. So the main challenge is, at least for Bosnia and Herzegovina, the way we see it, and the reason why we are doing this in such a complex, systematic approach is basically because it needs a sort of a change of a mindset, sort of a change of way of thinking of education. Because uh, as we discussed yesterday, today on one of the regional uh, work workshops uh, regarding th this issue uh, the first of the first transformation of all is actually to transform our uh, view of education as preparation for work in the field towards the idea of education as a way of uh, teaching people how to learn, how to continue learning throughout their life. And that's uh, where we see uh, the role of uh, schools from 
at all levels uh, in terms of cooperation between teachers and librarians and the outside environment, including media. Uh, they should help their students at any level to learn how to learn in the future using all technologies, me, traditional media and other uh, sources that are, that are available. So it is, it is hard, it's a long-term process. It's not something that's gonna happen overnight, but I think for Bosnia and Herzegovina at least, and for the region of the Western Balkans, it is something that it was like the, the, like the, the latest, lastest minute to start discussing, especially uh, pandemic kind of increased all these usage of new technologies and everything and made us think about all these issues more intensively. So it, it's, it's now or never. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for clarification. And we still have time to take questions after the next talk. Uh, we will uh, invite all the panelists to again. So everybody, please uh, remember your questions and we have a discussion. So Emil, maybe we go to the third presentation. Yes, uh, the next video is uh, also exciting. Uh, result of joint mutual work of uh, our two universities. And after that, uh, please, uh, I will kindly ask all the attendees and panelists to get lively involved in uh, Q&A, but also you can write in chat as, as the video go uh, for the kind of uh, write them down and distribute them evenly. Thank you, Thomas, and uh, ready for the next video. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this small session. My name is Amelie Beutel. I am a master student of International Information Management, Information Science, and I will present you today some insights in a project course on information ethics. The project course Information Ethics Teaching Material from an International Perspective is based on a collaboration including the University of Hildesheim and the University of Sarajevo. The teams are mixed of both professors and students and on a German behalf the team consists of two students and two professors. The project is funded by the DRHD, the German Academic Exchange Service. The project includes fields of both information literacy and of information ethics, because a user in the process of gaining information should always be aware and include his or her knowledge about copyright, proper citation, and avoidance of plagiarism. This is only one of the key aspects this course is based on. We have weekly meetings with input from different perspectives, including a session with theoretical background and in information uh, about methods and models on information literacy by Professor Dreisiebner. We had an introduction of the project Information Literacy and Democracy, which is funded by the Ministry of Science and Culture of Lower Saxony within the program Future Discourses and was presented by Daphne Cheta. And we also had a presentation of the Bosnian Working Plan regarding the evaluation and application of the CRAB test presented by Imina Adilovic. The project goal is to first identify teaching resources for information literacy. For example, the uh, CRAB test, which was published by the Benedictine University. And the second step is to then translate the teaching resource from English into German and from English into Bosnian. We want to discuss then the local adaptions by evaluating the translated content. For that, we thought about interviewing students at the University of Hildesheim and asked them questions such as, what are your thoughts on the translated teaching material? Was the information helpful? And also we would like to get in touch with our local information literacy experts at the University Library of Hildesheim and Brunswick and based on the feedback we gain here, we would like to continue the project and the translation work in the following summer term, 2021. We also have another course in collaboration with another university that is a transnational online course with the Symbiosis College of Arts and Commerce in Pune, India. 
and a course is about intercultural perspectives on information literacy. Some of the course contents are information behavior in Corona times, confirmation bias and how to correct cognitive errors to promote an open mind, privacy literacy, and much more. Thank you for your attention for this very small session. I hope you gained some insights into our collaboration that we have and hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference. Hello, everyone, and thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Janina Alevovic, and I recently uh, completed a master's in comparative literature and uh, information science. I'm here to present to you our work on the information ethics course. Uh, while uh, our colleague Amelie spoke about the organization itself uh, and reasons uh, for our gathering, my role is to uh, briefly describe the results and the way of thinking about information ethics uh, that is actually concerned with ethical, legal, and social aspects of uh, using information. Our team uh, from the University of Sarajevo drew together, of course, uh, in consultation with colleagues from Germany, a specific way of thinking, uh, application, and evaluation of one type of test. After uh, a few introductory sessions, we decided to elaborate and show the application of the PREP test to verify the accuracy of the information. Now, uh, I will not talk uh, about the importance of checking information or the need for concrete guidelines today when we are not sure if we are reading uh, correct, uh, true, uh, or false news. Uh, this text uh, test actually reflects various criteria that uh, can always be described in more detail. Uh, as we found in LibGuides, a Western Kentucky University libraries. After that, uh, I will show you how it is possible to apply a prep test to a specific example of fake news. And uh, in the end, we will watch together uh, a video that we made uh, that uh, that video affirms the use of prep test as a tool uh, that helps us uh, with specific instructions. Um, this CREP test uh, was designed by Sarah Blakesley, uh, which she described uh, in more detail uh, in the article of the same name, uh, since she played with the meaning of acronym. And she said, currency, irrelevance, authority, accuracy, and purpose, CREP. I had my acronym. Not only was it memorable to its associative powers, but is also uh, meant something that uh, con uh, con context in which it would be uh, used. Uh, for every source uh, of information, we would have um, uh, a handy frame of reference to inquire and actually to ask ourselves, uh, is this prep? Uh, now, uh, we have here another uh, similar test by Molly Bistrom uh, that consists of all these elements without accuracy. You see we have currency, reliability, authority, and purpose. Uh, these guidelines uh, are not based on uh, the questions we ask ourselves in the crap test, but uh, this also consists uh, of five sections. We should ask ourselves, uh, can we verify that claim or its claim? Uh, it's important to know that fake news uh, almost always appeals to emotion. Uh, one criteria uh, is that they can't be found anywhere else. Uh, fake news uh, usually uh, comes from the fake sites. Uh, and maybe what's the most important in this part is authors usually aren't 
experts in that field. So um, when it comes to ev evaluating online sources, Raskankala uh, Nitachka Va uh, does an excellent work as a fact-checking site. Uh, decided to creating a safe and reliable online environment. This site fights a battle uh, with different kinds of fake news by decomposing and clearly explaining uh, the motivations and reasons uh, behind their launch into the sphere of online news sites. Uh, Raskinkao and Itach Kaba uh, organizes its analysis into several categories, which clearly show the issue of the news in question by, by the title of the, these categories. Some of uh, these categories are uh, fake news, um, misinformation, um, spin, fact, manipulation, self science, conspiracy theory, clickbait, biased partial uh, information, covert advertising, censure, uh, etc. Now, uh, we are all aware of the role uh, social network sites play um, and the meaning that it that uh, can be shared through a lot of channels and thus uh, concern in some way a lot of people. In that sense, uh, the following article uh, analyzes focus, focuses on a video shared on Facebook. Uh, actually, that's an article uh, in which a woman, a social network influencer, uh, with absolutely no authority, uh, shares her opinion and advice of how COVID-19 is a conspiracy theory uh, organized by uh, industry and how doctors should not uh, be trusted. The, the title of the article is Influencers Still Sharing Medical Advice on Social Networks and People Are Listening. Uh, we uh, tried uh, to evaluate this source uh, we found on Raskankava Netachka Ba. And they already said it's, it's a fake news, but we tried to evaluate it through uh, this uh, prep test. The site actually has evaluated uh, the source as fake news, so the science and conspiracy theory. Uh, and the crap test uh, shows as the following. First, currency. Uh, the video was published and shared by several uh, other sites in a critical moment uh, of the pandemics. And in that sense, it has uh, met with different information consumers across the internet. Uh, the information it shares is very current and definitely it's a hot topic uh, for a lot of people. Uh, relevance, uh, coming from a self-proclaimed expert, the relevance of the information shared uh, in this video is non-existent. It is only a suit up, suit suitable uh, topic and uh, it appears at a difficult time for many people, but it is it essentially has no relevance apart from the actuality of the moment and it cannot uh, in any way help us with our needs, quite contrary. The third one is authority. The publisher uh, of this information has absolutely no authority to speak about such important issues since uh, she is not a doctor and does not come from uh, any profession which would give her authority to do so. Accuracy. The main uh, arguments made in the video have no foundation in reality. The advice to use honey as a cure for COVID-19, the claim that all COVID tests are positive for any kind of symptom, all show that this is an example of total misinformation, uh, with further claims uh, being examples of pseudo science in the online environment, uh, all which make this piece completely inaccurate. And the last one is purpose. The purpose of this piece is to entertain and actually self-promote rather than to educate and inform. 
the source of the information is completely uh, subjective and found on personal opinions, which are in place, but not when it comes to spreading misinformation about such an important step. Uh, as you already uh, saw, this was a short intro uh, to our uh, video, but before uh, seeing uh, how we made a video about the CREP test and promoting uh, the CREP test, I have to say that we applied this CREP test to other examples as well. Uh, and now I will just mention them. Uh, those are a uh, number of, uh, the title is actually a number of confirmed uh, votes in seven American states was not bigger than the registered votes. And the other one uh, is uh, without ideas, without vision, without concept. The only th thought to destroy SDA. And SDA is a political party in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now uh, I will show a video we made about the CREP test. And uh, we made this in a program called Tartum. Thank you all for watching. I hope uh, you like it and you understand it. Uh, now, uh, I only need to explain how we uh, came uh, to this idea. Uh, we translated uh, uh, those uh, words in, in English to Bosnian, uh, and we came to an acronym that is STARA. And Stara in uh, Bosnian jargon uh, means uh, a mother. 
and uh, the translation would be uh, ask your mother. So. Actually, uh, so in that way we can easier remember uh, a prep test and use it in in in, in any situation. Uh, that's it uh, for now. Thank you for your attention, and I hope you are uh, not too tired. And I hope also this was uh, useful. Thank. You. Thank you very much, Emina, and I invite all panelists to the oh, virtual floor now, to the virtual uh, world here, on the and to turn on the video. And yeah, I think this is connect. The topics are well connected. We see we have a very nice approach with this great video to create some open educational resources that you know that should still be validated. And this was also the topic of the one of the topics of the previous talks. And so I think first we open the discussion round for the panelists among themselves. Any questions here? Or do we have questions in the chat already for some of the talks? Uh, I want to, uh, sorry, I want to first to answer uh, Kalamia's question. Uh, when she asked, is it probably uh, we should use fake information instead of fake news? Uh, yes, definitely, but somehow it's hard to get used to, the, to that new term. Uh, we hear all the time around us fake news, fake news, but uh, fake information is uh, definitely a version. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any further? Uh, discussion points. So, uh, where do we have to drive the direction of open educational resources here for self directed learning and for lifelong learning, as Leila pointed out? Which um, ideas can we take up and which ones should we promote? Uh, Thomas, and uh, I would like to congratulate uh, students for this uh, great presentation. And actually, uh, it has been done after your invitation to join uh, the course on information ethics uh, a month ago. And uh, it's really great how, it, uh, uh, how they did it in very uh, uh, very fast, and actually, the 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 the, the idea to to present at the conference was actually made uh, last uh, week. So, uh, uh, I would really uh, uh, congratulate for their efforts uh, and uh, 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 being together with us today. Uh, I would also like to uh, pose the question that was uh, uh, in chat forum uh, from uh, Professor Tatiana Paracelsic uh, for uh, Miliana, and uh, I'm also interested to, to hear the answer because uh, it's about uh, students' reactions to, 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 the, to the topic of digital nihilism that we somehow introduced today uh, uh, during the conference and uh, how, how, how they react to, to, to the uh, uh, digital dystopia, let's say, that we uh, 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 put in front of their eyes? Uh, well, uh, first let me say that there are great distinctions between the uh, first year undergraduate students and first year graduate students, uh, where the, the older ones, they, they are more aware of the things. Uh, and they even say they, they use social media less and they tend to not overshare uh, the information, especially some personal information. Um, so I think that this information gap is getting more narrow uh, in regards to differences between generations. Uh, but uh, I think they are relatively um, aware of the issue of surveillance and privacy. Uh, but more on an individual level. But when it comes to the issue of more broad understanding of surveillance, like um, data collected through smart systems or even smart cities, like the, the example of Singapore and its citizens, uh, and the implications of uh, the implications of this surveillance on uh, economy, on politics, on culture, 
and also uh, the issue of how hacking our thoughts and emotions and thus our communication and behavior uh, is being used, uh, especially with this formula of that I mentioned, combining high level technology, which is AI and algorithms, et cetera, and combining it with a low level subjectivity that is they are using our confirmation bias, uh, cognitive laziness, um, uh, conjunction fallacy, and so on. Um, I think they are less aware of these nuances uh, than they are aware of the, like their privacy is being uh, endangered by uh, Facebook or Google. So I think that they uh, are aware of the things, but not of the uh, this little, little nuances that have great implications for politics, economy, and for ourselves at the end. I think that, that's actually my perspective. But sometimes I think they know some things, but uh, when they hear, um, for instance, we had this discussion about smart cities and smart technologies, which is a great technology in itself, and it can make life much, much easier. But there are a lot of ethical, uh, political privacy issues and when we discussed it, they were really overwhelmed. Like uh, uh, they said, they would they, they just want to take their smartwatch off and just unplug everything uh, when they got uh, aware of the things that are being collected about them. So, yeah. Now, oh, thank you. Uh, interesting remark, Miliana, that the older students have a more knowledge about the issues and more. Mm -hmm concerns so where does it come from is it something we can promote with teaching with uh, material and with open educational resources or is it just that they had some bad experience already or what is the what can be the role of the education there i, th I think we can incorporate it in the in our education of course um and this, this is this uh, it, this refers to our dynamic nature of education which of course we are uh always connected to technology and since the technology is so dynamic so we have to be dynamic too so we have to keep track uh, of what is going on of all the disruptions so of course I think it should be incorporated in education uh, but uh, as uh, it, it was the goal of Snezhana and myself uh, to emphasize more this um, I would say uh, approach to include more different professionals so uh, not just information professionals, but journalists, psychologists, um, even content managers and uh, 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 marketing professionals and even computer scientists, because of, as I think you, Thomas, said that uh, we have more and more of this non-human factor involved, like bots and this amazing story of GPT-3, which I was really amazed to see what it can do already in this, in this uh, beginning phase. And so we need these different approaches to media and information literacy, uh, because I th and uh, what Snezhana said, this psychology uh, aspect is also very important because psychology and its methodology can uh, offer some um, obvious advantages to information literacy. Like uh, I know there are issues, there are issues like is tagging news as fake news, uh, does it have any effect, or what kind of personalities are more uh, uh, susceptible to fake news and stuff like that. Does repetition of fake news make any difference or not? So there are certain psychological issues that also have to be taken into consideration, especially if we, if we think of attention issue, impatience, confirmation bias, emotions, social pressure, and so on. Yeah. No, absolutely. absolutely, very good point. And Leila Lamija, you pointed out that if the importance of lifelong learning. So the question is, how can we motivate people in this for this? Uh, difficult process. It's not easy to always keep up with the challenges and this has to be done in, this motivation has to be laid in school somehow. Can we also lose psychological knowledge or do we have to integrate more psychological knowledge as Miliana pointed out? Well, I would say absolutely psychological and pedagogical as well, andragogical mm -hmm. as well, because there are certain andragogical tools that can be used, uh, especially with, with the adults, because very often we forget that our students are at the age of adult learners, that, they, that we, we can use andragogical um, skills to motivate them. And of course, it is very important to, the motivation is the key factor, especially in terms of informal, uh, informal learning, 
because that's kind of a, something that goes beyond our uh, stru structures of education, such as university or, or schools. Uh, that is why uh, learning uh, le lessons learned from psychology and andro andragogy could be of great benefit. I'm sure that in the whole future development of our media uh, literacy, uh, both curricula and, and content, we would definitely need, especially in terms of methods of teaching and providing these contents towards learners, to, we would need uh, cooperation with psychologists and, and pedagogists and andragogists. And also uh, this mind shift of mindset that I was mentioning is also about putting the learner at any age in the center of the process, rather the content itself or the methods themselves. That's, uh, that's something that me personally, coming from the communication science field, would need much more support, advices, and, and above all knowledge and uh, transfer of knowledge from colleagues from psychology, uh, pedagogy, and so on. Oh, great. Yeah, that's sometimes we, forget. we have to consider the adult learner in the university. Sometimes we forget because it doesn't look like that, but. In this course, we were very lucky at Emina, they did this great video. I could have never done such a nice video, but somehow I gave a little push and it worked out very well. So it's very independent, great again. So any further questions and comments? I'd like to ask uh, uh, Miliana one more question because uh, 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 Slavonia is uh, labeled uh, uh, Croatian Silicon Valley. And uh, <laughs> how do you balance uh, uh, and uh, how do you see the, the academic responsibility in regard to curricula, especially uh, in library and information science, we have been discussing uh, 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 mostly the, 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 the issues that are not uh, 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 well balanced, let's say, in, in, in this cu curricula. So uh, uh, how do you comment on that? Uh, the disbalance in curricula. Yeah, well, uh, I think it's it's uh, it has connection to what Larissa mentioned. I think it's also a responsibility of the educational system itself, because of course we in the higher education we have the most autonomy, I would say. But then again, we are also part of the system, and you cannot just change the curricula uh, as you please. Uh, but then again, we have a lot of autonomy and we can act uh, more individually than in any other part of the education system. Uh, but uh, I think what, what we are lacking is maybe motivation um, uh, among the teaching staff, uh, but not just motivation, the, the lack of time to keep track of everything that is going on because uh, uh, teaching staff has to be uh, uh, oriented towards their uh, scientific work and then the, the classes, the courses. And then again, you have to keep track of everything that is going on. And as Peter said, to read all the articles and all the, the published research that is, that is out there, it's practically impossible. So I think it's really about the, the time and the multitasking, which again, it is another story. Uh, but yes, the imbalance in the curricula, um, yeah, it, it's part of the, the uh, responsibility of the educational system, but it's also our responsibility, I think. I think we, we can all do uh, a lot to introduce these issues uh, in our own curricula or, or try to find a way to incorporate them in, in the already present curricula. Thank you. And I would like to, uh, Professor Turchil also to comment on this because uh, actually what we are trying to do is, is somehow to, to, to change the, 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 the balance of forces in academia in terms of uh, 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 being much more uh, aware and responsible to the issues that uh, uh, we think all academia should pay attention to. Well, absolutely. Yeah, we are trying to, uh, that's why we keep talking about the, the mindset switch and, and we are talking about the whole idea of discussing. I mean, sometimes I have, a, that's really my personal impression rather than scientific conclusion of, of a research, but I sometimes have a feeling that uh, in the educational process, we are trying to put um, kind of new things into the old boxes, uh, trying to, to fit the old way of thinking with, in line with new technologies, new perspectives, new habits of our students as well, or learners in any process. Uh, and that's, that's the hardest 
of difficulty to make us uh, think differently about the whole the whole issue rather than just just trying to incorporate certain aspects of of mm -hmm. it of for example mill into the co different courses that's why this strategic approach is so so important it's so it's more about the whole new uh, new way of doing things rather than just putting the, the, the old habits into the new framework of digital technologies or whatever, whatever there is as, a, as our support. Sort of because, especially because we see how progress is going happening so fast and how the changes of our students are change, are happening so fast. And, and for sometimes in this um, digital sort of uh, skills, they are better than us, the old school, as, as colleague Thomas said, I would never know how to make such a great video as Amina did, but in some other, you know, that, that's where, where yeah, these young generations are much more into the process. And we should, I mean, we should stop uh, acting as we are guiding them and start incorporating with them rather rather than, than going in the direction of position of that I know it I know everything and it's up to me just to transfer the knowledge it's it's totally not about it's never been like that and especially now in these circumstances absolutely oh, this is a transformative and disruptive um, time uh, where we would need to change much more but as I'm young also said yeah Curricular change usually very slowly and behavior of teachers also. So uh, that is uh, the challenge for all of us to include this really into the basics. It is not about offering one course in some time, but that's really the integration into the whole thinking. Mm -hmm. Further questions or how, we're doing with how are we doing with time, Imi? We are discussing here. And it's, it's going uh, excellent uh, for an online conference with people from pretty much all over the world. Uh, uh, this is going really on schedule. Uh, we have, uh, I would say, additional five to seven minutes for the involving others in this very uh, interesting topic, but something that we need to discuss more and more on academic level, uh, supporting this uh, synergy of uh, multidisciplinary approaches transdisciplinary uh, researches and uh, trying to find the answer because it's not one dimensional uh, issue. And uh, as we have seen here in these uh, few several, a few uh, introductory presentations, uh, so many things that we need to put together. And this is what we are trying uh, here uh, in, at the Institute for Social Science Research to get a variety of experts and we have uh, uh, to my count, some, some 50 uh, university profess professors and experts continuously working for the last uh, four years trying to understand what we need. And uh, not only as, as uh, uh, in, in general, in theory, but also in practice, how to incorporate this to be feasible, sustainable uh, development in, in pr primarily educational sector. And as we have spoke, uh, 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 we need to, to, to rethink the, the powers uh, that are shaping the, the democratic discourse. And uh, uh, whatever we think the, uh, this the new democracy is implying that uh, citizens are media and information literate, because otherwise in digital transformation of society, uh, we are missing something. So, and it's, it's, as we are constantly, continuously underlining, it's not something that we have to reach. It's a process. And we have to continuously follow the development of new paradigms. Um, uh, we have uh, at uh, the one o'clock, uh, 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 half past uh, one, uh, second session coming. So we are still up to uh, have a few more questions or discussions. Uh, then maybe uh, I would suggest uh, two or three minutes uh, just to break to set up the new videos and introduce the uh, continuation of this session with the uh, other interesting uh, presentations. Thanks again. Yeah, I think this is very important what you said. This is not an issue that one discipline can solve and not one course can solve. It has to be really integrated into all areas. So you know, maybe let's have a, a closing remark from the panelists and then we can move on to a, a short interruption before the next session. Thanks.
who wants to start? Liliana has the micro on, yeah. so maybe. Oh, yeah. yeah, I can, uh, I can uh, maybe I'll, uh, use a, um, a supplement to an answer to, to Peter as a closing remark when he asked about the restructuring of the uh, DIKLW pyramid. Uh, well, I was thinking about it and maybe instead of, since everything is being so dynamic and mobile, maybe instead of uh, this constant and stable architecture of the pyramid, um, we can envision a more uh, mobile architecture, like a mobile diagram that Bard and Soderquist used in their book to describe the, the, um, uh, this mobilistic power in the society, how they move and how people uh, for, uh, form and group around this different uh, central values. So maybe we can see data, information, knowledge, and wisdom as these central values in our society that are dispersed in this mobile diagram and people just grouping around them. And it would be a great interactive visual visualization to see how it moves through time and where we are today. So maybe this could be um, uh, an another model or maybe a, a, a uh, a first step to see another way uh, of uh, envisioning this uh, relationship between uh, data information, knowledge, and, and wisdom. I don't know if, if, if Peter agrees or thinks it's, it makes any sense, but that's something that just came to my mind while uh, reading his question. Okay, and more just, and maybe Snezhena has something uh, more in relation to our presentation <laughs> as a conclusion. Uh, thank you, Miliana. Uh, well, uh, I think that uh, discussion uh, pretty much uh, covered what uh, what I wanted to talk about in uh, my part of uh, presentation. Um, maybe I would just like to uh, to return to uh, Professor Aparat's question uh, about uh, how students react. Uh, so um, last year, uh, I started teaching a course called uh, Critical Information Literacy at the undergraduate uh, studies. Um, and uh, students were uh, like very uh, amazed and interested in the topics that uh, we, we covered. And that is what I noticed, that they are really... Um, like uh, hungry uh, for uh, for knowledge about uh, these uh, topics, and a lot of them were interested in writing their uh, theses about uh, these topics. So, um, I think that uh, that we need uh, more uh, of. Uh, of these uh, these subjects inc incorporated in our uh, list curricula, and maybe uh, that that is uh, my my key point. Absolutely. Thank you. Further closing remarks? Yeah. Well, may I just say just a brief one, one sentence not to take up too much time. I think the most important, something that I will take from the conference as for now is actually to, to see how to think about how complex this is and how uh, uh, very uh, how this is a process, not a one time solution or what not a simple solution to the issue of lack of media and information literacy in the society, especially in the Western Balkans. So it's a process. It uh, includes a lot of stakeholders, a lot of factors, a lot of um, different directions and dimensions that we can develop in the, develop in the future. And, and to me, the most important thing is to continue discussing it and thinking about it in terms of um, new ways of thinking rather than new, rather the, the, the methods themselves. Okay. It seems that we should Very move good. on, Emia, yes. and yes. we get to a little mini, a little break, and at 1.30 we shall start. Yes, Thomas, thank you very much for moderating this session. Thank you for wonderful, wonderful panelists to make such a huge contribution. And uh, we'll have uh, two minutes uh, break, and then we'll continue a schedule with the next uh, part of the, this session. Thank you all.
Dear all, uh, welcome to the world and hello to the world. Uh, greetings uh, to you all with the uh, patience and um, this uh, spirit of uh, trying to, to, to support development of this academic cooperation and, and excellence. Uh, with the continuation of our session, we have the, uh, as planned, uh, we will continue uh, with the first showing the video and then short uh, discussion with the panelists. Uh, and after we continue, after we finish uh, three videos to three presentations, we'll have a bit more uh, elaborate discussion among others. So um, to start with, we have our professor Anna Milic from University of Belgrade, with this uh, very interesting topic on media information literacy needs of the high schools and primary schools uh, teachers. So enjoy the video presentation and short discussion with uh, Professor Anna Milevic. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Anna Milojevic and I will be presenting on behalf of uh, my colleagues Aleksandra Ugrinić and Kristina Milić. Uh, we are from the University of Belgrade Faculty of Political Science and I will be talking about media and information literacy needs of the high schools and primary schools teachers. Um, this is a part of the media and information literacy in the Southeast Europe in function of development of critical thinking and public advocacy of the youth uh, within the regional program and dialogue for the future. So uh, let me briefly begin uh, by outlining what uh, we want to contribute. Uh, well, um, as we all know, we live in uh, uh, very turbulent times and there is a lot of talk about generational differences in media literacy, uh, meaning that, that there are young generations who are used to, to new ways of learning or acquiring knowledge. Uh, they multitask, so they do a lot of parallel tax, tasks at the same time. Uh, they are uh, used to visual expression and using visual modes of communication. Uh, they are used to nonlinear thinking and they acquire knowledge through collective actions and through collab collaborations in online world. Uh, so they also learn through trial and error and this is what the games are based on and they uh, use a lot of games in their uh, non-formal base of uh, learning. So there are also other generations which need to acquire a lot of skills and new knowledge to be more proficient users of online environment. And those are also uh, teachers who teach in uh, schools. Um, and uh, they were pushed by COVID-19 pandemic to go online in, and to, to engage in online teaching. Uh, and many of them were not prepared for that as well as many schools and all the educational system was not prepared for that. So we wanted to learn from that experience and to map out uh, the challenges teachers face and their needs in terms of new knowledge and skills they need to acquire to be more proficient teachers in online environment. Uh, so we have asked uh, our uh, you know, participants of the workshop uh, with teachers we have organized within the project I have mentioned at the beginning, and we asked them open-ended questions because we didn't have a lot of uh, participants, we wanted to learn from them and to give them opportunity to uh, tell us uh, in their own words uh, what were the challenges they face and what new skills they need uh, to be more proficient um, teachers in online environments. So, so let me briefly uh, describe uh, our respondents. They are mostly female and they are between 40 and 50 years uh, old, uh, uh, even half of them. Uh, also, they have a lot of work experience between 10 and 20 years in teaching, and they come from uh, schools from uh, uh, rural and urban parts of our country. Uh, also, they uh, uh, also teach 
uh, first to fourth grade uh, and teach uh, one subject, meaning they teach biology or geography. So they teach in high schools uh, or uh, they teach in uh, primary schools from uh, fifth to eighth grade. And we have also a gymnasium type of high schools and a vocational uh, schools in our sample. So what are the challenges uh, teachers face when teaching online? First of all, uh, they know their students have a lot of problems with access, meaning they don't all have access to internet. Uh, so they don't always have their own computer or tablet. And sometimes they have to share uh, with other family members. Also, many students just use mobile phones, and this is not always the best choice uh, for uh, online learning platforms. Also, uh, they know their students are not well motivated and they feel that they should motivate students more uh, and they feel that students are not um, independent in learning. So they need a lot of supervision and this is burden for their parents. And also they feel that home is not the very best environment for learning uh, because uh, usually children at home uh, just relax and rest and they uh, don't um, use this environment for, for learning. They also face problem of evaluation, so they don't know how to monitor the work of students and how to grade objectively their work. Uh, there are also some organizational problems in terms of um, that they, they mentioned they are not able to choose the online platform they would prefer to use. Uh, there are some subjects that are not good for teaching online, such as music. Uh, they have uh, much more working hours and very long screen time. Uh, and also they face some kind of communicational problems uh, because they feel the uh, classroom is different uh, than online class classroom because uh, in face-to-face -face communication uh, they use nonverbal cues from students to know when they are tired uh, and uh, they can change it in the dynamics of teaching in such a way and it is different in online communication. Also, they would like to know how uh, to manage information better and to um, um, easy, more easily know what is too much for students, what to send them uh, and uh, how to uh, give them assignments. In that respect, they would also prefer to be trained in any kind of method or on application or online tool which could be useful for uh, video editing, making educational movies, making animations, uh, for uh, using games for teaching, uh, quiz in teaching. Uh, they would love to become more proficient in streaming classes. Uh, to know how to make tests, how to make assignments that would engage their students more uh, in the process of learning. And uh, they feel that they should develop more uh, social skills for uh, communication in online meetings platforms and uh, all kinds of learning platforms. Uh, also teachers, find that the different aspects of media and information literacy uh, would be useful for their future work. Uh, so they have outlined um, developing communication skills and presenting skills would be very useful uh, uh, to get to know how to create their own media, like online journals, how to produce movies, how to use virtual reality, uh, how to work with uh, digital test textbooks. Uh, also, uh, managing information uh, like fact checking, um, recognizing trustworthy uh, online sources of information, uh, selecting information both for their students and uh, uh, to getting to know to select information online better, how to recognize propaganda and the basic ethics and ethical behavior in online in environment. Altogether, they would like to obtain those knowledge in um, a precise way. Uh, so to give um, practical instruction and practical learning material. Altogether, let me uh, um, briefly outline few conclusions. Uh, 
which can be made uh, be, uh, based on the answers of teachers. Uh, first of all, um, te uh, teachers should be, think uh, should be thinking more about themselves as facilitators of uh, learning and not only uh, the, uh, in a traditional sense being uh, those who transfer knowledge in a linear way. In that respect, uh, all aspects of media and information literacy and transmedia uh, literacy would be very useful to them because they all talk about access and the use of platforms and applications. Uh, they talk about critically understanding media and being able to actively create media content and to be able, uh, more able to ethically participate in online environments. All in all, in all uh, if we want to outline some uh, guidance on uh, what to give to teachers in uh, future education uh, is uh, how to create media content, uh, how to use games in education as a way to motivate their students and how to rely more on a visual and a visual ways of expressing uh, knowledge because uh, generations of students are born and raised in uh, visual cultures. And um, this is the, the literature we have used uh, to, for making this presentation. And thank you for your attention. Uh, we will be happy to answer all of your questions in the Dear Anna, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful presentation um, and uh, very interesting set of uh, data you have provided to us. Um, uh, in this, this line, uh, as we ask other other uh, presenters, do you want to like uh, uh, give a one or two sentences of of a teaser as uh, what would be the, the key uh, points to to take from uh, from your research and work um, in, in this slide before we continue, and also we'll have uh, at least I have at least <laughs> several questions for the discussion, which probably going to be interesting. So Anna, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, probably what we have missed to mention is in this presentation is because we have mostly female respondents, just to say that most of our teachers are female and um, this is somehow become a female line of work. So this is probably the change in a modern times. And um, the second, yeah, uh, what we have learned from um, um, this research project, uh, working with teachers on uh, uh, their media and information literacy skills is uh, that they really need more knowledge about how to deal with information. So I think this um, um, focusing more on information literacy is also a good focus in future, uh, offering future training to teachers. Uh, and uh, also, uh, um, I mean, we all know that educational systems are a bit rigid and slow in adapting. Uh, so um, this kind of thinking about the changing of role of the teachers is probably what has to uh, uh, be, um, takes time. And I think uh, all the educational system has to adapt to this new role of teachers in education and all in all um, I would say that all kind of media and information literacy in this change and transfer to a new role uh, is uh, I should say like a basic uh, knowledge that they should obtain or we should be working with them to improve so yeah this is just few remarks and I would be happy to answer all the questions. Uh Thank you, Anna. We have uh, a few more minutes, but I, I wanted to just uh, make a connection with what we have learned, uh, heard in, uh, uh, from our keynote speaker, Petri Andrich, and also discussion afterwards on um, empowering the, the, the teachers and I would say also librarians as mm -hmm. in our model of uh, uh, hi hybrid model of international of media information literacy, we see those, this theme as integral part of kind of new wave 
in, in education reform uh, in line with digital transformation. Uh, how do you see in, in having in, in mind situation, well, primarily in Serbia, but I would like to hear others also uh, with their respective countries. How do you see, what are the possible steps uh, to, to make to have uh, uh, this profession kind of be more valued, to uh, 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 kind of be more appreciated. As also Petra mentioned, there, this is the, the, the cycle. It, it, it needs to be a long-term strategic goal because uh, if you don't raise the, the teacher and librarian on, on, on top of the food chain in education system, you will have, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, fewer students and with less capacity students uh, interested in this teacher profession and librarian profession uh, in the future. Uh, our goal is to kind of you know, raise them above, to, to kind of give them opportunity to uh, be the leaders of, of the new, new wave of upper mediation, as we are often uh, saying, and uh, you rightly mentioned the, the facilitators of learning, you know, uh, since the, the, the gatekeepers, the systematic filters that we used to have in, let's call it analog time, you know, uh, that were undisputable champions of saying how it should be done and developed. Now in digital age, we definitely have the new, new shift in paradigm. So uh, just in a few words, and then later we can discuss with other countries as well. Uh, what do you think that are the, the main, let's say, first steps towards this, this uh, process, hopefully to reaching the desired goals? Uh, yeah, I, I think that what our experience from this project shows, and we were also uh, targeting librarians as our primary focus group in this project, uh, is, uh, or, or what we can see uh, uh, is that um, there's a good potential from a collaboration between librarians or including librarians more into the educational process. Uh, and um, as uh, our introductory uh, uh, speeches to this conference told us or said or underlined, is this um, teaching and learning are nowadays becoming more and more collaborative process. And we, we all have in schools already uh, really important uh, groups which are now not interlinked in the education process. And I think if we um, get to uh, teachers collaborate more with librarians and use them as uh, valuable sources in education process in terms of helping them, for example, select uh, relevant information for students to be sent or uh, establish more close link between library and uh, teaching staff in terms of what are all, all other sources available to them as uh, learning sources for kids, then it would become a more like a collaborative process, which is nowadays, I think, still not very well developed in schools. So this is some things that we uh, should think about how to engage more librarians as resource for teachers and to um, use their knowledge and skills in the process of uh, online teaching. So for now, I think those two are somehow not closely connected in the process of teaching. And I think librarians are excellent resource because of their advanced knowledge of information literacy, uh, which is not a well established resource of knowledge for teachers or for children in the education process. So uh, this is what we have, uh, I, I guess, aimed at with this project to uh, introduce them as a valuable resource, which is not used enough in our teaching process, especially not in our educational systems. Thank you, Anna. Uh... Uh, we, we also have recognized at the beginning of, of, of our uh, projects long, long, long time ago, the library and librarians as, as already incorporated element into system, which is definitely, let's call it mildly underused, you know, so uh, there's a lot of potential and this is something that we are all working on this. Uh, I have the, the, the obligation and also the 
um, this uh, uh, um, satisfaction to, to just underline that uh, Faculty of Political Sciences, University of Sarajevo is working together on the regional project that Sinisha was mentioning in the beginning with the uh, University uh, of Belgrade Faculty of Political Science where uh, Professor Anna Miller, which is uh, coordinator of uh, their part for Serbia. And now I have the uh, pleasure to announce uh, second coordinator of our regional project from Montenegro, Professor Natasha Ružić, who will be joining us from uh, Podgorica. And uh, uh, we'll start with a short video introduction, actually a short presentation uh, video presentation and then later with uh, some discussion. Thank you. Hello, my name is Natasha Ružić and I will share some ideas with you about media illiterate society in Montenegro. As we already all know, the basic precondition for building a democratic society is media literate citizens who are aware of their rights. Without this key element, the talks of politicians about democracy is just a classic populism aimed at scoring political points. It's easier to manipulate a media illiterate society because they do not ask questions. They do not ask themselves uh, why someone sends them a message at a certain moment and what values are promoted by the mentioned message. Of course, media literacy is not just the ability of critical analysis of messages or fact checking skills. But what is crucial is that the media literate person will demand that his her right to free access of information be respected and such person can't be a victim a victim of some kind of stereotypes because she is willing he or she is willing to live in multi-confessional and multinational uh, society the direct link between media literacy and democratic process uh, is reflected among other in the activism of citizens who would take a role of fifth power. But the main question is, do countries with hybrid regimes new need media literate uh, society or media literate citizens? Uh, the answer will be obvious if we analyze government policy about media and information literacy, which is really different from state to state. Talks of the necessity of media literacy of the society in Montenegro began in 2007 when general high school students were offered media literacy as an elective subject. Has anything been changed in the past 13 years? Not so much. Of course, there is no doubt that the term is used much more often in public, that the international organization and non-governmental sector are more active on these issues than the state institutions. For example, the international organization UNICEF with the Agency for Electronic Media played a key role in making citizens aware of the messages sent to them by the media through the campaign, let's choose what we watch. The non-governmental sector also deals with media literacy of journalists, primary and secondary school uh, teachers. But for now, according to Media Literacy Index, we cannot speak about some results in Montenegro. In 2019, the Open Society Foundation ranked Montenegro on 31st place uh, out of 35 countries in total. Such poor results can be explained uh, by the methodology itself, which is based on the results of PISA test and also on the Press Freedom Index, according to the reporters without uh, borders. Um, can we expect um, that Montenegro as a country that ranks on 105th place 
of 180 countries, according to the Reporters Without Borders, can we expect that Montenegro will be highly positioned? Can we expect better results on the PISA test in country that has so many problems in the education system? Of course not. The mentioned index uh, reflects the situation in the society and problems it is facing. Continuous reforms in the education system that were aimed at more accessible and free education have not improved the situation in this area. If we analyze project uh, the Learn at Home, um, which is actually, it was the lectures of primary uh, school teachers uh, hold on uh, public service media, we can see the whole all problems in the education uh, system and uh, that this program shows to us uh, and confirm to us that the best ones do not choose to be teachers because the average salary is the lowest in Europe. Noam Chomsky pointed out that the easiest way to manage society is to promote ignorance. So he wrote that uh, the quality of education of the lower social classes should be as low or as below average as possible so that the gap between uh, the education of the upper and lower classes be large. And this situation we have in Montenegro. On the one hand, education has become more accessible, not only in financial terms, but also in the way of studying, because today it is much easier to study than in the past. If we watch all this problem, we can say that in such condition, the critical public is represented by the non-governmental sector, which is not always motivated by the public interest, but by the projects through which they carry out certain activities. Citizens are passive because they are faced with existential problems. In a country with uh, over 620,000 inhabitants, which has over 44,000 unemployed, unemployed people, can we really expect citizens to think about media literacy or activism? I think that uh, the question on this answer we can find on Maslow's theory of motivations, according to which a person must first satisfy his her physiological need, as we can see, uh, then the need for security uh, or safety needs, then, need, then means also uh, in terms of employment. And at the very top of pyramid, we see self-actualization. That means that one person will not think of higher goals without satisfying basic needs. So all in all, um, we can see the several problem, key problems, um, which are actually low level of uh, quality of education and that all actually affect on the level of information of citizen. So we can say that Montenegro is in some kind of circle from which is very difficult to get out and only political will can change uh, this situation. Thank you for your attention. Uh, here we are. Welcome back. Uh, thank you, uh, Natasha, for your uh, video presentation and for joining us here uh, live in the virtual space. Uh, we had um, an expert meeting yesterday, uh, the, the all partners in the group, and uh, uh, we started with uh, complaining uh, how in, in, uh, we should have been 
together it, in Podgor, it's discussing the, uh, the academic cooperation and excellence. But uh, we are still thankful that we have uh, this option in platforms that we can still get together and communicate with, uh, with each other and uh, exchanging ideas. So, uh, not to suggest an uh, invitation for you as the others, uh, uh, like a, a teaser a sentence or two uh, to, to uh, spark up the, the discussion and maybe uh, questions from the others. Natasha, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Emil, and thank you for the invitation. I'm very glad that I had this opportunity to participate in this so interesting conference. Um, maybe I would like to say something more information about the factors that this actually contributes to the media illiteracy of citizens in Montenegro. I forgot to tell uh, one more factor, which is really important, that is the political uh, force of political culture in Montenegro. Uh, that means that um, uh, actually in Montenegro we have subject participatory form of culture, uh, which means actually that the people or citizens uh, don't believe that they will uh, make uh, some changes in their life if they are involving in political process and that uh, this results we get uh, when we see the researchers for when we see the research from 2015 for example one research in 2015 shows that montenegrin citizens are really weak democrats and uh, for example on the sample of uh, over 800 uh, people um, interestingly, interesting is uh, uh, results that over 21% of respondents said that they would never sign a petition, uh, 25 would never participate in legally approved demonstration, and over 58% would never join uh, to unofficial strikes. So. Um, this, this uh, results also uh, confirm that we have a subject part participatory form of political culture in Montenegro. The uh, oldest generation, they have their own habits and attitude and the way of thinking, which is really difficult to change. And the younger generation prefer uh, uh, to leave the country and not to change uh, something. For example, in Montenegro, we have a really um, big problem with uh, brain drain. Um, and I think when we become the member of the EU that, EU that we will have uh, this problem even um, much higher uh, than we have now because we don't know how many people, how many young people leave uh, the country. That's the reason why I said that it's so important uh, political will to change something and I think economic problems is also so important uh, and it influence on the um, media literacy, media literate society, uh, because if we, for example, um, compare uh, the media literacy index and the uh, World Happiness Report for this year, we will see that Finland is on the first place. And when people are satisfied with the quality of their lives, when they don't think um, how they will uh, survive and how they will pay the bills, of course, uh, they will think about their own rights and they will think about media literacy. Because in Montenegro, we have uh, our average salary is uh, over 500 euros, but most of the people, uh, they, are li they work on the black market. Some of them are living on mm -hmm. 300 euros and so on and so on. So I think this is a, a really uh, huge uh, problem, which is um, on some way, um, we can say, contribute to the media illiteracy of citizens. Thank you, Natasha, very much. You have uh, raised a lot of uh, very important questions. Uh, unfortunately, uh, on global level, uh, there is no uh, meaningful uh, solution yet, at least not uh, feasible, sustainable and long term uh, uh, kind of uh, manageable uh, to, to raise this question. I mean, 
uh, we are all here in the region of, uh, let's call it Southeast Europe for this purpose, uh, very self-critical. And uh, 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 one would think that would lead to critical thinking, but it's not the case. Anyway, uh, uh, we would think to believe that, and that's probably one of the information warfare results, uh, uh, the worst uh, of the worst uh, of the worst children. <laughs> That's why we have so much, uh, so many young people, as you have mentioned, uh, uh, a brain drain uh, phenomenon going to the other countries. But if you uh, take take in consideration the uh, actual fact, the research, the indicators, all the c countries in the region are not that bad comparing to other close to hundred countries in the world. Um, but the, uh, the, the concept of political communications has definitely changed uh, in, in last, let's say, decade, uh, uh, dramatically. Um, we have, uh, for in, in 2016, I have been uh, doing some research on the phenomenon of Trump and his Twitter account, you know, how he uh, single-handedly circumnavigate the mainstream media of the United States of America as the most powerful media uh, force in the world with his Twitter account. I mean, and now the other day I was listening and, and I was really puzzled. I didn't know that it reached that level of importance that Twitter has announced that once there is of, uh, election results are official, it will uh, uh, deliver actually hand over the presidential account on Twitter to the new president. It's like, well, you have this off-world, physical world inauguration, but the most important one is the Twitter inauguration, actually, because this is where the new politics is shaped. This is where new uh, public opinion is shaped. This is where uh, elected officials are now directly communicating uh, with individuals who are on the other side, as we all uh, uh, underlined, uh, let's say, in lack, in, 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 in deferred, uh, lack of uh, media information literacy, um, uh, skills uh, and competencies to understand what's going on in this very over news and other informed world. So um, thank you, thank you so much for this. Uh, I, uh, let me see in the chat, do you have uh, other panelists? Uh, Larissa is thanking Anna and Natasha, and Larissa is the next panelist. I'm still there to, to uh, uh, invite uh, her. Do we have other questions? No. Uh, well, the, the, the main examples of how uh, this new, new shift in paradigm, especially in political communication, um, is uh, ecranized through this, uh, you know, few wonderful documentaries such as the the Great Hack on Netflix and also Social, social Dilemma, uh, where the Cambridge Analytica is is uh, really kind of uh, explain on, on, in plain words what happened, where a private data is being used for the uh, political purposes and actually manipulating. The, the, the whole you know, uh, groups of people for the, 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 the outcome that usually we call still democratic, but uh, underneath you can see there is still a lot of uh, challenges. Uh, while we are uh, ready with our agenda, uh, thank you Natasha once again, and uh, uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll have time to discuss all, and I would like invite all panelists to get involved in the in the uh, with the very fruitful discussion later on. Uh, so now we have the uh, honor to uh, well invite the video of Larisa Kasumagic Kafecic, our dear professor from University of Sarajevo, and also a member of our uh, team uh, uh, trying to work uh, all these elements of a hybrid model of multi-stage integration of media information literacy in, in our society uh, with the topic critical pedagogy and competencies for democratic culture uh, in uh, teacher education programs. So well, let's listen to and hear, well, look at the video and 
we'll have Larissa for the aftermath uh, discussion and questions. My name is Larissa Kasumagic Kafedic, and I'm an associate professor uh, of the Faculty of Philosophy Department of uh, Teacher Education, uh, English Language uh, and Culture Program. Uh, so, uh, my role today is uh, to discuss the topic on critical pedagogy and competencies for democratic culture in teacher education programs for the Conference on Information Literacy and Democracy uh, that is organized by the Faculty of Political Science. Uh, since my position, uh, since my position at the Department uh, of English at the Faculty of Philosophy has been to be actively involved in the teacher training uh, and professional development of teachers, I will be discussing this topic uh, from the perspective of my uh, experience in developing and designing uh, and reshaping uh, teacher education program at my department. So some of the questions that I have. Uh, posted here for us to discuss uh, would be related to uh, critically evaluating uh, what kind of education can contribute to a society in which all members are able to realize their human and participatory potential to live together as equals under commonly created condition. So these are some larger frameworks uh, for us to uh, look at and to understand uh, before we get to the practicalities and specific strategies that we can incorporate into the actual uh, classroom application or curriculum design. Other questions that I posted here are related to the aspect of the institutional support. So what should institutional structures and learning processes which provide learners with experiences of living democracy look like? How can we help young people to become responsible and caring citizens with respect for life and human dignity and acting to protect the environment, our planet and our health? So how can we incorporate these kinds of values into the teacher uh, education programs, into the educational reforms in order to emphasize the values aspect of education? Which conditions are necessary in order to make education a sphere where living democracies prepare, created, and practiced, so that we do not just only preach about the democratic values, but we also create conditions in which uh, we apply the principles of democracy in the strategies we use, in the decisions uh, that have been formed and rooted in uh, the principles of democracy and mutual understanding and dialogue. So these are some of the questions that I would like us to focus as we uh, develop uh, critical analysis and discussions in, in today's uh, conference. Uh, the key role of education for system, sustainable democracy and sustainable democratic society uh, is bringing in uh, another reminder of the importance of plurality, that is both the condition of human life, but also the condition through which humans achieve meaning. So this is an important value to be also revisited when we are discussing uh, educational reforms and we are attempting to incorporate these specific strategies uh, that we can apply in everyday teaching, in teaching practice, but also in the proposals of action uh, for uh, teacher training programs. We also need to look at the society's uh, investment uh, in its future, in educational reforms, in teacher development, professional development of teachers. We need to think whether society, whether educational policy, policies support its members uh, with necessary and needed knowledge, skills and attitudes in order to take part in social, political and economic development. So basically here, what is really important to be considered from a larger uh, perspective is what is the systematic, systemic, and structural support in terms of uh, having and recognizing and acknowledging the important uh, bottom-up support that is needed for a lot of these reforms and a lot of these practices uh, to actually live in the classroom, within the classroom setting. Uh, Another uh, important aspect is what is the role of younger generations, whether we perceive them as educational policy makers or as uh, teacher educators, as uh, professionals in, within the field of education, 
whether we perceive young people and future younger generations as the agents of change. Because being a member of a society would mean becoming an agent of development and change and uh, not just someone who would passively be uh, given and presented with the circumstances and through some educational practices and teaching practices, uh, we have the situations where actually we are aiming for and we are striving for teaching children to accept or teaching young generations to accept the situation as it is. So whether we have even at the level of the perception of what matters in education, whether we have uh, these kinds of values uh, recognized and acknowledged at the level of the teacher cognition in order for us uh, to be able also to incorporate them into some more meaningful uh, proposals for educational change. Uh, this is important because educational frameworks can be regarded as types of models of the society that they are intending to create, which means that we need to have a certain kind of attitude and a consensus at the level of a society, at the, at the level of the educational policy, uh, or what kind of society we wish to create uh, in order for us to come with uh, the proposal of the educational framework that is then intended to be incorporated into the practices. Uh, looking at the uh, educational initiatives uh, that are nurturing and that are based and rooted and framed within the values of uh, democratic uh, living, uh, there are a, a couple of educational initiatives, um, a lot of them overlap uh, with one another, and they all have, uh, within the nature of the learning goals, they all have these values of democratic uh, citizenship, democratic uh, living, human rights, civic participation. So we are speaking of peace education as, as a particular educational framework or initiative, then education for mutual understanding, intercultural or multicultural education, human rights education, uh, health uh, education, citizenship education for sustainable development, humanitarian education or values education also. So they all have within their frameworks uh, the emphasis of the values uh, that are uh, striving to achieve a more democratic and more peaceful and more just, uh, equitable and equal uh, society uh, as a target goal uh, that is framing their uh, proposals of uh, actions. Um, looking at uh, looking at the transversal attitude, skills and knowledge for sustainable democratic societies, we can also see the overlap uh, between democratic citizenship, intercultural communication, media literacy, understanding of history, acceptance of diversity, human rights uh, that are equally contributing uh, with the integration of not just the level of knowledge that is important and recognized, as the foundation of these kinds of competencies, but also incorporating uh, what is um, in a way called cycle of experiential learning, uh, the elements of application of knowledge, skills, developing certain skills, attitudes, but also incorporating and emphasizing the role of values. So being with these kinds of um, with these uh, kinds of competencies, or how to to know how to live and how to bring in the values component and dimension into, into uh, these types of learning. Uh, in, order, uh, in order for us to know how to uh, frame uh, these types of learning uh, proposals and frameworks into uh, professional setting education, into teacher education programs, professional development of teachers, we need to think uh, of the pedagogy that is important to respond to this kind of challenge. So we are advocating here for a more active pedagogy that is needed uh, in the teacher education programs in professional development for teachers uh, that is uh, based on participative discussions uh, rooted in uh, the frameworks of critical pedagogy, values education, where the empowerment uh, is really related to democratic values and attitudes that, that can hardly be learned within undemocratic educational structures, which means that active and engaged citizens need to have a basis of encouraging and positive experience, which schools can provide for. And these experiences of negotiation and debate 
citizens that are taking part in decision-making processes that affect their own situation, their own communities, their own lives, would be an important lesson that could shape the attitude of future citizens that we are striving to uh, develop uh, as a part of our educational um, reforms. So it is very important to think in terms of what is the role of the school governance, what is the structure within the school settings, what is the classroom management, what kinds of strategies, uh, methods, approaches we use as teachers, because they are never uh, politically neutral. Even speaking of uh, uh, when we think of the teacher-dominated or teacher-centered teacher approaches, uh, we know what the ultimate goal would be. So we are never encouraging students to critically evaluate, to uh, critically analyze, to critically think and debate certain issues, to bring in the language of arguments and evidence. Uh, so it would be really important to think in terms of the strategies and the decisions we make in a classroom uh, in connection to the methods we apply, uh, whether they're more democratic or uh, they are in line with some other practices in teaching. Uh, what are the principles of teaching and learning that we value, that we perceive as teachers are important? Uh, which is why uh, we need to create schools that need to be places where young people can experience actually the live democracy. Uh, how do we do that? Uh, by a combination uh, and by a combination of cognitive, effective, and pragmatic dimensions of learning. So thinking in terms of uh, knowledge as the basis of the competencies, but also knowing how to deal with the effective domains of learning, knowing how to bring in and work and cope with the emotional aspects, with the effective aspects of learning, and also uh, pragmatic dimensions of learning. Uh, so learning to do, applying these kinds of uh, experiences and these kinds of competences in everyday life. Uh, when we look at the three courses of action in intercultural education that were proposed by Council of Europe, uh, we can also see different frameworks uh, of, that are related to learning from differences, learning from controversies and conflicts, and inter interactive principles of learning that are always emphasizing the focus on differences, openness, openness towards what is different or what is unknown. <clears throat> uh, then uh, they are all emphasizing this component of learning to live together, uh, bringing in the social and educational goals and values of inclusion, solidarity, interaction, community building, uh, shared responsibility, participatory management in the classroom, global awareness that can only be achieved by applying and living <clears throat> these principles of democratic uh, learning. Uh, how do we do that uh, at the teacher education program? I can speak uh, from my own experience. So in the course that is uh, focusing on intercultural learning, uh, I have tried to uh, develop <clears throat> something which is an intercultural framework for teacher education, where we are bringing in the cultural uh, aspect of language pedagogy, language and culture pedagogy, that is emphasizing the importance of developing intercultural competences of uh, prospective teachers of languages, that is built on certain attitudes, skills, uh, knowledge. Uh, so attitude, skills, and knowledge framed around critical cultural awareness that is built on linguistic competence and is very important for teachers to develop as a part of their teacher training program in order to incorporate these kinds of skills and attitudes and values uh, in the work <clears throat> with their students. Some more specific examples from my own uh, teaching context. So the proposal by Council of Europe, uh, which is a competence uh, framework for democratic culture and learning uh, how to live together as equals in culturally diverse democratic societies. Uh, is uh, the framework uh, also that I have been using uh, that is clearly defining the competencies uh, for democratic culture, which is a companion uh, book of uh, three volumes um, that I'm using with my students as a part of this intercultural education course, where I'm uh, providing my students with a particular framework where they can see the connection between what is already in the curriculum proposed by uh, our educational policies and ministries of education 
and they can connect the contents and uh, the themes that are already framed and are proposed by our ministries of education. But I'm uh, encouraging them to uh, look at certain aspects of the curriculum to be framed within the framework of uh, teaching for intercultural sensitivity and uh, democratic uh, competencies, democratic learning, in order for them to become more innovative and in order for them to uh, connect other aspects of learning into this particular framework. So this is a, a part of their teaching practice. Uh, it's very much reflective. Uh, it invites for a lot of uh, critical analysis, action research, self-assessment, self-evaluation, and is uh, providing uh, the room for my students to see the cross-curricular connection of different themes within uh, foreign language uh, and culture curriculum. So they're thinking in terms of what are the topics of personal development, cultural identity, sustainable development, technological advancement, active citizenship, environmental protection that are already there incorporated into the curriculum, but now they need to think in terms of connecting them to the competencies of intercultural sensitivity and um, democratic culture, learning for democratic culture, in order to propose uh, lesson plans and action plans uh, <clears throat> that would bring in this innovative uh, and more democratic voice into their own teaching. Other tools uh, that I have been using uh, are related to the role of critical reflection. So there are uh, documents proposed also by Council of Europe that I've incorporated into my uh, teaching course uh, in teacher education program, uh, like the European Portfolio for Student Teachers of Languages, uh, that is uh, based uh, on self-assessment with different descriptors and parameters that the teachers can use to critically reevaluate and to be taught and given tools for critical analysis and self-assessment and self-reflection in order for teachers to become uh, critical agents of change, but also reflective practitioners, uh, which is yet another important skill for teachers uh, in 21st century to have the tools and skills of using action research and um, research tools, classroom research tools, in order to improve their practices on a daily basis. Uh, are we prepared for such a change of perspectives in education? Uh, we are considering uh, important and valuable uh, practices of pre-service and in-service teacher education program. And we need to think of how to improve uh, these frameworks, how to uh, facilitate discussions that are based on dialogues, so using dialogic approaches of negotiations and uh, revisiting and re-evaluating different positions and values, uh, different positions of power, so bringing in different actors within the educational setting to discuss and to negotiate what kinds of values and what kinds of reforms we are proposing uh, would be inevitable and uh, uh, very much important in terms of also bringing in a new uh, change of the paradigm, educational paradigm that is so much needed uh, in the world that we live in and in, within the educational setting uh, where we are living and working. Uh, we also have to redefine the teacher's reference points and their professional roles. So we need to engage effectively our teachers. We need to acknowledge and value uh, their important wisdom and th their important uh, experience that they have uh, developed as a part of, of their teaching practice. We need to invite them to um, together with us, critically reflect and reevaluate social and moral responsibilities of teachers for contributing to democracies in our communities. And we need to think how these changes could be implemented. So what is the management of change within the educational framework? So how do we go around the changes in education? Because we know from research uh, that teachers uh, or any other profession, we tend to resist changes. So we need to think in terms of uh, creating safe spaces for teachers to critically reevaluate their uh, teaching practice and also uh, to be open uh, towards some new and innovative um, um, strategies and proposals of action that could become uh, the realities of their classroom living. And uh, finally, uh, what we would like to achieve by uh, in, instilling the elements of uh, democracy education in teacher training programs and intercultural sensitivity in teacher education programs is we like to see education 
that is a process of living by itself and not just a preparation for future living. So we are striving to create these kinds of environments uh, in our classroom settings, in our school communities, in our educational policies that would strive for these kinds of values. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, everybody. We are pleased to present some of our... Dear Larissa, uh, thank you so much for this uh, uh, excellent uh, video presentation. Uh, it was a bit longer than uh, we kind of envisaged for each participant to have, but uh, the content you have put in just that definitely deserved the whole, you know, <laughs> slot for the for the uh, presentation. And uh, uh, so we'll use more time for the discussion. We have a next half hour to exchange. Uh, opinions uh, among participants. So we kindly ask also Natasha and uh, 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 Anna also to uh, in, get involved with the video uh, camera if possible. Uh, uh, Larissa, would you also, uh, as, as other participants, give us one or two sentences for something that uh, now that you have heard others, other speakers uh, and their, their presentations, uh, maybe to put in the context or add something else. Thank you very much, Amir. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, I wasn't sure if you would allow me for some additional comments, given that I uh, have used up such a long stretch of time for my contribution and my apologies for a long uh, presentation. Uh, which is yet another skill of a teacher I'm still working on. So uh, being very selective in terms of choosing what to present and uh, how to frame that within the constraint of time. So thank you very much uh, also for inviting me to be a part of this conference. Uh, it's been a long day. Uh, I was curious also uh, whether anyone had uh, any lunch today or any refreshments. We had a short break in the morning for coffee. <laughs> But I was just thinking uh, whether anyone had uh, nibbled on anything or this was just uh, uh, something to endure until the end of the conference. But since this is a very engaging discussion and very interesting discussion, I think uh, we will go through uh, with some interesting comments to contribute with. Let me just briefly connect to some of the things from the early morning, uh, just briefly. So I would like to bring in uh, for the discussion the elements that we have heard this morning uh, on uh, key aspects in uh, professional teacher development and learning, uh, thinking through uh, incorporating the elements of learning, uh, thinking, feeling, and acting within the educational setting. Uh, then also using educational strategies of coping. So this was something that I had mentioned also in my presentation, so thinking in terms of what are the curricular uh, reforms, what are the pedagogical reforms, what are the assessment tools reforms uh, in terms of bringing in some of these changes uh, that uh, inevitably are inseparable from the change of the mindset, because this was another key term that we use, uh, that we use and that we have heard since the morning. Uh, I would also like us to focus, uh, and this was something that I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the frameworks of ideals in education. So when I discuss uh, the educational frameworks and what kind of society we need to create, uh, I was really thinking in terms of educational ideals. And this morning, we also have heard about the importance of bringing back the role of humanities. So uh, standing at the, at the gate uh, as gatekeepers, I would say, uh, to really revolutionize and really to bring in the voice and the perspective of the humanities and the role of arts and uh, poetry, if you want, uh, storytelling, culture uh, within professional development of teachers, but also within, uh, uh, within the curricular reforms would be something that I would like us also uh, to discuss. So ideals in education with particular focus on humanities, because they also bring in this very important perspective of imagination, 
imaginative thinking, being more flexible and being able to take a position of someone else from a, you know, taking and, and seeing the position of a, of a different point of view. I think this is a kind of flexibility that we can instill and that we can incorporate through humanities because they are aiming for educating the whole child, if you want. And within the teacher education, they're really striving to incorporate uh, the head, but also the heart and the mind and the soul of the teachers. Uh, and we also have heard from our panelists uh, this afternoon that are in the same session as I am, uh, the term of the empowering teachers. So how do we incorporate and how do we change the role of the teacher so that the teacher is not just the controller in the classroom that uh, transmit the knowledge and information, but how do we, uh, how do we encourage teachers to wear different hats in the classroom? And this would inevitably also involve uh, the changes of the paradigms in teacher education. Uh, I think the reason for that in our educational setting is uh, that we have been uh, traditionally focused on the subject knowledge as a key competence that we estimated and that we have evaluated as a key important uh, value in uh, teacher preparation and teacher development. There were other elements, but I will wait also for the others to come in with questions and so we can develop uh, the discussion further on. Thank you. Thank you, Larissa. I have a question for you uh, in regard to your uh, uh, 15 years at least experience working as a, uh, in teacher education and intercultural peace uh, pedagogy, especially critical pedagogy. How do you see uh, 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 how, how could we uh, work with, with teachers to, to uh, get them out of their comfort zones when it comes to, to transformative pedagogies? Uh, okay, so this is a very important question. So how do we, uh, and I think I mentioned briefly in my presentation, I framed it as how do we create safe spaces and brave spaces for teachers to be able to leave the comfort zones. I think the starting point would be for us as teacher educators also to bring in the awareness, the element of, of awareness that uh, what we are trying to affect within the broader framework of educational change would inevitably also involve us leaving the comfort zones of something that is uh, beyond the frameworks of strict curriculum, uh, very strict structures within the educational setting, a very rigid kind of a perception of what the values in education are. So we need to work on ourselves in first place. Uh, we need to, uh, I, this, this has been my experience. So uh, teacher education and the role of the teacher educator has involved a lot of uh, personal growth and personal development as a teacher educator that I have had to brush up uh, as, a, as a part of facing the insecurities and facing the fears of what these uh, kinds of change, changes would involve within uh, the everyday classroom setting, if you want. This is one, in, this is one thing. The other thing uh, is really to create the safety for teachers to be who they are uh, to bring in uh, thinking in terms of wisdom, another term that we have used since the morning, uh, to if we are working with teachers who are uh, already practicing teachers, to really uh, genuinely uh, acknowledge and appreciate the wisdom of teaching that they have developed and that they have created as a result of many years of uh, learning and teaching in, uh, in a classroom. And then uh, to when we overcome the resistance uh, for introducing changes, which has been researched widely also, uh, we really need to uh, build this community where different perspectives and different uh, voices of the teachers would be heard. And we need to provide for the spaces where teachers would interact. I think we also have heard since the morning, uh, this term of community learning. So we, we need to advocate for that kind of a leadership that would really uh, instill the values of community learning. So building the communities of learning at the level of classroom, at the level of school, at the level of uh, community. Uh, so bringing in different uh, stakeholders from different levels of education, like us at, on behalf of the university, recognizing the civic role and responsibilities that we have also as university uh, teachers and educators and working together with classroom teachers, with librarians, 
with professionals in uh, at pedagogical institutes, with other, within the global community also of learners, with teachers of other subjects and teachers uh, from other communities and countries. So this has been uh, in, in brief, uh, the experience that I have uh, that I have developed as a result of my many years of, of working and teaching, and also the element of using critical reflection. So using research that I have also mentioned in my presentation, using action research is another, yet another element uh, that I'm bringing in as a tool for my students uh, to apply in, in their teaching practice. So helping teachers to become what we call now in the field of education, reflective practitioners, reflective researchers, so that they see their classrooms as, commun as, as communities where they can actually engage critically, but also uh, as uh, when assuming this uh, research role, they can really think in terms of how they can improve their teaching practices on daily basis, on monthly basis, in a more strategic way. Thank you, Larissa. Um, uh, on the beginning, what you have said reminded me uh, uh, on, on the, there are some skills that we still need to work on, uh, especially in this new uh, digital uh, online environment. I can still remember myself uh, giving a first live Facebook webinar in 2017. Uh, it was just uh, a very odd experience sitting by myself in my uh, office talking to the computer and potentially communicating with two billion people uh, that's that from then on <laughs> nothing has been the same and uh, uh, all of us in the academic world with the, with the experience in in uh, conferences uh, notice the shift in, in the paradigm and we can only imagine how it is for the teachers in primary and secondary school now with the forced digitalization uh, under the COVID-19 pandemics to, uh, be, uh, to, to be under the pressure to kind of uh, do their best for the interest of the children without real support of decision makers, of ministries, of the pedagogy uh, uh, agencies and other, uh, how, how to say, uh, skillful support from the system, from the gatekeepers that uh, kind of uh, just were stuck in, 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 in some process without uh, meaningful uh, output. Uh, they need a stimulative and, and an enabled uh, environment and then to show their uh, creative skills in developing new way of uh, uh, teaching and uh, developing new new methods. Uh, uh, Natasha, if I may, um, I have asked a question to Anna uh, on, on this regard about Serbia. Can you tell us your opinion, uh, uh, having in mind the current situation in Montenegro? Because uh, always um, uh, in, in projects or when we want to have some kind of solution, we are thinking about uh, uh, fast, uh, now now an immediate solution and an education is just not possible. It takes time, but also it takes understanding of current situation and what, uh, what, what elements you can use that are already in, as we have recognized library and librarians as very useful tool and uh, element that can help process of uh, integration of media information literacy into the system. Uh, in your opinion, Natasha, what, what, what do you think the situation, some advantages and disadvantages would be in, in, in uh, Montenegro? I think the problem is also in the laws, because uh, according to our law, professor in primary and secondary school should go just for one uh, training or seminar for a year. That is that is so you know uh, that is actually nothing. It's not enough because if we are speaking of, about lifelong learning, what does it mean one seminar or one one training where they can improve their skills? Nothing. So I think the problem is in that that uh, 
people in Montenegro, teachers in Montenegro, they are not motivated to do anything. Um, for example, subject media literacy is hi in high schools uh, actually teaching the teachers who need more classes for full salary. And that's it. And they don't know anything about media literacy and they don't care. Because uh, when I spoke on uh, with one professional, she told me uh, what you want. They have a salary just 400 euros. They are going and working another job because they have to survive. And you can expect that, that they will think about, um, I don't know, how to improve their knowledge because they don't have uh, this, this um, kind of opportunity. If we will have a higher salary, I think then, then the younger generation will be motivated to uh, work as a teacher. Thank you, Natasha, very much. Uh, Larissa, do you have a, 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 something to add? Or, and after this, we would, I would kindly ask you to uh, take a few minutes break, as, as suggested, uh, before the, the last but not least uh, session where we're, we are expecting new innovative approaches to the mo most of the issues we have raised. Larissa? Yes, I completely agree with Natasha. So going back to the basic needs, but she also mentioned in her presentation. So if the, if the society, the community, if the community members, the teachers are thinking in terms of how to provide for their families, they can't think in terms of what ideals and what other more specific, more strategic uh, uh, methods and approaches could be incorporated to improve education. But at the same time, I think this is related to some of the concepts that and issues that we brought up in the discussion. And this, this is how do we as a society value teachers more? So what position do we get to or provide for the teachers in order to bring back and restore this dignity, this appreciation, uh, acknowledging that they are the key pillars within the society. So this is at the level of societal perception of what teachers roles and what teachers responsibilities are all about. So appreciating teachers at the level of society, at the level of how we treat them uh, in terms of, of course, uh, uh, financial rewards for the type of work that they are providing for the children and for the society, but also in terms of the values and in terms of uh, professional uh, position that they have in the society. So this was the only thing that I wanted to uh, emphasize. And this would well, be related to attracting the best students into the teacher profession. I think another element that we have mentioned uh, since this morning. So how do we make sure that the best of best are enrolled in the teacher education program? How do we measure motivation for lifelong learning so that we have students who are ready to commit to learn for a longer period of time and have the motivation to continuously work on their professional development on their personal growth uh, which is a desired skill and knowledge, very important in teacher development. So how do we create these kinds of spaces at the teacher education programs across the subjects where we would actually attract and invite the best of best so that we have really a high profile and high quality teachers. And on the other hand, how do we combine different fields uh, in disciplines? Uh, this would ensure that we are really uh, stepping outside of closely defined uh, subject field and we are really uh, stepping into other fields. And we did mention the role of psychology. I would add the role of linguistics, critical discourse analysis, something that is within the field of my own research and so many other interesting things that we have mentioned today. Just as Thank you. Thank you, Larissa, very much. Um, uh, in, in the, after this short break, I would kindly, with this introduction, slowly uh, shift the weight of, let's say, debating on uh, colleagues that are more uh, that are closer to information scientists and librarianship, because uh, when we are talking about appreciating uh, teachers, well, uh, 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 about appreciating librarians compared to them, teachers are very appreciated. So uh, we have to think about this team who really needs to work together with the, with the students, with the uh, pupils in uh, well, primary and secondary school the most. 
Um, as I said in the beginning, our research has shown that a 10-year-old child now is a mature individual in the digital world. So we need to kind of help him uh, be uh, uh, a, a, wi a wise user of this uh, new environment uh, before it enters to, to this, uh, let's say, uh, endless opportunities, but also challenges. Um, uh, I would like to add something. Yes. It, uh, actually, I have a, a question for Rana, because yesterday we had a chance to, to meet uh, and uh, share the uh, experiences uh, on a regional level. And uh, uh, it came to my mind uh, that how beautiful uh, um, educational video you, you prepared. And it was full of enthusiasm and positive energy. But I don't want to think that it was a, a kind of uh, uh, editing. Uh, I would like to hear uh, your uh, take on uh, uh, is it really uh, something that optimistic or uh, uh, because we mostly regionally share the, the same situation when it comes to, to, to these uh, problems uh, in practice. So uh, uh, how, do you, how do you see this, that, this balance and uh, different levels of optimism and pessimism when it comes to uh, professional education? Uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. It's uh, basically coming back to whether we can uh, consider ourselves as internet pessimists or internet optimists. And uh, I think we are all uh, very well engaged in that, those debates. Um, but um, for example, our experience is a bit optimistic towards uh, engaging with teachers. Um, they were keen to learn and they were very keen on expressing their needs and what they expect us to give them in future training. Uh, so they are very open to learning and this is probably because they're engaged in um, uh, working with the students and uh, uh, coping with how to motivate them uh, in the learning process. So they probably are a bit uh, more into this kind of uh, motivation thing and are motivated to, to uh, improve themselves and to learn a lot. Um, maybe they're, uh, um, they're a bit, um, I don't know, uh, in the system of uh, education, in the educational system, they are not given as much freedom probably to evolve as they would wish to. Uh, so they're also facing with lots of uh, constraints uh, in terms of real life problems and organizational problems. And I don't think they're lacking motivation in, um, in process of uh, uh, acquiring new knowledge. So I would say that I'm more a bit uh, on optimistic side <laughs> of this uh, uh, process and um, uh, yeah, maybe, uh, I mean, we all know, are aware about pessimistic conditions in our societies, yeah. Thank you, that's, uh, Anna, very much. Uh, also, an important issue is, uh, that's why it's one of the key elements in our uh, organogram that uh, we have shown the beginning of how we approach the uh, this in integral strategic approach to media information literacy is a policy. Um, uh, decision maker society needs to uh, agree on, on policy level, uh, draft appropriate and adopt appropriate strategies mm -hmm. from which the action plan will be uh, made, which will then mean, need, which will then mean uh, uh, additional funding for all what we are talking about. Uh, we can appreciate uh, teachers and librarians on, uh, let's say, uh, personal level, saying them thank you. But if there's not a uh, public budget behind this, it's not long-term appreciation. So <laughs> this is also why uh, our strategic approach is, uh, in our opinion, very important to make it sustainable uh, for a long time, even longer uh, beyond our existence on, on this earth. Uh, because teachers' profession will never uh, cease to exist. Uh, with this, I would like to conclude uh, uh, this part. We have six minutes of the break, and then we'll continue with uh, two more interesting video presentations uh, 
that are kind of visionary in the sense kind of accumulate all that we have uh, spoke today. Thank you very much and uh, take a break. Yeah, thanks.
Dobar dan svima. Nastavak ponovo iz uh, uh, well, it's in English. I, I have to repeat again. <laughs> Welcome all. <laughs> uh, it's already now the, the time on this conference is taking its tool. Uh, welcome live again from the Library of uh, Faculty of Political Science, University of Sarajevo, uh, with the same uh, proce uh, procedure we'll be continuing uh, next to uh, video presentations and discussions with our, our authors from Faculty of Philosophy, Professor Leila Haderpašić and Jela Katab uh, will be uh, presenting us something uh, very interesting, a key part of our whole model with the uh, open education resource. So uh, please join us to watch the video and discuss with the authors aftermath. Hello, everybody. We are pleased to present some of our observations regarding open educational resources and media and information literacy in this regard. After the short introduction, we will address connections between open educational resources and media and information literacy, then focus on the role of academic libraries in design and delivery of open educational resources. Finally, we will discuss some examples of open educational resources implementation in higher education institutions in Bosnia and Herzegovina and provide some suggestions to facilitate adoption of open educational practices in our environment. Concepts of open research data, open science, open access, open educational resources complement each other in higher education institutions. When it comes to open educational resources, academic librarians play a significant role in promoting and managing open educational resources they also deliver open educational resources and provide information literacy instructions where information literacy is strongly connected to the concept of open education. Within the context of academic research, libraries and universities in general are starting to adopt open access principles and develop policies, products and services to support them. According to the UNESCO, open educational resources are teaching, learning, or research materials that are in the public domain or released with intellectual property licenses that facilitate the free use, adoption, and distribution of resources. As such, open educational resources might appear in forms of textbooks, courses, videos, etc., and they provide, as UNESCO explains, I quote, a strategic opportunity to improve the quality of learning and the knowledge sharing, end of quote. Many institutions oriented great efforts towards awareness raising about open educational resources like UNESCO and DIFLA, and among other things, and as a result of that, today we have different and successful initiatives at local, national, even international level that provide open educational resources for different educational environments. When it comes to higher education institution, there are several documents for this particular context, like Paris Recommendation to Governments and Institutions from 2012 and Guidelines for Open Educational Resources in Higher Education from 2015 that was published by UNESCO and Commonwealth of Learning and that brings recommendations for integrating open educational resources into higher education. Apart from that, there are other relevant documents like the Paris Message, Online, Open and Flexible Higher Education for the Future We Want from 2015 that addressed issues of access and quality of learning outcomes and as well as the Hague Declaration on Knowledge Discovery in the Digital Age from 2015 that addressed copyright issues. Finally, one of the latest documents addressing open educational resources is Ljubljana Open Educational Resources Action Plan that states that open educational resources needs to be more integrally a part of educational policies and practices 
from early childhood education to post-secondary and higher education and lifelong learning. Coronavirus pandemic demonstrated that open educational resources are needed more than ever and, for example, as a contribution to current coronavirus pandemic challenges, UNESCO published guidance on open educational practices during COVID-19 pandemic. Many communities are working together to provide appropriate open educational resources and help education process in these challenging times. Connections between open educational resources, librarians, and information literacy are discussed in contemporary literature from library and information sciences and other relevant disciplines. Apart from the fact that librarians are sharing their information literacy teaching materials in forms of open educational resources, academic librarians are also promoters of open educational resources. They help integration of open educational resources in academic communities and through information literacy instructions, they address many open educational resources issues like the use of open licenses or finding, evaluating, using open educational resources. In paper, Beyond Open Connections, Reed and Meinke, librarian and uh, open educational resources technologist, discuss a new framework for information literacy for higher education from 2016 that was adopted by Association of College and Research Libraries. Through six frames of information literacy, authors connect open education and information literacy and correctly state that, I quote, considering open education advocacy through an information literacy lens allow us to connect more holistically to other open movements and align our work with formal educational programs that are already in place at many colleges and universities. Academic libraries are committed to improving access to scholarly and educational resources for their users and have a long history of collaborating with faculty and building collections of learning and teaching material. Quoting, in the development and management of open educational resources, academic libraries are called to play a key role, even if it has not been widely recognized yet at the same level as their role in open access to science or data. The end of quote. Davis pointed out that libraries are strong advocates for providing patrons with free or low cost access to information, which should facilitate adoption of open educational resource practices performed to apply those resources in higher education. Collaboration of academic libraries in various university publishing programs as publishers, or more frequently, supporting university publishing is an example of consistent activity in the landscape of academic libraries. There is a wide variety of reports on products and services designed by academic libraries that stimulate the adoption of open educational resources developing innovative products and services for higher education. Some of these initiatives are close to the more traditional library competences, while other, others introduce librarians as well-positioned promoters of effective use of open educational resources to work with faculties seeking to incorporate open educational resources in their courses. Most prominent initiatives are bounded to activities of publishing library guides. Study by Davis established that librarians play advisory roles to faculties, influencing integration of open educational resources in their courses through building collection of open educational resources available to their integration in academic programs. De Jong, Munich and Will have classified the initiatives regarding involvement of academic libraries in open educational resources. Libraries evaluate and collect resource platforms with the aim of compiling existing repositories of open educational resources and presenting them in a comprehensible way to educators. Libraries also often maintain institutional repositories of research and educational materials which is an example of taking fully advantage of open educational resources by integrating or making them a part of library collection. 
libraries curate resources. They support the publication of open educational resources and they are advocating open education through courses and training. There are also libraries that have developed an educational collection strategy for open educational resources. When it comes to Bosnian and Herzegovinian context, the interest on open educational resources in higher learning institutions has started to gain ground because of their import importance in education establishments. As open resources became more prominent, academic libraries need to take account of them, integrating the institutionally produced content in their digital collections and selecting those external open educational resources that could be of the interest of the community. For example, University of Sarajevo, through the LNSS project, implemented the Western Balkan Online Library platform as a part of SpringShare International Community. In the context of open educational resources, SpringShare platform serves as a collaborative host environment for both in-house and external resources maintained by academic librarians. There are also examples from academic libraries in Bosnia and Herzegovina collaborating on open publishing programs of universities. Along with some examples of maintaining institutional repositories of resources like the one of the University of Sarajevo School of Economics and Business. Apart from that, there are some examples where librarians were consulted in developing open educational resources like in the project Society, Culture and Religion in Digital Environment. This project is in its implementation phase. Seeking to present suggestions for facilitating adoption of open educational resource practices and to develop institutional policies and regulations, which will hopefully serve as a basis for the development of an open education community initiated by academic libra libraries in Bosnian and Herzegovinian academic environment, we need to point out what affects adoption of open educational resources in academia. These are quality of open educational resources, benefits of cooperation between educators in their publishing, aids of creating and sharing published open educational resources and the need for institutional and governmental policies and regulations. In this regard, we can conclude that training educators increases the effectiveness of their efforts to find suitable open educational resources. That open educational resources integration with library resources and searching facilities is generally insufficient. Further, open educational resources are main components in recommended model for strategic implementation of media and information literacy in Bosnian and Herzegovinian context, as concluded by UNESCO-funded project Building Trust in Media in Southeast Europe and Turkey. Finally, considering all above mentioned in this particular environment, strategic approach to open educational resources and media and information literacy on national, cantonal and institutional level that includes librarians is needed. Thank you for your attention. We are looking forward to your comments and questions. Thank you, Leila. Thank you, Jayla. It's my great pleasure to have you today with us, uh, uh, my dear colleagues and friends from Department of Comparative Literature and uh, Information Science. Uh, uh, I suggest that you uh, make a short comment uh, uh, as a teaser, as uh, Emir suggested uh, 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 in, the, in the previous sessions, and then I will invite uh, my another uh, uh, great friend and colleague, Sasha Madatsky, to uh, join us and we will also first see his video and then open discussion uh, uh, for this session. Okay, thank you Mario very much. Uh, hello everybody, we are very pleased to be here today to share with you some of our thoughts uh, about the role of academic librarians in promotion, design and delivery of open educational resources in higher education institutions in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And in short, it's been a long day, 
uh, like in many other interesting presentations we had today, we wanted to address that in order to support the shift to open access to scientific publications, research data, and educational resources in higher education institutions, a strong collaboration between management, academic staff, and librarians is needed. And uh, this collaboration should not be neglected, especially in designing of much, much needed policies uh, in this regard in our environment. Uh, I would also like to say hello to everybody and uh, thank for uh, this opportunity to present some of our observations today. And thank you very much for your patience. Uh, I would like to say that uh, despite uh, numerous uh, significant efforts and initiatives that have been taken in last years uh, by many institutional, regional and uh, national organization for the information literacy promotion and advocacy, uh, many uh, countries have not made uh, minimal uh, necessary progress uh, in this uh, direction. Uh, these countries from our Southeast uh, Europe uh, region, uh, which uh, we can say is certainly lagging behind a positive global uh, information literacy development, uh, which uh, is hopefully changing uh, due to all initiatives and activities we also uh, today. Uh, and uh, I will just say that um, a, cl a clear correlation between uh, uh, has been drawn between uh, the, between countries with uh, well-developed uh, information and library infrastructure, uh, in contrast to countries uh, which uh, lack of uh, sufficient and effective uh, uh, information and library uh, infrastructure. In this regard, um, uh, essential ingredients uh, for strategic uh, implementation of media and information literacy in Bosnia and Herzegovina, as we concluded, uh, our librarians as active partners in these efforts. We, uh, we are looking forward also to your comments. And thank you all for your patience. Thank you, Jayla. Uh, I suggest now that we see a video from Sasha Madatsky, Head of Academic and Student Affairs uh, at the University of Sarajevo, and then we will uh, have a, a altogether a final discussion in, in this session. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sasha Madatsky, and I'm head of academic and student affairs at University of Sarajevo Rector's Office. I'm very honored that I'm part of this very, very important uh, project of introducing the media and information literacy at University of Sarajevo. Um, the Faculty of Political Science and its Institute for, for Social Sciences developed this very, very unique and interesting approach to, to media and information literacy, creating a very, very essential curriculum uh, that will be implemented at the University of Sarajevo. It is based on UNESCO model and it contains 11 plus two modules, which will be launched not as a, as a curriculum that should be uh, should be further on developed uh, by, by, by thematic approach by the, by the teachers and, 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 and followed by the students, but it will be defined as a MOOC, as a massive online course platform, which will contain a teaching materials plus advices and pedagogical input, how to, how to use this very, very powerful didactical and method, methodological tool um, to increase awareness on, on information literacy, which is essential. Um, we believe that this mod, this curriculum and this platform is out of utmost essentiality today because, yes, we are all speaking about this new generation of students as digital natives, those who are born when the internet was at, at age of five or six or ten, but also the professors who are not natives in this digital environment, but they can be seen as digital migrants. To the, to the digital environment. So both of them are really need a proper mapping on how to really explore this new landscape, this new information landscape that is created today, which is really, really going on, on exponential growth. Um, 
we believe that introducing this kind of module at university level uh, is very important from several reasons. One of them is that the separate application of this curriculum at, at, the, at the faculties or within the, the one of the, one or two courses or subjects uh, within within the curriculum of, of, of some of the study programs is maybe sufficient for a very, very small group of students who are entitled to access this course by their curriculum or the syllabus or the study program. Here, idea is to establish the media and information literacy program at university level as a multidisciplinary approach where the all students of university will have access to it and all teachers of university will have access to it and uh, obligation to pass it or a right to pass this entire course. So this is, so to say, creating an environment for 27,000 persons to have an access to very good uh, media and information literacy program. Once this curriculum is completely finalized and established, it will be uploaded on the Moodle-based platform, which will contain all 13 modules uh, curriculum, plus study guides, study materials, video library, link library, and the recommended, recommended and further reading. Uh, this curriculum, when tested, will be then uh, submitted to Office of, of Academic and Student Affairs at University of Sarajevo, which will be then checked up for, for legal regularities in it, and also then will be submitted to the, to the Board of, uh, of Quality Assurance of University of Sarajevo for final reading, and then submitted to the Senate of University for approval. Once uh, approved by the Senate at University, it will be uh, granted university certificate for passing this course, and also it can be used on, on two ways. One is a self-paced course where the students are going through, through each module and by completing the assignments, they have self-paced course and they will have a certificate on this lifelong learning program. But it's also, we have the huge opportunity to assign uh, ECTS credits for this course and currently based on preliminary analysis, it, 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 it contains sufficient material and sufficient um, a uh, sufficient uh, framework for assigning three ECTS credits for this media and information literacy program. By this, it can be seen as a very valuable uh, addition to, to every student's portfolio, but also it, it can be seen as a very, very valuable tool for the teachers, regardless of their age, uh, because then they can combine this media and information literacy curriculum with their own curriculum and syllabi and based on that, create a tremendous potential of learning for all the students of University of Sarajevo. So we are very happy that we have a strong endorsement of the Vice Rector of Teaching and Learning at University of Sarajevo, Professor Janana Husremovic, who is always saying that this kind of skills like media and information literacy skills are the essential skills for 21st century. So by this, University of Sarajevo is endorsing lifelong learning programs for all universities university students and all the staff of the University of Sarajevo. I'm very, very eager to, to have a discussion with you and see you later on. Thank you so much. Well, uh, great appreciation for our colleague Sasha Madatsky. Uh, uh, from now, we can uh, all get involved in uh, mutual discussions and uh, Q&A uh, session. Uh, to start with, as with the other participants, I would uh, kindly ask, uh, let me see if he, yes, he, uh, Sasha, Sasha is here with us, just um, uh, to maybe introduce briefly uh, a concept and maybe put a teaser for the uh, discussion on the next steps and uh, as we uh, understood, uh, this is also one of the one one of the kind uh, project, uh, first of, of its kind in the University of Sarajevo, and uh, as integral, it's also integral part of the the whole uh, the holistic model that we presented this morning at the beginning. So, Sasha, thank you very much for your video, and please uh, share with us your teaser for the the massive online open course of media information literacy. Uh, we, with this, we are very, very happy to, to establish this MOOC as a, 
is, is the really first one of a kind of the program. Uh, indeed, that's that's really true because the holistic approach was not present at the University of Sarajevo till today. Uh, at, at, at three or four faculties, we have bits and bytes of information literacy or media literacy or information and media literacy. Or in one uh, very, very ancient model of library instruction programs or library orientation programs or information orientation program, call that whatever. But this is really the first time that we have a holistic approach to this. And really, uh, I would like to congratulate to you and to the Department of Political Science that, that they really that you really have endured in this endeavor, which is really significant for all of us. Uh, so and this is the reason why I'm very, very happy to put it on university level uh, and really to, 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 to have accredited course at university level. So basically that everyone who enrolled this course can gain either three ECTS credits as we propose. And finally, I have checked, yes, it will be three ECTS that we will, uh, that we will assign. Um, that, that's one side of the story which can be useful for students, but more importantly, it is essential tool even for, for not only, as I said in my video, digital natives, which are the students, but also digital migrants, which we are, <laughs> this is our generation, that we have migrated to digital world number three, and this is where we are trying to adopt uh and to adapt and this this is very very important for us so uh yes um and but what also is it's maybe the next steps is um we are ready for for the upload of all the materials at university level uh mill module um so that 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 should be done in in in, in the days so we are very uh very happy that the final countdown has begun so it's not the month that we are speaking now it's really a days uh, that we are, we are ready for launch of, of the course, uh, which is really uh, interesting task for me. Really, is collaboration with so many people in the in the improvement of the program, uh, how to improve the modules. It's not only to to put them to, to live in the digital world, but also to put them in action. This is also important. Uh, so uh, yes, we are we are having like in next days the modules will be finished and uploaded. So we will be ready for the New Year's Eve with the Mill program at University Lab. Sasha, thank you very much uh, for uh, your your contribution. Uh, I have to underline that uh, massive online open course in media information literacy that we are uh, developing and it's already kind of uh, getting the the final shape in order is based on. Uh, MIL curriculum developed by UNESCO, uh, which we have uh, additionally, uh, uh, let's say, improved. Uh, we have uh, uh, done a necessary transformation to uh, can be, be uh, used in uh, region, uh, but also in the year 2020, actually end of year 2020, since MIL curriculum was written in 2013. Uh, this seven years and now almost eight year uh, has made many uh, shifts in paradigm in terms of understanding the digital transformation and digital learning. Uh, maybe I would kindly ask uh, uh, colleague Thomas uh, with uh, your experience in, in, in digital learning since your, your department and program has uh, done so many things in this regard. Uh, what do you think that can be additionally let's say, done to, to improve uh, all this holistic approach and the, our hybrid model that we have developed so far? Very good question. And I think there is not the one perfect recipe for that. These are things that have to be adopted to the local context. And uh, I, it's very hard to give this general perspective. But I think what we have, we have discussed many of the issues that have been involved so far. What I really uh, liked in this session was also the role of open educational resources. It's something that the library has to work on. And that is really a very different challenge because the librarian has to uh, work much more towards the content of a, of a class, of a particular class, and find, be able, being able to select appropriate digital resources. I think that will be a very important future skill of any information professional, not uh, just in the library, also in the other enterprise. And also transmitting this uh, knowledge to the uh, competent learner, because he has to do also select his appropriate tools, appropriate resources himself in the face of lifelong learning after the 
a formal education. So I think uh, the things work very well together and it's great to see the, the progress here that uh, we saw in the last talk that there is real progress in the curriculum there. I have a question for, for Leila and Jayla. How, how do you see the challenges of interprofessional partnership between uh, uh, teachers and librarians in terms of uh, uh, open access and open educational resources? Thank you, Mario, for your question, where uh, I, I was more than happy to see today that uh, there are different projects uh, trying to raise awareness about the significant contributions of librarians in implementing curricula in media and information literacy and all other activities. I think the main challenge is just uh, uh, to recognize their contributions. And in order to be recognized, they must even more promote themselves. They must uh, promote their skills. They must show that they are uh, very needed in all these processes that Jayla and I uh, mentioned in the, our presentation. And in this regard, I would like to refer Mario, if you allow me to the question from our professor Tatiana. Uh, uh, professor asked, do we have any research data about the use of open educational resources at Bosnia and Herzegovina universities? Uh, there is a lack of discussion in Bosnia and Herzegovina literature. Uh, uh, scientific and professional literature from library and information sciences about the role of uh, librarians, academic librarians in promoting and delivering open educational resources. And Jayla provided some of examples, but uh, as a conclusion of uh, all this uh, uh, preparation for uh, today's conference, uh, Jayla and I actually said that we will do that research because it's needed. We have to see what they use on universities, do they use, and are librarians involved? And uh, hopefully maybe on some other conference, we will present those findings. Thank you, Leila. Uh, is Sasha still with us? I have a question for, for Sasha also. Uh, uh, Sasha is a, is a, is a uh, very famous figure, let's say, in, in librarian circles, and uh, uh, he knows the uh, 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 history of our discussions, uh, uh, what uh, librarians should do and what librarians uh, uh, didn't do, actually. And uh, how do you see now the opportunity with this uh, uh, <clears throat> media and information literacy, not just curse, but all this process that uh, uh, we are trying to uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, shift the, the, the target and not to speak only uh, 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 to professionals, librarian professionals, but to the uh, educators and connect educators, teachers and librarians all together. Do you see uh, that could be the, the, the tempting force or uh, something that could push uh, uh, things forward and somehow uh, 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 get them more engaged into the, the processes uh, uh, that we are actually uh, 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 have been doing uh, uh, much before. Um, thank you for that question. Yes, I believe that there is a huge, huge uh, potential for cooperation and for, for mutual work on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on the development of the platform and its content. Um, what, what really um, sometimes I'm, I'm afraid of is, a, is a basically um, finding, finding a proper place for getting together librarians and educators to work together. So basically what we need really is first to establish a platform and, and some, somehow habit of discussion between educators and librarians, because as, as any cattle uh, and crowd the librarian is having a one tribe uh, the professors are having another tribe and sometimes tribe do not tribes do not mix uh, what we really have to offer is that this kind of mix is not heretical and it's it's fine and okay um, 
like you, so this kind of platform is essential first to start with the, with the joint meetings and then in the discussions and then finding a proper match sometimes um some some of the librarians will find that it's very very nice to work with some of the teachers and educators in improvement of something so basically but we first need to offer them a space to smell each other properly and then to take a decision that they will work mutually on development of something what is really good is that we have this platform uh, for, for, the, for the mill curriculum at the University of Sarajevo. So basically now we have really good potential that all the academic librarians can really jump on the train and really uh, enjoy this journey of developing the platform, adding the new resources to the modules, discussing this with the, with the, with the edu educators, how this module can be even better with the, with, the, with the materials which are properly applicable in the workshops and so on and so on. So I believe, yes, there is a plenty of, uh, of possibilities for cooperation but first we need a dialogue not putting them in artificial situation uh, immediately um, but really first put them to to discuss and then to find their common way and then i hope that they, they, this must result in you know something which is a proper massive online open course thank you sasha uh, i'm glad that you uh, mentioned that because uh, 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 I got sick and tired uh, uh, dwelling in my own tribe and uh, uh, four years ago when I uh, uh, approached to Emir and when we started discussing media information literacy uh, 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 among uh, uh, faculty of philosophy and faculty of political science, uh, we see how the synergy uh, has been developing and that uh, the only way to, to to uh, think about the future cooperations is to really practice this horizontal integration uh, in academia also first and then to uh, uh, deliver it uh, uh, broadly. So uh, do we have uh, uh, any uh, more questions or comments? Uh, if, if I may, uh kindly ask also uh, the other colleague, Joachim, from the University of Hildesheim to uh, maybe uh, just introduce also a few information on uh, transnational course on intercultural perspectives of inform information literacy and uh, also uh, just present us with the future plans for uh, uh, your activities in this, this broader area. Yeah, thank you, Emir. Can you hear me, everyone? Yes. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah, I already thought about how to bring myself in, into the discourse now. And I would like uh, very much like to thank you, everyone, because the conference today, I've not been here the whole time because I had to visit a parallel conference on, on teacher education and literacies. Um, on the conference today, I learned a lot. Um, I was impressed, or I'm impressed, I'm very impressed by your initiatives, works, works thoughts, and um, the insights you communicated here. And yeah, just a few moments ago, there was a stripe metaphor, and I want uh, to pick it up. I, I would like to say that um, maybe we don't have to mix. Uh, maybe there's not always a need to mix, but we should have at least um, um, the, yeah, the idea of getting to know the other tribe. And maybe this is also very interesting um, for information literacy as a German, for example, the discussion in the last minutes is a kind of new thing to me because in our educational system, um, the libraries are usually not involved in media and information literacy education in the school system. Maybe it starts at the university level, but not before, but maybe that is not a, sit a, a ideal situation. And I'm also very glad to be part of, of this um, collaboration. And I guess with regard to, to transnational, uh, we talked about uh, the local aspects, but also I guess um, transnational, international um, um, relations, exchanges, communication could be a very interesting part of information literacy and also information literacy um, education. And with regard to that, we already have th some things um, planned or in, in, in the pipeline. And at current, we have an initiative 
with uh, colleagues from um, Pune, India, and, and Hildesheim, Germany. And we try to bring the students together. Let me um, try to share the screen. I hope you can see the screen. This is a the screen. This is a poster of a, a course we currently conduct. Um, and we in this course, we bring the idea is that we bring together uh, students um, within the topic of information literacy to, to discuss things on information um, behavior. On and and at current we have eight students from Germany. We have 14 students from from um, Pune, and the idea is that we, yeah, that we aim to, uh, to expand um, this thing. Think about how cool it would be um, if students from three or even more countries uh, would discuss questions of information literacy and collaboratively aim to get uh, to the bottom of, of specific research questions in the field with regard to aspects of information, behavior, information. Um, literacy. And this is the basic idea. And this is maybe an um, um, opportunity, a road to go uh, for further cooperation. This would be very nice. And <clears throat> uh, Mario, Emia, um, Thomas and I and Daphne are in, in contact communicate, communicating and thinking about ideas. But this is basically uh, open for everyone if you are interested. And if you are confused now by the things I have said, um, I just post the URL of a, of a website on which you can find uh, more information on an upcoming conference where our mixed students, team, mixed teams of students uh, will present their work to the whole audience. And we plan to conduct an online conference at the end of January and at current, these are the topics that will be uh, discussed. Information behavior in Corona times, uh, confirmation bias, uh, what I believe is surely true, the impact of the pandemic on the education sector, which is um, special and of interest, I guess, in every country, but especially of interest maybe in India and maybe in a, there's a diff different situation as in Germany. And uh, this is also connected to the, to the fourth um, topic. So if you're interested, if you think about, um, um, I guess we will discuss it in, in, in the current corporation. Um, if you think this could be a worthwhile venue for corporation, uh, then have a look maybe at a conference and think about entering uh, this idea or, or sorry, um, entering um, or join, join our, our course and course and stay in contact. I guess that would be really nice if we are able to, to develop um, low threshold intra infrastructure for, for a transnational uh, exchange, um, in addition to the other things that are of importance in the field. Okay, uh, this, this was also kind of marketing session. I hope you bear with me and with regard to this, but uh, as we already heard a few moments yeah. ago, um, the, the, yeah, one of the problems of information literacy is the, the, yeah, the visibility is not the best one in, in, in all over um, wherever we are, our country, our international level, schools, um, education system, whatever. Thank you. Thank you, Acumen. Uh, I want to use the opportunity to thank both uh, you and Thomas for this uh, incredible partnership, uh, which was uh, excellent uh, learning and development experience uh, from us. And I hope uh, in the future we'll have many more uh, activities li like these. Um, and maybe just to, to go back and uh, remind you all of the question I kind of uh, announced a few, few videos ago about we we're discussing how to raise the value uh, of teachers' profession, but let's go back again on the title of the conference and see about information, information professionals. Uh, what can we do there to raise the, the, the uh, let's say, value in society, in educational systems uh, about, uh, uh, for, for information professionals? A lot of you here are coming from this, uh, let's say, arena. 
And do you have any ideas what, what can we do in this regard? Because we all agree that I'm pretty sure that information professionals are very valuable. Maybe you can get involved. <laughs> this can be a start. I think, Mario, uh, the floor should be yours. <laughs> Uh, as I said, uh, uh, we have been discussing these issues about librarians and information uh, specialists uh, for years, and we didn't manage to uh, uh, get out of our uh, bubble, let's say. Uh, somehow we were uh, constantly uh, speaking to each other and uh, complaining and somehow uh, 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 getting more and more frustrated about uh, our uh, 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 will to change the attitude and uh, to to uh, uh, get some uh, 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 affirmation from the outside, and then I realized that the only way is to cooperate and to uh, really uh, uh, find the partnerships uh, uh, outside of the tribe, and then to uh, 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 maybe create foundation and background for further steps in the future. And that's why I really enjoyed this uh, 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 partnership and conference, and actually the, the working with Emir, and we were joking uh, a couple of uh, conferences ago uh, that uh, Emir starts, started to speak uh, about librarians, and I was uh, more and more uh, 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 involved in, into political uh, uh, and economic issues of, of uh, information and media literacy. So I think it, uh, that that's really uh, uh, something uh, uh, that we should uh, cherish, cherish in the future to learn uh, uh, from each other. And uh, uh, I'm really glad that we have a, uh, uh, that we had today opportunity to uh, 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 have a, a, a different takes from different disciplines, different professions, and to somehow share the, 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 the will to, to, to continue uh, to work in, in, in this way. Uh, uh, if I may add something, Emir, please. Yes, yes, Sasha. Um, well, actually, uh, for, for, if you if you plan any future conferences, I insist to be on the panel with Leila Hydrapasic, since this this has also become like you and Mario have. So basically, I love to be in virtual room with Leila. So so please book any panel with Leila. Uh, I, I will join. Uh, for the conference. Yes, and also I would like to add that this kind of synergy between professions, interprofessional cooperation is really essential. And we have to establish forum on this solely. Uh, you know that we have all the troubles going for the, through the interdisciplinarity at university, how it was refused. Uh, so, uh, and we, we finally won that battle for the interdisciplinarity. So now it's, it's a turn really for interprofessional dialogue to start. Thank, Thank you, you, Sasha, Sasha. Uh, very much. Uh, I'm uh, I'm on the verge to do a very popular thing, and maybe also announce that we'll be finishing early the conference, which is almost impossible <laughs> in the conference world. Uh, but uh, I think we're joining here uh, maybe one or two sentences for the conclusion, and if some of the panelists have desired to to have one or two sentences in concluding remarks, but. Uh, from my side, I would like to just point that uh, uh, we have reached the main goal. Uh, we have built another coalition. Uh, building coalitions is a key in any successful endeavor. In these terms, uh, building co uh, interpersonal coalitions, uh, but also academic coalitions. And uh, maybe the foremost important is building coalitions in ideas, uh, ideas that will guide us, and give us strength in our future activities, projects, and uh, enable us to reach our desired goals. So on behalf of the organizers and moderators, I would like to thank you all for uh, being very patient and uh, giving your full participation to this incredible conference. Uh, just another amazing experience uh, from all perspectives, and uh, probably we'll just have to write another book just about organizing something like this 
uh, there will be very valuable, valuable material. Uh, from my side, that will be all. Thank you very much. The floor is yours uh, for the concluding remarks, if you want. Just uh, one remark um, that uh, from my side, Emir and Mario, if you write this book about organizing, it should be a bestseller because you organized it perfectly well and it all run perfectly. And I also learned a lot. It was really a good exchange and a good combination of skills and uh, different disciplinary perspectives. So I think it was very successful. And even in the digital domain, we managed to, to have a very good exchange of ideas. So thank you all. And thank you again, Amy and Mario. Just to yeah, say thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Better, please. As a keynote, you can be also end note speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I would be a footnote speaker, so it's fine. <laughs> yes, Petr, please. No, that's it. I just wanted to say thanks. You organized a beautiful conference. I really appreciate what you did. I met so many nice people, and it was really good to spend the day with you. So that's about it, really. We appreciate a lot that you are really kind of uh, going against the stereotypes of keynotes to be there for 10 minutes and disappear afterwards. We appreciate you being with us all day. Thank you very much. Anybody else? No, that will be, I'm pretty sure all. Uh, once again, thank you all for participating and I hope we'll see each other soon. Uh, uh, be safe, take care of yourself and don't uh, uh, lose the path of our coalition in ideas that we have just built. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye to everybody. <laughs>